session number 225701. Right, Richard. So we're off. Well, I've told you I was born in Iowa in the center of the United States in a little town called Centerville, which had signs outside of it that said, Centerville, 5,000 friendly people. <clears throat> My father was a country doctor. I, I was born in 1918. And um, my mother had been a school teacher. She taught mathematics and Latin. And I, uh, my father had been a school principal also. I, when I was about two years old, my father finally was so sick of mud roads in southern Iowa, he took the family west to Oregon, and I grew up in Portland, Oregon. I went to high school there, and uh, actually got more out of high school than I did out of college. Uh, <clears throat> um, I guess I was a good student in in high school. I I went to. Stanford University in California, and um, I had always assumed as a high school student that I would eventually be a doctor like my father. I thought Dr. Dudman sounded right and Mr. Dudman didn't sound right, and I, I liked the idea of being a doctor, and I used to go on calls with him, house calls. and, and um, I know he wanted me to be a doctor, too. So I began a pre-med course at Stanford, and that included biology, and I, it involved I, I cutting up a frog and studying the veins and muscles, and I, I hated biology. Uh, I couldn't remember, my, my mind isn't good at remembering a lot of data, and I, I could see memorization was going to be a big part of it, and I didn't like the smell of formaldehyde, and I, I just took a dislike to it that first week. Uh, my roommate I, one day said uh, he was going to go and try out for the school newspaper. He said, how about it? And I, and I said, yeah, I'll go along. The Stanford Daily. I loved that from the first day, and I, I, I quit uh, pre-med, and I knew I was going to be a newspaper man. And I can remember sitting down at a, a typewriter in the Daily Shack, we called it, the, the office we had, and the uh, the managing editor was a woman who later became a famous journalist. Anna Lee Whitmore was her name. I, and <clears throat> she wrote, um, I've forgotten the name of the book, but uh, she, she was married to uh, Melville Jack Jacoby. And uh, the two of them did some coverage in World War II. Um, well, she had given me an assignment she was managing editor on this school paper. I guess she was a senior. And she had uh, sent me to cover some kind of a student council meeting or something. And I came back with a lot of notes. And I sat in front of the typewriter. And I didn't know what to do. And she said, let me tell you this. Just pretend you're telling somebody about this very briefly, but you want to get them interested, you want to give them the basic facts, and that's it. So this isn't a big story, but you got to think how you're going to organize it, and that's the way to do it. Just think you're telling somebody a story. So I wrote it out, and I've been doing it ever since. <laughs> so you I, found your niche. Yes, mm. and the, the paper... Um, came out every, it was called the Daily, it came out every day, and um, 
You want to check that and see that we're recording? We're all we're fine. We're all right. <coughs> um, uh, they needed a photographer too, and they had an old uh, Graflex uh, and a speed graphic, and an old carrying case. And I used to carry those around. Those were cameras that had a, a, a great big four inch by five inch thing they called a film pack that you'd have to stick that in the back and then you open a slide and that would expose the film inside and then you'd cl click the shutter and uh, this was before the days of 35 millimeter long before well I got pretty good at it in fact I took one picture of a, a uh, football game and um, it was a very dramatic picture of somebody getting tackled or something. And um, I, I uh, rushed it down. I ran down. I'd forgotten. I think I had an old, an old Ford. Yeah. And I got in the car and I drove down to San Jose, to the San Jose Mercury Herald. I think they were the team that was involved in it. And I went into the office of the Mercury Herald and uh, told them I had a good picture, and they developed it and looked at it and liked it. And they said, what would you like? Would you like a byline or a dollar? And I said, a byline? So I took the credit line. I've never done that since. Take the money. <laughs> but anyway, I, I, I took pictures all the time, and I learned to use it. Well, I was so enthusiastic about this. I almost flunked out of school because uh, I didn't pay any attention to my studies except a little journalism. I kind of like that. But um, by the time I was uh, uh, pretty well along in the fall quarter, I, uh, my uncle, my mother's brother, I, I was in touch with him. I, he ran a newspaper in Northern uh, California called the Oroville Mercury Register. And uh, uh, Uncle Dan asked if I'd like to come up and spend spring vacation with him and work on the paper. And it was a little daily and it was a, a good paper and uh, it had a circulation of 5,000 in a town of about 5,000 people. It circulated outside too. And <clears throat> so I did a, several stories every day for him for that week and uh, enjoyed it so much, took pictures and things like that. And by that time, he had a Leica. Uh, that was the first of the miniature cameras. They called them mini cams. And uh, <clears throat> I used his dark room and, and I... One time he he said uh, he said I don't want people to think that you're something special around here because you're my nephew. That scrap paper around. He said I want you to sweep that up, and then uh, go out and pick up all those cigarette butts and, and gum wrappers out on the street too. We want to keep this place looking nice, and then when you're through with that, go and deliver the, deliver one of the roots because we got to circulate this paper, too. And uh, so I learned to do all that, and I loved every minute of it. I, so they, I, he liked that first week, uh, that, that single week uh, on the, my performance on the paper that he asked if I'd come and work for him I, the following summer. That was my first summer vacation while I was at college. And I leaped at the chance, and I did the same thing all summer. I lived with him. I got $15 a week and room and board. And my Aunt Helena I kept me fed, and I, I just had a great time. And by the end of that summer, I was just locked in. I knew I was going to be a newspaper person. Well, <clears throat> I... I kept on through school devoting 
90% of my attention and time and energy to the paper. And um, I, uh, <clears throat> I applied to a number of papers for uh, a summer job in the next summer and I was not successful. And I've forgotten how I spent that summer. But then the, the following summer, I was able to get a summer job on the uh, Glendale News Press, Glendale, California. And that was a little larger paper. But again, I did uh, photography as well as reporting. And I, again, had a great time at it. Uh, when the war, I, the war was coming along, this was in, I was in the class of 1940. And when I was graduated, of course, England was already at war. And um, I, I didn't know exactly, I, would, I knew I was gonna be drafted eventually. And I didn't really feel like uh, trying to, uh, sign up permanently on some newspaper I, because I was afraid I'd be interrupted right away. So I got a kind of a, maybe it was a little timid about leaving college. I don't remember why exactly, but I, for about a year I worked as a researcher and writer for an outfit called the Front Door Ballot Box, which was a, an opinion polling outfit. My journalism professor had uh, devised a stratified sample to uh, uh, assess uh, public opinion in a, in a city. And uh, I learned how to do this. And I used an early IBM uh, punch card system that we had at, at, on the campus to uh, analyze the results. And I hired interviewers, and I'd have a certain number of men, certain number of women, and I'd tell them how, to, uh, how many people from each economic bracket, and explain to them how, they, uh, how to uh, appraise somebody's uh, economic position. And then, uh, oh, I had them divided according to age, too. I get some young and some old and some middle. And uh, <clears throat> we would get, uh, I wasn't, I didn't do the business side of it, but the guy who owned the, the company, uh, <clears throat> he, um, um, he made contracts with different outfits. For example, power companies were having uh, local elections into whether there would be a public power district that would be in competition with the power company. The power company would want to know how this was going to come out. So we would uh, do a survey and predict it. We came within one or two percent always. We were very good at it. And this was right after uh, a newspaper, a magazine called the uh, Literary Digest had uh, really made a terrible mistake in predicting that, uh, uh, I've forgotten which election it was, but in the presidential election, they missed it entirely. And uh, I think it was Dewey going to win. And, he, and uh, the the problem was that they had done it more mainly on the telephone, and in those days a lot of people didn't have telephones, so they missed all those who didn't have telephones, and they got a biased sample. Well, my sample was not biased because it was stratified and very carefully figured. Uh, so we were, we profited from their errors and had, uh, had a good little business. Well, I, that lasted for the best part of a year. And then <clears throat> I could see I wasn't getting drafted very fast, and I had a <clears throat> I had a really a wanderlust. And a friend of mine, a classmate of mine, had uh, 
uh, run off on a um, uh, on a on a Scandinavian ship, a, a freighter as a member of the crew, and I thought that sounded like a nifty idea. So I went up to San Francisco, and um, <coughs> I found out that the jobs on Scandinavian, I thought Scandinavian sounded good, the jobs were uh, being handled by the Norwegian Siemens Union, the Norsk Schirmans Verbund. And so I became a member of the Norsk Schirmans Verbund, and I, they said, yeah, we'll put you on a boat, but you got to wait till one comes in here that was in Portland, Oregon. It was... Uh, 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 no, it was in San Francisco. Uh, it was in San Francisco, and they waited. They said, in the meantime, uh, can you help around the office? So I wrote some of their press releases, and I don't know what all. And uh, uh, a boat came in called the Baalbek, and they hired me. And I was the uh, uh, Lugargu, the cabin boy. And uh, my job was to uh, make the beds for the officers and to, uh, to uh, uh, one of the tasks was to use a blowtorch to burn the bed bugs out of the springs of their cots. And I learned to do all those things. And uh, I remember on the first day out, we were on the way down the out in the Pacific Ocean going down from uh, San Francisco towards, La uh, towards South America. And we were on that first leg out. It was the first time I'd been outside the site of land. And I didn't know anything about boats. And I was standing next to the, I think it was the chief mate uh, on the rail and, and uh, asked some simple questions about the boat. And I said, how many are there in the crew? He said, well, there are exactly 32, including you. And then he thought a minute and he said, or including me. I thought that was the most hospitable kind of a remark anybody could have made. And I, I was aboard that. We went down to, uh, we went through the Panama Canal and went down to uh, uh, Venezuela and Colombia and, um, and touched on some Central American ports. And then we came back through the canal and went all the way up to uh, Canada and uh, then came back to Portland, Oregon, my home, and I paid off there. And I can, I had such a lump in my throat when I saw that boat going out without me, because I, it was such a close, nice society on the, on the ship that I've always um, loved anything to do with the ocean ever since. And um, then I, I hitchhiked across the country to New York to get a, another sh shipping job. And I was then a second cook and baker on a, uh, a boat called uh, I can't remember the name of that one. And we went to Greenland twice. And um, that, of course, was a nice adventure. But then when they were going to go back we came back to Newfoundland. We were in St. John. And then we learned that we were going to go back up to Greenland. Well, by that time, I'd had about enough of Greenland. And the, they were sinking uh, merchant ships all around us at the time. <clears throat> and uh, I decided that I wasn't going to go back with them. So I went to the... Um, this all sounds kind of foolish, I suppose. I was a young fellow, and I did some of those silly things. I, I hung out in the 
YMCA because I knew that they would look for me. They'd look in the bars, but they wouldn't think to look in the Y. And they sailed without me. And um, then about at that very time, a British guy came up to me and he says, you're a Yank, aren't you? And I said, yes. And he says, your country's in the war. And I said, what do you mean? He says, well, they, they destroyed your Navy at Pearl Harbor and you've declared war. Well, that was the first I heard of it. So, <clears throat> uh, actually, I didn't have any great desire to get in the military. So I, I thought I'd get another ship uh, in the Merchant Marine. <coughs> and eventually, they offered me a seagoing tug that went to Murmansk. And that didn't sound like a very sensible thing to be doing. So I, I they finally, the, the Furnace Whippy Company, the, the shipping company that I was working for, I shipped me back to New York. And I got a job there on a another boat called the War Admiral, which was going to uh, uh, Liverpool. And uh, I was to be the second cook and baker. And um, but before we set sail, the uh, the cook, I guess it was. Um, no, it was the steward. I think broke into the uh, chief officer's liquor supply, and they fired him. And um, so the cook became the steward, and they said I could be the chief cook. So I went to a, went ashore and, and uh, went to a bookstore and read some recipes, and I came back aboard and I was the chief cook. And uh, it wasn't too bad. I knew how to make pies and cakes, especially pies, because my, my mother made pies. And um, um, I learned how to make bread, and I learned how to butcher a quarter of beef and a half of pork and a, and a whole lamb, and uh, another adventure. Well, were you then sort of officially in the war? You know, had you been drafted at this no, stage? No, no. This was just, uh, I say merchant marine, all that meant was a job in the merchant marine industry. And I, I, I was just hired as an individual. And I, but then I, my mother got word to me that the FBI was after me saying that I was supposed to uh, accept a, an order from my draft board. So as soon as I got back to New York, I went into the I, I went into the Navy and uh, the recruiting office and said, I'd, uh, I think I'm supposed to be drafted, but I'd rather be in the Navy. And uh, they said, all right, uh, let me take down some details. They said, how many years school do you have? And I said, four years. And they said, yeah, four years high school. And I said, no, not high school, four years of college. They said, college? Go upstairs, you can be an officer. So I went upstairs and I became an officer. <laughs> and I had two months of training in Chicago, and they put me on a boat. And I was, uh, I was assistant navigation navigator, I was uh, a deck officer, and uh, eventually I was always on the same boat. I eventually was the uh, executive officer. And uh, I worked, I uh, served on that boat. We, w we went, we did convoy duty. It was a, a, a converted United Fruit Company banana boat. And we carried refrigerated supplies to uh, forces that were going to make the South, first the uh, Italian invasion, and then the uh, across the channel. And um, we served, 
they supplied Navy ships in all these details. And uh, we went to Algeria and Algiers and Oran, and then um, uh, up to Naples, and then uh, a little, another trip. We went to Loch Long and uh, supplied the ships that were going to take part in the invasion of uh, Western France. And um, that lasted till well, it was along in '45, and I was still on duty. Uh, but I got uh, virus pneumonia, and they put me in a naval hospital in the state of Washington. And um, I think while I was there, they uh, the United States dropped the atom bombs, and the war began to come to an end. Uh, and um, when I <coughs> When I finally got mustered out, uh, my father had died uh, in about 19, I think it was 40 or 41, right after I was out of college. And I knew my mother was awfully lonesome and at loose ends. So I proposed to her that she and I drive to Mexico on kind of a vacation. And I, I picked her up in Portland, and we stopped off to see Uncle Dan. And Uncle Dan knew that I was headed for a journalistic career, I'm sure. He said, while you're down there, write me a story about every day and send it to me. He says, if any good, I'll publish it. So I wrote a, a daily story, and I, I don't remember how I got them off to him. I guess I must have telegraphed them or mailed them or something. And uh, that went on for, I suppose, a couple of months. And um, my mother liked Mexico so much, she decided she was going to live there for a while. So I got her established, and then I took her car. She said, you take the car. So I drove back, and stopped off in, at Stanford to see my old professor. And he said, <clears throat> what do you want to do? And I said, I want to be a newspaper man. He said, well, the, uh, the former editor of the Portland Oregonian, a paper I'd always read as a kid. He's moved now to Denver. His name was Palmer Hoyt. And they said, he's hiring right now. Why don't you go there? So I did. And I went in to say Hoyt, and I had known him. In fact, he was one of the, uh, one of the people who uh, bought our front door ballot box opinion surveys, and I'd known him in that connection. Also, my father, who was an obstetrician, had delivered two of his kids, so he was kind of, in a, in a distant way, a family acquaintance, too. And uh, I dropped in to see him, and uh, he introduced me to his uh, uh, managing editor, Larry Martin. And um, Larry asked me a few questions, and I had brought along a, a bunch of clippings of all this stuff I'd written uh, from Mexico, and they liked that. And so they put me on at uh, $40 a week. Accession number 22579, wheel two. Richard Dubman, Wheel 2. Um, <clears throat> I, I enjoyed my work there from the start. And uh, 
I was I quickly became a a uh, capable reporter. I didn't. I still. I didn't take any pictures right away, but because uh, they had a good photographic staff. But um, <clears throat> I covered all kinds of things. I and uh, I remember the. I remember one day I came. I don't know how I found this out, but I I heard and then I checked it out in the the uh, legal documents in the deeds office. <clears throat> I found out that uh, there was one uh, street called Crescent Circle that uh, had a statement right in the deed that said this property can never be sold to a, a Jew. Or a uh, or a black or a Negro, and I said I think we ought to have a story about that. And the city editor says, <clears throat> Dudman, he says sometimes I don't think you understand things that you ought to know. The managing editor lives on that street, <laughs> so that was one. In later years, I would have fought to get that in the paper, but. Um, I didn't uh, push the case, uh, but there was one I did push. Uh, one of my jobs was to cover the city council, and there was a uh, a a, a, a uh, councilman named James Frescus, F R E S Q U E S, a, uh, a Mexican American, and. Uh, <clears throat> He told me once that uh, he knew about a case in town that he thought it, uh, I might want to do a story about. It was a young man who was just been mustered out of the army, who had fought on, uh, in the Battle of Okinawa, and had lost both legs, and he was in a wheelchair, and he'd j just gotten married, and they uh, arranged to buy a house. And uh, this, the salesman had uh, shown it to them, and they, they made a, a handshake deal. And then he got a call from the sales manager of the, uh, the real estate company saying that uh, they couldn't sell it to him because he was Mexican. He was an American citizen, but he was American and Mexican extraction. And um, <clears throat> so I um, telephoned the sales manager, and he says, well, uh, don't you understand? Um, uh, these people would be more ha happier to be in with their own kind. And also, uh, the neighbors might not like it because it would lower their value of their property. And so we just got this. He thought I'd understand it. And then he said, you're not taking any of this down, are you? And I said, sure I am. That's my job. Well, the head of the company was over there in the office talking to the, to the, to the editor, to the publisher, right away. Well, I had already written my story and turned it in. And... Um, The, the the head of the real estate company also had been in the paper in and around the paper a lot, and he knew the new people there, and he thought he had a lot of influence, but he made one terrible mistake. He went down to the composing room to take a look at the type, and he could see my story there in the type, and he started touching the type. Well, that's a violation of union rules, and the the pressman raised hell, <laughs> and also uh, to tell the publisher that he couldn't run something was like uh, that brought out the, the fury of the publisher, and uh, so they published it. They had it on page twenty three A, so it was way in way back in the paper. But anyway, they read it, and that was a early achievement. 
Well, the publisher <coughs> uh, uh, had a son who had been covering the war, and uh, the son had come had been in the Middle East too, working for United Press, and uh, the son had come back. Uh, with a an understanding that um, the Zionist movement of of Jews going to Palestine and starting a Jewish state, that the Zionist movement was really a kind of a hollow shell. That it was a lot of public relations and promotion, but that the rank and file of the Jewish refugees through Europe, weren't interested in it. They just wanted to come to America. So, I, I, so Mr. Hoyt, the publisher, I said I said he'd like to know the tr truth or falsity of that, and he wanted me to go over and go into some of the Jewish displaced person camps in Germany and uh, find out the truth. He didn't tell me what to find out either, I must say. So, <clears throat> uh, I had a, an acquaintance, Rabbi Friedman, who uh, uh, I told him about the assignment and uh, he gave me a letter that he thought I could use. And I think he must have been on the phone or with a cablegram to some people in Germany anyway. But um, I went to, I went first to England because there were some displaced persons uh, preparatory camps there for, uh, to prepare people to go on the illegal immigration to Palestine. And um, where were they? Where were those camps? Where? Yes, in England. Do you remember the sort of area, rough, you know, even rough area? I don't remember. I know there is a couple of things I do remember about my visit to England, which wasn't very long anyway. It must have been not too far out of London. But um, <clears throat> there was. A, um, I'm trying to think of the name of it. There's a, there was an, an American syndicate <clears throat> that wanted to use some of the stuff I might write. And um, their uh, English representative was the guy I talked to. <clears throat> and um, he was very uh, hospitable and health, helpful to me in all respects. And um, he asked me if there was any people in England that I'd like to meet. I think he put me in touch with these camps too. I, and I said that uh, I'm having trouble with the name. There's a, a, a political scientist and a, a, a famous um, writer and professor named John, I want to say Jaffsey or Jeff, John, um, a radical. Uh, you'd know his name if I could say it. Well, if it comes to me, I'll tell you. Uh, I, I said he's always seemed to me to be an interesting person, and I'd like to meet him. Uh, and he must be, I may have said something like, one of the really prominent Englishmen. And he says, well, of course, he's not an Englishman. I said, not an Englishman? I thought he was born here. He said, well, he's Jewish. I I was so sh shocked, and I still am, to think of that remark. But uh, 
I found out some more things about anti-Semitism and how it exists in the world. Interesting you saying these camps were for illegal um, emigration to Palestine. Yeah, there was. Was, it, was that known? It was quite well known. That yes, those... I'm sure it was. The, the, uh, well, the British government had a blockade, they, and they were actually patrolling to keep because they didn't want to get in bad with the Arabs, and they were trying to stop this traffic. Uh, well, I eventually wound up in Heidelberg, and I, I visited several camps, and I, I kept saying, uh, I kept asking people, what, what are your wishes, and where would you like to go? I found uh, almost invariably they were Zionist inclined and they wanted to go to Palestine and start a Jewish state. And um, but there, then I wanted to go along. So I said, "How do I talk? To, how, how are you going to do it? How, who organizes this?" And they'd say, "Well, never mind. We'll go." And I couldn't get anything out of them. And one guy took me aside once and he says, "You're always asking that question in a large group of people." He said, "Nobody's going to speak up." I said, "All right, we're not in a large group now. Tell me." He said, all right, go to uh, Neuom, that's a city in Germany, go to Neuom and see Rabbi Lippmann. So I did. And here was this United States Army officer, Captain Chaplain Corps, and uh, I, I think he may even have known about uh, my friendship with Rabbi Friedman, but uh, at any rate, I showed him a letter, and um, he sized me up and decided he could trust me. And he says, um, let me tell you something. He says, I'm a chaplain in the United States Army. I'm also an officer in the Haganah. And he says, I can fix this. So he says, first we've got to get you some false papers. So they got me a passport, and it identified me as Yehoshua Rice. And uh, then he said, uh, you don't look very Jewish. He said, I think a cap would help. So they got me an old cap, I kind of pulled it down like this. And... Uh, put me in touch with some guys there, and I, I, I lived with them, wrote about them, and then we went down to Marseille to a preparatory camp to get on one of those ships. And I knew it was dangerous, but I, I was going to go regardless. And um, I knew I might get sent to Cyprus and interned there. But there we sat. In Marseille, and the problem was the Exodus affair broke right then. The, the Exodus was one of those ships that was stopped <clears throat> by the British blockade, and instead of taking them to Cyprus, which they which they began to think was uh, not working as a deterrent, they uh, brought them back to Gibraltar, and uh, uh, they, they announced that they were going to, and they were going to put them off the ship there. So I cabled my office in Denver and told them I was, I'd done enough on this assignment, I was going to shift and cover the exodus. <clears throat> so I went to Gibraltar, and they refused to get off the ship. So they couldn't do it. And then they said, well, we'll take them up to, uh, I forget where it was. It was up by ha Hamburg someplace. And um, <coughs> they uh, forcibly dragged them off the ship, bumping them off and all that. And a lot of press was there. 
uh, and I wrote, wrote a, uh, a eyewitness story of the whole thing. And uh, what sort of state were they in? You know, the passengers by that time when you saw them in jib. Well, they were being taken back to uh, Bergen-Belsen. And of course, it was no longer an extermination camp, but it was had all those memories of what it had been. So they were uh, they were terribly angry, uh, and they were uh, well. They were making the most of a demonstration too. So it was it was political, and uh, they put uh, England in a terribly bad light, and they knew what they were doing. So it wasn't it wasn't uh, unthinking anger; it was directed anger. And uh, I don't I'd have to look back and see if I did justice to the story. I don't I I doubt if I analyzed it as I have just now. I should have, but I don't think I did. But um, I did tell everything I saw. This, of course, would have been quite soon after the end of the war, wouldn't it? Yes. It was 19... Um, when the war ended? 45, wasn't it? So this would have been 46, was it? I think it was early 46. And I suppose those people, when you saw them, they had been on the ship for a long time, the Exodus. Yeah. Yes. Was it very crowded? You know, could you describe It was how? crowded, and there were women and children, and uh, <coughs> some of them older people, too. It was, a, it was kind of a heartbreaking scene. But uh, as I'm telling you, they made the most of it, too. And I, if I remember rightly... That uh, kind of propagandistic aspect of it, uh, I think, was offensive to some of the other reporters uh, who thought, oh, well, this is just a show they're putting on, uh, hell with them, that kind of stuff. I got that sense, and I don't, don't remember in detail, and I may be wronging him to say that, but that's my recollection. <coughs> but. Um, well, was that your. Um First introduction, really, to concentration camp victims. Yes, yeah. And um, that that uh, it was my introduction to foreign reporting too, and I was awful green at it, but I. Um, Well, then, <clears throat> was, was the, it's interesting, this example, I think, of the um, Jewish immigration, you know, in bearing in mind what these people had gone through and how, you know, Britain was behaving with this blockade. Well, was there, um, did you take a strong line about it, about the injustice of what was happening to these people? Can you remember your reports and whether... You I was sort of uh, biased in it. those days, especially <coughs> um, anal <coughs> excuse me, analytical reporting hadn't really come in. It was a factual, objective reporting of just what you knew, and I, we left interpretation and analysis to the editorial page. And I, that was the way I'd been trained, and I, I didn't know anything different. And most, uh, it seems to me that the few people who did, um, I'd say, engaged reporting were either <coughs> either leftist radicals who weren't considered really mainline reporters, or else they were extreme conservatives who had their own line. 
And I, I, I was distrustful of both sides. And I thought that the right thing to do was tell which, everything you see, let the editorial page make the judgments, but tell the story. And um, that, that sort of implies a very good relationship between you as a reporter and your trusted editor. Is that right? That you would have trusted very much the, the editor? Well, not exactly. I didn't really have much to do with the edi editorial page. I, I figured that was a different department. And uh, so it wasn't, wasn't that I trusted them. Sometimes I might have disagreed with them. I don't remember in that case. But there have been times when I've disagreed with the editorial page. But I've always felt that they do their job and I do my job. And, uh, but I have learned in l later years, I've learned that uh, we, we all in the newspaper business have learned that just straight, objective, factual reporting can be misleading. And I'll jump ahead of the story a little bit. It has to do with uh, the McCarthy episode. Joe, Senator Joseph R. McCarthy of Wisconsin uh, stood up on the floor of the Senate and said, I hold in my hand, I've forgotten how many, say 301 or something, uh, Soviet agents who are in the State Department. And uh, they never found him. But, he, but people would, wrote that story. And it was big headlines. And he never was able to support it. There were a few little cases he had of some left-wingers, but he really, it was all blow and no show. Uh, but he got the headline he wanted, and he got the stories he wanted, and the, 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 the hollowness of his assertions didn't show up till much later. Uh, and the whole American journalism went through a soul searching of he's he's using our objectivity to for his own propaganda so we've got to have more in-depth reporting if we if a, if a public figure is spouting something we know as lies we've got to have it in the same stories find somebody else who says that he's a liar and uh, the whole nature of reporting was converted by that one episode. And uh, I went through that in Washington. And we'll get to that a little later because the whole McCarthy episode was a, 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 it was a big learning experience for how, to, how journalism ought to conduct itself. And in some cases, I'll just say this now, that lesson has been overlearned and you get every young reporter thinks that he or she ought to be telling the reader what to think about it instead of just giving them the, the basic uh, facts of a situation. And uh, there is a nice expression that I've forgotten who said it, but I think it was James Russell Wiggins who was, was the editor of the Washington Post. The reader deserves one clear look at the facts. And I, I still believe that. So. Yes. Did, did you ever go to Cyprus to see the camps on Cyprus? Uh, I didn't. I've been there later on a uh, Middle East story, but I was talking about the Turkish-Greek fight and all that. I didn't. I didn't. Uh, it was long after the camps were gone. Do you mind me going back a little into your war experience when you were on the merchant um, ships, you know, as a young officer? Um, presumably these would have been armed, would they? You know, bearing in mind it was a wartime situation, would you have had an armed crew on board, manning guns? Uh, not in the... Not in the merchant ships, but when I was in the converted merchant ship, 
that it was called the Terrazed, T-A-R-A-Z-E-D. It's named for a, a star. T- I beg pardon, T-E-R... T-A-R-A-Z-E-D. <coughs> and um, on the Terrazed, we had um, <coughs> a five-inch gun on the stern. We had uh, some, they called them Bofors, a 40 millimeter, 40 or 20, 20 millimeter. I think it was 20 millimeter guns, cannon, and then a lot of 50 caliber machine guns, and I uh, used them about once while I was aboard. We were attacked when we were in, uh, I think it was in Libya. I've forgotten some place in North Africa, and we got attacked and. So we, I got in. I was firing a 50 caliber machine gun. There was everybody was shooting, and <clears throat> it was so confusing. I don't know if we knew what we were shooting at. But. And we, would you all have been Americans on board, or did you ever have um, British people as well, or other nationalities? Now I'm con. <coughs> They were Americans in the Navy. On the on the War Admiral, we had <coughs> some depth charges, and we had a British um, military crew. And what exactly? I don't think they had. I wonder if they did have a gun. I don't think so. But I know they had these depth charges. And we call these guys the gun crew. Maybe we did have a big gun on the boat, too. Because we were going back and forth across the Atlantic. And uh, it was awful dangerous. So they may... Anyway, I know we had a, what we called a gun crew. I just can't picture the gun. But I know we had these depth charges, and we dropped them sometimes. If there were and you would have been in these big convoys all the time, would yeah. you? Yeah. It'd be about six boats long, and well, maybe ten boats side by side, and going back maybe ten, maybe a, well, I don't know, fifty or sixty boats all together, square. <coughs> None we turn go that way, we turn, go that way. We did a lot of zigzag to throw the, the subs off. And did you see no any, any ships sunk? Did you see many sunk yeah. during... When I was in the merchant, this was in the merchant marine, one, once we were going alone in the merchant marine up to, uh, on the way to Greenland. And um, we saw a, a tanker with a lot of smoke, and we knew it was hit. Another tanker over here, another tanker over here. So we went full speed heading for Halifax, and we all went to our uh, life raft stations. So if, we, if they hit us, they dropped the raft, and we climbed down some ropes and get on board. <clears throat> and um, there was a guy from a, a new mess boy was on board from Texas. He didn't know anything about the ocean or anything. And I, by then I figured I was an old hand. <clears throat> and uh, he was scared. And he looked mournfully around. He says, you know, he says, I'm no more good here than a one-legged man at an ass kicking. <laughs> I hadn't heard that one before. <laughs> <laughs> so Acquisition number 22579 wheel 3 Richard Dudman wheel 3 I I always knew, although I was four years there in Denver, <clears throat> I knew that wasn't a good enough paper for me to devote my life to. 
And Helen and I went to San Francisco on vacation and I talked to the Chronicle. They didn't have anything and it didn't I wasn't too impressed with it. <clears throat> then we went to Louisville in Kentucky and that was a good paper, but I didn't get any encouragement there and it didn't sound very receptive. <clears throat> and then I, we went to St. Louis. And I'd always heard about the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, the paper of Joseph Pulitzer. And I, <clears throat> from the minute I saw it, I knew I wanted to work there. But I didn't get any encouragement there either. And I badgered them for a year and a half with letters. And they finally said, come on. So, uh, and I, I think, um, looking back on it, I, I think... That persistence must have been one of the things that it made them think I would have had some merit. <clears throat> but a couple other things did too. I got there in the middle of winter and I had a war surplus Jeep and uh, they had a terrible snowstorm and the managing editor, uh, Ray Crowley, a uh, city editor, Ray Crowley, had no way of getting to work. So he said, is there anybody there with a vehicle that can come and get me? And they said, Dudman's got a four-wheel drive Jeep. He says, let's see if he can do it. So I, I was feeling very macho, and I got into my heavy Mackinac and, and my cap on, and I drove the Jeep out to his house. And he was a little fat man, and he got in, and he, he, there was a bar there you could hang on to, and I took him a, quite a route. We Every time we'd come to a place where the drifts had closed off the road, I'd drive up over the curb and drive down the sidewalk and get around it that way. He was hanging on and rocking back and forth. I, I gave him such a ride that he, <clears throat> he, he was much impressed. Uh, and then, not too long after that, I... I was doing very minor stories, never getting a byline, never, they didn't pay much attention to me. I was the new kid. Uh, but one day, when everybody else was out to lunch, the call came in that there was a riot going on at the city workhouse, a kind of a jail. And <clears throat> they looked around the office and all they could see was me. And... Uh, so they said, well, Dudman, get to the workhouse as fast as you can. There's a riot going on there. So I grabbed my jacket off the hook, got in the elevator, went down, flagged a cab, and they said, get to the workhouse as fast as you can. I'm going for there for the post dispatch. <clears throat> and the guy says, okay. And uh, he happened to fall in right behind a motorcycle and a sidecar of a couple of plainclothes police officers and they had a siren going and we went through all the stop signs and everything going down there into South St. Louis and they went right into the workhouse right in the midst of all of where the, all the fighting was going on and they were throwing coke bottles at each other and stuff like that and I, <clears throat> I got a an eyewitness account right in the middle of it and I <clears throat> They decided I was brave and resourceful. And uh, so they, that really made my reputation on that paper. And um, I, I, I never let them think anything different. Sometimes I'd be scared stiff, but I didn't tell them. <laughs> so <clears throat> uh, eventually I got transferred to Washington and I uh, there was a there were a couple of vacancies one man was an alcoholic and they hadn't been able to dry him out satisfactorily and they had to get rid of him and another one joined the CIA and hadn't been heard of since and um, so they had a couple of vacancies and they asked if I'd like to go to Washington and I grabbed it and we moved the family there by then, our two daughters were born in St. Louis. And uh, <clears throat> about the 
<clears throat> there was an incident in St. Louis where I, I had to assert myself quite a bit. Um, it was a time when uh, racial segregation, especially in a city like St. Louis, was still the accepted thing. Uh, the black people, we called them Negroes, and were identified by race in the stories. Uh, and uh, the uh, and there, but there were some efforts to uh, um, integrate various facilities. And uh, one of the, and I don't know how it happened, it must have been by a lawsuit, uh, they decided that uh, uh, one of the city <coughs> parks in South St. Louis, it was a mixed, uh, mostly Irish Catholic uh, area, <coughs> oh, they decided to integrate it and they announced when they were going to do it. Well, I I didn't know, I didn't have much confidence in the way that would be covered. But, it, uh, well, I shouldn't say that. I really had no knowledge of how they were going to cover it, but I wasn't assigned to it. But I decided I wanted to see what was going on. <coughs> So uh, it was on a Saturday, my day off, and I went down there to see the first day when blacks would be admitted to this public pool. And uh, I saw a, a black father and his young boys, young ch sons, uh, walk down a, a pathway that went to the pool from the dressing room and on each side of the pathway, there were whites glaring at them and muttering, and I hated the whole thing. And I, I <clears throat> mingled with them to see what they were saying, and several times I heard it said, they don't really want to go swimming. They're just going here because they want to show that they can do it. And I, it occurred to me that um, that was true. They'd much rather, for their own safety and comfort, have been doing anything else. But they were asserting a new right. And if you don't assert a right, it, it evaporates. And I decided that was going to be a, 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 an article for the paper. And we had a, a, a section, we called it the Dignity Page, where they publish um, <clears throat> opinion articles and analysis articles. And um, so I wrote a piece, just what I've told you, and um, made this point. And um, I had some examples, too. And one of them was a local... A St. Louis area example, a uh, a man named Josiah Parrish Lovejoy uh, in 1853 had operated a paper across the river in Elsa, Illinois, an abolitionist paper. He was, stood for abolition of slavery. <clears throat> and uh, Mobs burned down his plant, broke up his press three different times, and the third time they killed him. And there again was a guy who would much rather have been doing something else, but he was asserting a right. And that was one, he was a, one of our first martyrs for free press in the United States. <clears throat> and I had some other examples of that kind of stuff. Uh, <clears throat> the editor who handled that was a kind of a, oh, I'd say, a liberal, maybe left-wing kind of a guy. And I think that's, I think he liked the story. But a lot of the other people on the paper didn't like it. 
And when I went to work the day it was published, I, uh, to get to my desk, I'd always go past the country edition. And there was a nice old socialist who ran that. And he was always trying to get me to uh, go into his uh, socialist health plan. And uh, was always talking about socialism. But he was offended by this article. And he, he said, Dudman, he says, you wouldn't go swimming with those people, would you? <laughs> so, so much for socialist ideals. Uh, the paper, for a, it was known as a liberal paper, and a lot of the readers in town uh, actually thought it was a, they called it the, the St. Louis Daily Worker. They really accused us of being communist. And um, it did a lot of liberal stories. But this, most of the staff was uh, conservative and racist. And the reporters, the old reporters around me, used to snigger whenever there'd be a picture of a black woman in the paper. They'd say, oh, another another Indian princess. And then they, they always they had a word. Uh, they'd never say a black or a negro. They'd say a jigaboo. And they, they really were full of it. So, and uh, it wasn't just that paper, but St. Louis was a, a border state, and it was... Uh, uh, kind of split in the Civil War. So it was... Uh, those were tough issues. Well, there was another race issue that came up, too, in about 19... Um, <clears throat> must have been around 50 or 51. Uh, I went out to lunch alone... And I went past one of the big department stores, and there was a uh, lunch counter that they had that opened onto the street. And I looked in there, and I saw a lot of people sitting at the counter, but nobody eating. And some of them were blacks, and some of them were whites. And uh, blacks were barred from uh, all restaurants and lunch counters except a few that were for blacks only. And I uh, asked one of the people, I said, what's going on here? And he said, well, we're with the Committee on Racial Equality, CORE, C-O-R-E, and uh, this is a demonstration, and we're just, it's a peaceful demonstration to integrate the lunch counters. Well, I hurried back to the office, and I said, hey, I ran under a story, told them what was going on, he said, never mind, we're handling that all right. And they didn't publish anything about it. <clears throat> uh, I was new on the paper, and kind of green still, and I didn't want to write, go right in there and rock a lot of boats. I think it was well before that, uh, that swimming pool episode. And I was still pretty new at it, so I didn't do anything about it. But um, then there was a there was a book written about the, the whole uh, racial revolution in this country and the integration of things. I've forgotten the name of the book. It was by Taylor Branch. Um, and he gave all the credit for uh, for um, uh, integrating the lunch counters to Greenville, North Carolina, and they did it in 1962, and we had done it ten years earlier, and. They, the, in fact, the lunch counter from uh, 
Greenville. I want to say Greenville is Greenville or Greenberg or something, but anyway, <clears throat> a replica of that lunch counter, or maybe that's the original thing, is in the Smithsonian Institution. And they give them full credit, Smithsonian too. So by that, by the time this book came out, I was in Washington in our Washington Bureau. And I, when I read the book and I saw that, I thought, God damn it, we did it 10 years earlier. So I wrote an, an op-ed page piece about it. And in fact, I telephoned uh, St. Louis and I talked to a couple of the retired editors who had been on duty at the time and said, why didn't we publish anything about it? And uh, I said, I remember that now. And they said, well, we were afraid that there had been years before there had been some terrible race riots in the area, and they just didn't want anything inflammatory that was going to be a race. And then I, what they didn't say was that these were uh, big advertisers, the, the, the department stores were involved. And, uh, but they, they put it all on the other basis and uh, were kind of defensive about it. And they're old friends of mine. But um, I wrote a story recounting the facts of it and said that uh, I, whatever their reasons for not publishing it, they deprived St. Louis and the Middle West of credit that was due them. And uh, actually, there had been some things in Chicago. That's where we St. Louis people thought on about. And I called, I found out s some people who were still, s were surviving members of the core organization who had taken part in it. And I talked to them on the phone and I quoted them in the piece. Well, they were so ecstatic to have somebody get credit that they just, they commissioned a book to be written by a woman in in St. Louis, and it just came out last year, uh, and they um, gave me some credit for it in the thing, and reproduced this article. So it was kind of a long time coming. Then, and they, uh, at some point, after I wrote the op-ed page piece, I saw a, a letter or an article in one of the. Uh, black newspapers in St. Louis laughing about the Post-Dispatch finally finding out what was going on after all these years. And they were kind of ribbing me too. So, but it was a bit of, bit of history. Uh, Did it, what, was the Post-Dispatch an important paper at that time when you joined it? Oh, yes. It was, the Post-Dispatch was at a, always been listed as one of the four or five top newspapers in the country. There was always the New York Times, <clears throat> and there was the Christian Science Monitor, which you never hear from now, they've kind of gone downhill, <clears throat> and the, um, I guess the Washington Post was among the top ones then, and maybe the Chicago Tribune, and that was about it. And the Post-Dispatch was always there among the top ones. And one of the reasons was that uh, <clears throat> we had uh, seven men, there weren't any women men, there was seven man bureau uh, in Washington. And we, uh, from that bureau, we did a lot of foreign coverage. And uh, we, we were always asked incisive questions at press conferences and at presidential press conferences. And uh, we were recognized as being major players in the journalistic scene. And uh, that when I went to work there, uh, when I joined the Washington Bureau, the, the bureau chief was a man named Raymond P. Brandt, B-R-A-N-D-T. And uh, the, uh, 
and another member of the staff was a column, newspaper columnist named Marquis Childs. Have you heard of Marquis Childs? Well, people don't remember him now, but he was a great reporter and a, a dear friend of mine. And, um, and the paper had a, um, <clears throat> a motto or a kind of a dedication on the editorial page every day. And it's said that uh, uh, it was what, when Pulitzer, the original Pulitzer uh, retired, he made, a, made this statement. And he said, I know that the paper will always uh, combat uh, predatory plutocracy and predatory poverty. We always puzzled about what he was talking about. Was We thought maybe it was the newspaper guild he was talking about for predatory poverty. So we kidded about it a little. But then it had the line in it too. It said, and the paper will always be drastically independent. I like that term, drastically independent. And uh, they still publish that every day. It's a beautiful motto. And they, they lived up to it. It was a we we had always had a national correspondent who would work out of St. Louis, but any time there was a big story going on any place, he'd be there, and he'd have our own account of it. And people don't do that anymore. They, they take the wire services, they take the Washington Post to the uh, New York, especially the New York Times, and so what we get is kind of homogenized news. Well, the Post Dispatch always had its own input, and often it was running against the grain. Against, <clears throat> in fact, when the when the Vietnam War was really triggered in the Geneva Conference in 1954, that divided North and temporarily divided North and South. Vietnam, and they were supposed to have an election later. Uh, uh, and the French had been defeated at the Battle of Dien Bien Phu, and uh, it was a humiliating defeat for them. Uh, we had a series of, of editorials each one was headed, A War to Stay Out Of. And we had our, our great uh, editorial cartoonist who was reprinted all over the country, Daniel Fitzpatrick. Uh, he was right along with Lowe. It was Lowe was a Brit, wasn't he? Well, they were, Lowe and Fitzpatrick were very much the same. They drew in charcoal. And it was heavy, angry, forceful cartoons. Well, he had a cartoon that showed a, 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 an American GI walking into a swamp called Southeast Asia, and it said, one more war won't help. <clears throat> and uh, I was so proud of that paper. And la later, uh, I was one of the first correspondents to get into China. And Zhou Enlai had, uh, had Helen and me, my wife Helen and me, to dinner at a table, a big round table with 21 people at it. And uh, a couple of visiting American college professors were there, John Fairbank, the uh, famous China expert, and um, well, they oh, and um, what's his name? Well, anybody who happened to be in China at the time, they had <clears throat> he had at the table there, and Joe and Lai went around the table. I uh, he'd been briefed pretty well on us all, and he asked um, <clears throat> Fairbank. He said, uh, how do you think the 
relation, growing relationship between the United States and China is progressing. This was in 1972 when they were already admitted to the UN, and uh, but they were not didn't have exchange of ambassadors yet. <clears throat> and um, Fairbanks said, "Well, we we're glad that you people." Are, you have staff at the UN, but they shouldn't just stay in New York. We ought to send people around the United States and see a lot more about our country. And uh, he said, no, it's not, we're not ready for that. Uh, they might uh, have uh, some, um, <clears throat> if they went to other parts of the country, they might run into some trouble with the people from Taiwan. He didn't want it. Uh, confrontations. <clears throat> and Fairbanks said, but you could just make quick trips. And uh, Joe and Lai says, as we say in China, you cannot admire flowers from horseback. <laughs> <laughs> so I, when he got to me, he said, to the man. He spoke a little English, and I, I knew I was up. And he said, I understand your paper has been a very strong opponent of the United States uh, intervention in Vietnam. And I said, I'm glad you know that. And maybe you don't know that we've opposed uh, United States intervention in Vietnam since 1954. And I told him about those articles in that cartoon. And um, he was much impressed. And he said, would it be possible for our newspaper people in our news agency, Xinhua, to visit your paper? He was, see, he was contradicting what he just told Fairbank. And I said, absolutely, we'll fix it. Whom do I talk to to make the arrangements? And he said, Mr. Ma Yushin right here. He says, talk to him and we'll arrange it. And I did. And they visited. And we had, a, we had so much. It was a fascinating visit. We, uh, I took them to McDonnell Douglas. And they saw warplanes being made. And they actually sat in a mock uh, uh, pilot seat and pretended to shoot down some mock planes, little planes, but they were, I found out that normally they used MiGs, but they'd taken the MiGs away and just had some nondescripts. <laughs> and um, then I took them over to uh, uh, Anheuser-Busch, the brewery, and uh, in the course of our visit, we'd gone to a brewery in uh, Tang Shan, uh, which used to be called Mukden, <coughs> way up in the northeast, and um, we we had visited a brewery there called the Snowflake Brewery. Actually, the way that came about was that uh, uh, <coughs> there were limited places they let us go in that early time, and they suggested we go to Tang Shan. No, I don't mean Tangshan. It's Shenyang, Shenyang. Acquisition number 22579, Wheel 4. Richard Dubman, Wheel 4. I said Tangshan. I meant Shenyang, which was used to be Mukden. Uh, we had gone there, <clears throat> and uh, uh, they seemed to think we were fascinated by textile factories. And we'd been to about five of them and sat through long, boring briefings on how many cubic yards or cubic meters of this or that they'd made and all that. <clears throat> and then they said, what would you like to do tomorrow? And I said, I'd like to see a brewery, because St. Louis... It's a big brewery town, and I thought if we can get the brewery 
workers to read the paper. It had to be good. So I s said, how about taking us to a brewery? And he said, no, there are no breweries here. Well, it's a city of a million people. And I, but you don't want to, dealing with the Chinese, you don't want to say you're wrong. I said, would you check again? Because I, 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 there may be one. So they said, they came back later and said, yes, there's a, there are breweries, but they're not ready yet. And I said, let me explain to you something about the newspaper business. When things aren't ready is when we like to go the most. Because then we can see something that's taking form. And we can get, get a more spontaneous view of what's going on. <clears throat> so they thought about that. And they finally cooked it up. So we went to this Snowflake Brewery. And instead of this, I got sort of sick of tea after a while. Instead of tea afterwards, when they'd ask for our constructive suggestions and criticism and self-criticism and all that stuff, this was in the height of the of the Cultural Revolution. So there was a, they were full of ideology, and uh, Mao Zedong read books and all that stuff. <clears throat> so I, instead of tea, they served us fresh beer. And was it good? And I got an idea for a story. I said to the brewmaster and to the chairman of the Revolutionary Committee, the two of them were the two uh, top people that were present. <clears throat> I said, I'd like to know if you people splash the beer into a glass or if you slant the glass and slide it down. Well, the brown... Braumeister, no, the Revolutionary Committee said, well, I like to slide it down. And the Braumeister said, I like to splash it. No, I'm getting this wrong. The head of the Revolutionary Committee said he, he liked to splash it in and get a big hit. And then the big fat other guy said, I like to slide it down the side of the glass so it leaves the gas in the beer. And then when you drink the beer, the gas goes into the stomach and that makes you belch and belching feels good. <laughs> so I, I had my story. And I, I, I must say, I never did a good find out <laughs> what kind of a play they gave it. But I wrote a cute little short on that one. Um, Your first, I, I'm going to ask you a lot about the um, Far East later on. You know, particularly, I think you went to Vietnam first of all, didn't you, when you were looking at China in the 1960s? Yes. But before then, you'd done quite a lot in Central America. Would this have been your first, you know, foreign correspondence work for the um, Post Dispatch? Yes. The first. My first assignment came, first foreign assignment for the Post Dispatch came, <clears throat> I think it was less than two weeks after we'd, after I'd joined the Washington Bureau. <clears throat> and um, they sent me to Guatemala in Central America where uh, a, um, a left-wing government was... Uh, uh, under attack by a some kind of a revolutionary movement or uh, an uprising that was uh, moving in from uh, a neighboring uh, Honduras. And uh, so uh, we had one, another man, a reporter was uh, in... Um, uh, Guatemala City, and uh, so I decided the thing for me to do was to join the dissidents, join the revolutionaries. And uh, I went to Tegucigalpa, the capital of, uh, of Honduras, and took a little plane to a place called New Octopus, uh, which was on the border. And... Um, <clears throat> 
quite a few reporters were gathered there, wondering how they could get in to join up with the head of the uh, uh, the dissident movement. His name was Castillo, Ar Castillo Armas, and um, he um, there was a, a an English correspondent named Evelyn Irons, who uh, had gone ahead on horseback, I think, to get in. And uh, the other British correspondents said they were so worried about poor Evelyn, they were hoping nothing had happened to her. They were just thought this was so uh, foolhardy of her to have done such a thing, and they just were so worried about her. Of course, what they really hated was they were getting beaten on a story. <clears throat> well, uh, another... Uh, a, uh, Another correspondent, I think he was a Frenchman, I think he worked for Le Monde, uh, and I decided that we would try to find some way of getting in. And we hired a, a mule for him and a horse for me, and we rode in over the mountains. I never have had such pain. <laughs> every, every crease in that saddle cut into my hind end. And um, we <clears throat> slept in a hammock, in hammocks, uh, on the way. And then the next day, we we made it in there, and we beat a lot of the other correspondents. And um, <clears throat> this was, um, in a way, it was kind of a joke war. There were very few people got hurt. I did hear bullets flying past some once in a while in the Battle of Chickamauga, I think it was. And um, <clears throat> I, 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 I had my typewriter along, and I'd write stories and then hand them to s somebody who would carry them back to Tegucigalpa, where I'd made arrangements with uh, the telegraph company that they would uh, accept them. I'd shown them my credit card, given them the numbers and stuff, and then they'd send them to St. Louis. So um, I guess they eventually got everything I sent. That was quite different from these days when you can use a, a, a satellite telephone and be right in touch with your, your office and have a computer and write your story and flash it to them instantaneously. Um, it must have been quite a lesson to you, you know, a very difficult situation to get into. And, um, you know, going in on horseback. And um, do you have to be very sort of innovative and improvise a lot, you know, when you are working in such situations? But I did wonder how this was being financed. And I saw they had uh, <clears throat> little um, Israeli Uzi machine guns, brand new, uh, that they had in, in uh, cases. And they had <clears throat> quite a few uh, Chevrolet station wagons, brand new. <clears throat> And uh, I took down the license numbers of the station wagons, thinking I'd check that out and that might tell me something. But um, uh, but then I kind of ridiculed the primitiveness of it too. At the same time, with all that, they had a, a sort of a they called it an air force. They had about three training planes with uh, w one person in the cockpit. And they had um, sticks of dynamite tied around a, uh, a hand grenade. And they'd pull a pin on the hand grenade and drop it, and that would cause it to go off. And it seemed like uh, uh, such a... a uh, shoestring operation that uh, I <clears throat> I don't know if I wrote this, but I felt that uh, 
it was not likely that the rumors that the CIA was operating were correct. Well, the CIA later claimed credit for it, and, and they were running the whole thing. But I, uh, <clears throat> I learned a little more about being more skeptical about uh, whether our spooks were involved in something. And um, so that's about enough of that one. But it was my introduction to foreign reporting. And then uh, <coughs> they, the, the paper uh, sent me twice to uh, Argentina when Juan Perón was being kicked out. And I covered those episodes. And then, um, well, much somewhat later, I was in um, Dominican Republic when there was uh, a kind of a left-wing government that the United States was trying to get overthrown. It was... Uh, It was kind of a civil war, although it didn't amount to much. And then um, when uh, Castro was beginning to get ready to take over Cuba, I went, I should have been there earlier, but I, they sent me down at the last minute and I teamed up with him down at this uh, east end of the island and marched with him into uh, into Havana, his victory march, and did a story about that. And uh, and then was that surprising? You know, the fact that um, Castro did actually oust the um, the government there. Was that surprising did to he, you? Did he actually? Yes, that he actually achieved victory, Castro, Castro and his guerrillas, when they went up from the. Um, well, I found country. it very surprising, mm. because he was. Uh, he seemed to me such a nervous guy. Uh, he was drinking coffee all the time. He, uh, I, I didn't think he uh, had the staying power to last uh, even the more than a few weeks and here he's still there it's um so would you have interviewed him or met him while he was actually in the um sierra maestra was it that area well he was already moving uh moving up the island towards havana when i got there and uh i don't remember if i had a chance to uh I didn't. I know I didn't ever have any extended interview with him, but I saw him to speak briefly to. And uh, I didn't think at the time. I, I think I was wrong, but I didn't think at the time that he was a dedicated communist. I thought of him as a nationalist more. And uh, I'm still not. Sure, I seems to me that he, um, the United States was so suspicious of him, I think we kind of drove him into the arms of the communists. They were the one ally he could find. So, uh, I, but I'm, um, I'm not, I, I'm not, I don't speak much Spanish, and I don't think I'm really equipped to know for sure what the truth of that is. But as I've always considered it a kind of a mystery. Mm -hmm. I, as you followed Castro and, you know, his supporters um, across the island, how were they welcomed? How did the people react to him? Was there enthusiasm? Oh, yeah. Was it in their yeah, they, <coughs> they hated the old dictatorship. It was a corrupt, uh, brutal dictatorship. And they hated that. And here was freedom. And uh, 
So they, they, were, they were dancing in the street. I loved him. And he, he was, he still is a uh, charismatic speaker. He can go on. He, I heard him do a speech for about four hours. And they stood there and listened. They, thousands and thousands of people crowded into this downtown Havana. Uh, and they were listened with rapt attention. Did you ever meet Batista, you know, during this time? Never or met him, no. uh, I think he, let's see, no, I never, never met him. Mm -hmm. What was the, what were you able to report about um, Castro, you know, and his revolutionaries and their victory, you know? I wonder how this went, what you would have written about it, and how this went down at that time in the United States. Because we're talking really, aren't we, of the you know, very Cold War era, and sort of fears of the left. Well, I think the US government was al always very suspicious of him. But I think... Um, I just don't know what the American people thought about him. I, I thought of him as kind of a Robin Hood at the start. And um, but he was a he was a tough guy. I remember they I went to a, uh, a military court. They had for some uh, people that they, some of Batista's henchmen, and they were, I don't remember what the charges were, but I, they were capital charges. And they were, I think they condemned them to death. And one of the best pictures I ever got was those three bearded judges sitting there side by side on the bench listening to testimony. And we, we ran it across the top of the page. It was a great picture. Did you yourself you know, get any evidence of what Batista had done to people? You know, of any atrocities? Apart from what you heard at these sort of tribunals? I'm trying to think. That, uh, of course, would have been part of the story, but I don't recall what I did with that. Uh, <clears throat> I, I, I'm, I may have assumed that he was so bad you didn't even need to go into additional evidence. But... Uh, Probably should have, but I didn't. Mm -hmm. And I, 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 <clears throat> I was limited in what I could do, not speaking any Spanish. I know a few words, and that was all. <clears throat> yes, would you have had an interpreter with you, Richard? I, not there. And I, I, I occasionally have, but I found it awful cumbersome. I've done it in China. And uh, <clears throat> that was, uh, I absolutely had to there. But most places I've, um, Vietnam, I never used an interpreter. I'd find people who could speak English. And I, and um, covering the war, I, a lot of Vietnamese I could, who spoke English, and then uh, a lot of middle-level 
American military officers were damn good. Colonels and lieutenant colonels and majors who really knew what was going on, and they'd tell you. And uh, they were a good source. Did you follow up um, Cuban affairs, you know, after the success of the revolution in, what was it, 59, 60? I was wondering about the Bay of Pigs, whether you had um, <coughs> any reporting on that. I did. Um, I covered it from Washington mostly. <coughs> and um, I knew some um, some of the Cubans who uh, <coughs> were anti Castro. And um, I could find it. I knew from them, and then a little bit that I read that uh, some kind of an operation was being planned. And um, the office assigned me to uh, St. Louis, assigned me to go down to uh, El Salvador where there was, I'd forgotten, some kind of trouble. And um, I did a story there, and then I went across to Guatemala, and um, just as I went out of the office to go down to San Salvador, Marcos Childs handed me a, a torn thing out of, I think it was the New Republic, uh, saying that there was <clears throat> reports of uh, a uh, preparatory uh, training camp or something in a place called Retalalehu in Guatemala. And he says, while you're down there, take a look at that. So I wrapped up the story. It wasn't much in San Salvador and sent him a story. And then I went to Guatemala and I uh, went out on the street, not from my hotel, but I, I wanted to get a taxi cab that would not be, uh, maybe not report where I was going. I told the guy I wanted to go to Retalalehu. And I found it on the map. And we went up there. And we got out of the, I got out of the cab, and there was a guard with a machine gun and a lot of construction going on. And this uh, guard said, what are you doing here? And I said, I'm a reporter for the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. I, I want to know what's happening here. He said, we don't want you around here. And he, he kind of pushed the gun in my stomach. So we left. And I found out from the cab driver that uh, this was a, a Cuban accent. And, uh, and I could see some activity, and I couldn't see much. But I, I wrote about everything I could about what I had seen. And um, <laughs> they pasted it on the bottom of the story from San Salvador, so it never even got a headline. <laughs> but at least I was there. <laughs> So that was a kind of a frost. And I, I, I must say, I, I, uh, I was skeptical of it. It didn't, didn't look like some kind of a multi-million dollar project or anything like that. It looked pretty modest. And uh, so I didn't quite do as good a job as... Uh, as the New York Times did on the subject. But they pulled their punches, as you may remember. And uh, Arthur Schlesinger, Jr. and um, somebody else went around to the different papers and 
especially the Times, that said it'd be against national security to say what you know about our plan. And the Cubans knew it all, of course. And I lived next door to the guy who planned it all, a man named Richard Bissell, number three in the CIA. And uh, <clears throat> the day the Bay of Pigs invasion collapsed and they knew it was a loser, he came running out of the house, jumped in his old Studebaker, <clears throat> and Helen was on his way up the steps to borrow a cup of sugar or something from Annie Bissell. <laughs> Almost got run down. We didn't know until afterwards what, what was happening. <laughs> then I suppose the next thing there would have been the missile crisis in the year after. I didn't cover that a bit. I can't remember. What, I know why. I was in Vietnam. Yes. <clears throat> yes, this takes us nicely, doesn't it, to um, your first visit, which I think was about this time, wasn't it, in 1961? Well, the first visit <coughs> was um, a um, <coughs> was when China was still off limits to American Americans generally, including reporters. And since we couldn't get in, the uh, Mr. Crowley, by then he was managing editor, the guy who'd hired me. sent me and uh, a, a photographer to go around the perimeter of China and find out everything we could about what was going on inside China. And so we charted quite a course. We went to Burma, and, uh, Macau, Hong Kong, and uh, Korea, Korea. I think we went to Korea, yeah. And Vietnam. And as soon as I got to Vietnam, it must have been in 19... <clears throat> I think it was 61. As soon as I got there, uh, Kennedy already... I don't mean... Uh, yeah, Kennedy had just become president. He already had some small number of military advisors in there already. And um, the photographer and I landed at Hansanut Airport, and there was a um, U.S. military public affairs guy there to uh, greet any visiting correspondents. And, uh, so he said, I'll take you for a tour around Hansanut Airport and show you what's going on. And showed me a lot of American planes, and he showed me a, <clears throat> a DC-3, that's what you, I think you call them a Dakota, it was a, a, a old two-engine, very, very serviceable plane. You want to change? Position number 22579, Veal 5. Richard Dodman, Veal 5. Oh, let's see, where were we? Yes, you were saying you went, you were shown this around the airport. They showed us a Dakota, a DC-3. <clears throat> and it had spigots along the edge of the... the trailing edge of the wing. And I said, what's that anyway? And he said, well, that's what we spray poison to poison the, the crops to starve out the enemy. And he said that, I think he said that's supposed to be secret. Well, what he didn't know was that the photographer was clicking away, but he had a very silent camera. <laughs> so he got a lot of pictures of it. And I think that was the first pictures of that showed crop destruction. And uh, <clears throat> so uh, we, and then we went into town and we uh, talked to uh, uh, CIA pilots 
and uh, they w work for a thing called, uh, well, it was a, succession, a successor of the Flying Tigers, I think. It was a ostensibly private company, but it was run by the CIA. And uh, these, and then there were some American Air Force people too. And uh, one of the other um, uh, question came up of uh, to what extent were was the United States involved in combat already? And they. I said, well, of course not, but um, we can shoot when we're fired on. And then one of the guys told us, he says, uh, of course, you can always say, what well, doesn't that look like gunfire down there? And then they can give them an excuse. And then we found out also that um, <clears throat> American pilots were running these planes and that they had a checklist of uh, things they had to take along and their, their ammunition and their guns and their uh, their parachutes and a Vietnamese. You know, all it was was just to cover baggage to, to make it sound as if they were advising. And the upshot of it was that we were already involved in combat in that early stage. And uh, so I wrote that. The, uh, I think later we'll go on to the business about what I learned about China and the, that, that's a whole other subject and it'll go on at some length. Um, before I went on the tour around China, I had an introduction to uh, the Far East I, on a a sudden impulse of my editor to send me to Laos. And uh, what had happened there was that um, um, Laos was supposedly a neutral country, but the, uh, the communist element, the Patet Lao, was uh, uh, gradually trying to take it over. And um, one of our <coughs> prominent columnists at the time, Joe Alsop, had been writing, uh, I would say, hysterical pieces uh, about the nature of this invasion. And uh, he talked about uh, uh, terrible battles and uh, a, an invading force that was uh, backed by the Chinese communists. And at that time, uh, the American public had been inflamed against China, and China had, the Chinese co communists had uh, been hard to deal with, and they had done some uh, reprehensible things against Americans, locking up the ambassador and things like that. And uh, the two countries were, of course, very much on the outs. And um, uh, so any mention of Chinese expansionism uh, was uh, dynamite. And my editor wanted to know if this was true. So when he uh, wanted to have some reporting from the scene, he immediately thought of me. And uh, he said, how soon can you get to Laos? And uh, I said, well, I can leave tomorrow. And um, he said, uh, um, he said, well, I suppose you ought to head right for Vientiane, uh, the capital of Laos. I was so ignorant about the Far East, I, I didn't even recognize that name. And I said, Vietnam, I thought you said Laos. <laughs> he said, no, Vientiane. And I said, oh, yes, yes. And um, so I... Uh, I had my bag always packed, and my uh, immunity shots were always up to date. And I had to rustle around and find some money. I, I think on that occasion, the bureau chief was Marquis Childs, 
and uh, he had he was a member of the Metropolitan Club in Washington, and um, they kept cash there for members who might need it. He was able to give me, I think, thirteen hundred dollars, and uh, I um, rolled it up in a wad and stuck it in my pocket. And I, I usually convert to cra traveler's checks for safety's sake, but uh, there was no time for that, so I didn't get my traveler's checks till I got to Hong Kong. Um, but um, <clears throat> that was one of the things they always liked about me, that I never said, well, my kid's got a basketball game I've got to go to, or my wife is planning a big party, or I've got this or that. I never let any of that stand in my way. And it was kind of hard on Helen, but she was supportive of the whole thing because she liked to see me get ahead. And uh, so uh, and they, they liked to have somebody who would take right off. And then I knew that uh, Mr. Crowley would go into the to Mr. Pulitzer and say, we think that it's important we get some firsthand reporting there, and Dudman is already on his way. And uh, they, they liked that. And it was, and so did I. Uh, well, I, I, I went from Hong Kong to Bangkok and got a little plane that took me to Vientiane. And um, we, I was, had a jacket and tie and uh, street shoes and was uh, not really ready for the primitive conditions I found there. It rains all the time in Laos. And uh, there's very little paving even at the airport. And um, the DC-3 pulled us over to the, uh, they taxied over near a little shack, which is the terminal, and parked in the mud. And I, I could see that it was going to be over my shoe tops as soon as I got off. And uh, I remember the Associated Press man was there, a man named uh, uh, Forrest Edwards. He says, call me Woody. <laughs> and uh, Woody Edwards, uh, there wasn't much for him to do there, so he'd go out whenever the plane came in. He'd go out to see who was coming and maybe get a little story. And uh, I said, uh, uh, what's it like here anyway? And he says, well, it's miserable. He says, my, my athlete's foot has now reached my knees. <laughs> and uh, so I got, a, I got into town somehow and got a hotel room uh, in a crummy little hotel. I, and I remember I was there several days. I guess I was there a week or so. And um, there were, I forget the name of them, there was little lizards that lived. There was one that lived back of the mirror. And when I'd shave in the morning, he'd stick his head out and make little noises and look at me. And uh, I got kind of used to all that. And then enormous cockroaches at every place. I, it was pretty primitive conditions. Um, the, uh, the embassy, American embassy and the military attache were, uh, they, I, there were several other press people there. Most of them stayed in a nicer hotel. And um, they'd had a, have a, bill, a briefing every morning. And they were talking about this fighting that was going on up in the mountains, and uh, right at, and they were the source of much of Joe Alsop's reporting. And uh, they talked about the Chinese being there, and, they, and the the big bottle, battle of um, um, I forget the name of the town, but some little town where uh, there had been a, a battle of several days, and uh, the communists were finally beaten off, they said. And this had gone out over the wires already. Um, 
Well, an, uh, an Italian reporter and I, I decided we wanted to go there. And uh, most of the r reporters, like in those days, liked to hang close to a, a cable head so they could file their stories. And if they were way out in the field someplace, there'd be no way to get it in. So uh, I could understand that, but I wasn't bound by any daily deadlines or anything like that. If I got a story, I'd find a way to get it to them. So the Italian and I talked the Laotians into uh, flying us up to uh, Sam Nua, which was uh, a nearby town. And then the battle was at a place called Tom Nua. I think it was Tom Nua, uh, which was a little ways farther. And we landed at a little airstrip, and there was a uh, the, the, the uh, fort, the Laotian fortress that had been uh, attacked was on a hill. And we walked up there, and this fortress amounted only to um, a few thatched huts, and then there was kind of a, 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 a the command post was an open-sided uh, thatched roof structure, very primitive. Uh, and um, I asked to talk to the whoever was in charge, the commanding officer. I, I asked what questions I had, and I said, I'd like to know about this recent battle. And he said, I said, what, what enemy did you see? He said, well, actually, we didn't see them at all. He says, they attacked, but um, we could see it coming, so we left. And uh, I said, well, were there any casualties? Uh, he said, no, nobody was hurt, uh, but they did some damage. And I said, for example, he said, well, you see this, uh, it was a kind of a small, slim log of a tree that they used to support part of this thatched roof. And he, he said, Do you see how that was broken? Uh, a bullet hit that, and it broke it, and we had to tie it together with a, an old rag. And he says, that, that's the sort of thing. And I said, well, uh, and the, did they occupy the place? And he said, well, we knew they were here. And I said, how did you know that? And he said, well, some, we could see that somebody had been eating out of our cook pots. Well, suddenly it sounded like uh, uh, Goldilocks and the Three Bears. Somebody's been eating out of my pot. And uh, I was struck with how funny this whole thing was. <clears throat> and then I <clears throat> I said, were, were there any Chinese forces involved? And he said, we think so. Because he said, when the, the enemy... Uh, troops were approaching, the ladies from the village went out with flowers to greet them, and um, some of them spoke in a strange accent, and they thought they might be Chinese. And that was the basis for a big scare over Chinese expansionism. Well, I blew it out of the water. <laughs> and uh, that... I must say that observation there uh, helped teach me to be wary of uh, uh, any of those uh, Cold War scare stories about Sino-Soviet expansionism, uh, which, um, especially in the case of Vietnam were a, a, a glib, a grossly inaccurate uh, description of a, uh, a nationalistic uh, independence movement. And uh, it, uh, but Americans and the American media were so caught up in the Cold War and so imbued with the idea of uh, Sino-Soviet, uh, we always called it the 
the monolithic Sino-Soviet group, and, and uh, the, the government officials believed it. They saw that they were awfully slow to see any signs of the Sino-Soviet split, and uh, they any again and again around the world, they mistook uh, nationalistic leaders for uh, tentacles of a encroaching. Sino-Soviet uh, effort at world domination. Well, they overestimated their enemy. <clears throat> um, I, I, uh, I'll go now to the uh, assignment I had uh, in '61 to uh, with a photographer to go around the rim of China and find out as much as we could about what was going on in this mysterious place. And uh, one of the things that, again, Joe Alsop had been writing about was that the Chinese people were in the Great Leap Forward, uh, which was a uh, Mao Zedong's uh, effort at, uh, at rapid uh, rapid economic organization, and uh, I don't remember the details of it, but it was a kind of a screwball uh, economic uh, uh, jump start program that he had. And uh, Would that have been, that would have been the Great Leap Forward, would it? That would he, been, what he called the Great Leap Forward. Yes, it was, it was the Great Leap Forward was their name for it. And um, Alsop's story, and uh, from some other people, was that, uh, that this was so improvident that the, the, the Chinese people were uh, suffering mass starvation and, and uh, the whole country was going into a collapse, you know, the whole communist regime. Well. I, I got the same story when we went to Hong Kong and talked to the CIA there, and uh, that was uh, one of the favorite listening posts that America had for what was going on in China. Um, <clears throat> uh, I got the same thing at Macau and uh, the uh, Portuguese colony then, uh, an offshore island or an enclave. and. Um, Actually, I didn't find out much about China in other places, but I got all of this really load of this kind of uh, 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 prediction of disaster going on in China. And um, it was so, one of the things they said, and I know Alsop wrote, was that the, uh, the caloric intake uh, had gone way down way below subsistence level. And um, I wasn't really satisfied with what we'd found out. I wasn't sure I was getting the right story. It sounded to me like propaganda. I, so I, I arranged to go back to uh, Washington <clears throat> by way of um, by way of Stockholm, because a, a good friend of mine uh, in Washington had been the press officer of the the uh, Swedish embassy, a man named Chell Oberg, O B E R G, and uh, uh, we'd been become good friends of Chell and his wife, and we. We're at dinner in each other's houses a lot, and I, it, it, he was such a refreshing guy, was a very, very wise observer, and um, he had been uh, appointed China's first, uh, uh, Sweden's first ambassador to China, and he had, uh, when he got the appointment, he told me that he was going to keep his eyes open and he knew there'd be limitations on what he could learn, but uh, he expected to 
find out a lot about China. And he put in a, a good year there under harsh restrictions. They didn't, wouldn't let him travel much or anything like that. But um, I either cabled him or telephoned him and said I'd, we, we told him about our assignment. And I said, we'd like to go back by way of Stockholm and to talk to you and compare notes on some of the things we've been told. Well, we put in a couple of days there. And he uh, was able to uh, supply information that uh, told that, sure, there was some some hardships and some difficulties and some crazy things going on in China, but that starvation was not one of them. And uh, that... Um, <clears throat> forgotten. He had one funny thing. He, he had read uh, Joe Alsop's stuff too. And uh, uh, there was a confusion of two different words. One for calories and the other one I think was asparagus. And uh, it was the asparagus that was way down, not the calories. <laughs> so uh, there, was, there was some crazy slip-ups like that that led to a lot of inaccurate reporting um, and uh, he, he the, the uh, overall thrust of his uh, conclusion was that uh, uh, China had uh, had some uh, unworkable policies but that they were not they were already recovering and um, that collapse was not in sight at all. And it, it, uh, they were actually, their economy was really on a steady upward track. Well, uh, <clears throat> I was able to weave what he told me into what we'd heard and present a series of articles that gave people a more balanced view of what was going on in China. Um, was the news of the um, Sino-Soviet split at that time evident? Was that realized that you know there had been this very serious split? Yes. In '61. Um, I think actually the the the, uh, the evidence of the split. Uh, appeared more openly uh, a little later than that. Uh, so it was a, it was almost universally believed by uh, by U.S. government, by the uh, uh, the press and the public that this was a monolith, and. Uh, I just don't remember if I was able to to uh, raise a question of whether that was accurate or not. I, I don't know. Well, what you've been explaining, um, Richard, seems to raise a very important point about how reporters, you know, if you depend too much on these official briefings and sort of top-level people like ambassadors, <coughs> that that can be really misleading, like Allsop, for instance. I've thought about that a lot. And I, I, to a reporter, access is considered, access to, to good high-level sources is considered very valuable. And I, I've known reporters and columnists who I pretty much built their careers on a close relationship with the director of the CIA. And um, I used to, I tried to keep my foot in both camps. And in Washington, when I, when I, there was, when I wanted some information, I'd sometimes talk to the CIA. But then when they wanted me to, to or they wanted to debrief me when I'd come back from an assignment, I'd say, no, I put it all in the paper, and I wouldn't feel right about becoming an agent. And I've, I found out that they did consider me for 
as a prospect for being an agent at one time. I got my papers by a Freedom of Information request, and I, but they decided against it. And uh, but they they did a really rundown on me. Found out that my mother was uh, uh, pretty radical in her thinking, and uh, and that I had known some communists when I was in in college and when I was uh, uh, worked at the Denver Post, and uh, they did a job on me. Um, so, uh, but. Uh, They, they don't, uh, these top officials, you, you can think you're having a friendship with them, and you can think you're having a, a productive relationship, but actually they, they aren't helping you because of the color of your eyes. They want to use you. And uh, so access can, can be a trap. And uh, so I... All through the build-up into the Vietnam uh, adventure, I always uh, cultivated uh, dissident people. Uh, the, the peace movement in the United States, some of us a little nutty, but, but they knew some things too. And then uh, radical professors and, and uh, uh, a few members of this Congress and the Senate who were uh, skeptics. Uh, Dwayne Morse, I became close to him. And every time I'd do a series of articles about Vietnam I would, or China or stuff, I would uh, send them to him and he'd put them in the congressional record and make a speech about it. And G Eugene McCarthy, I got to know him well. And uh, the people around him. And they, uh, they were good sources. Uh, to balance the official line, which uh, I could get easy as pie, but I was a member of um, the, the um, I think we called it the Overseas Writers. It was a group of people who covered the State Department in Washington, and we'd have uh, background-only sessions with Secretary of State and different people. And uh, so I went to those things, but I, I didn't limit myself to what I got out of there. And um, did you ever hear of a man named uh, I.F. Stone? He, was, he ran a radical newspaper, a weekly, I.F. Stone's Weekly. And uh, he was one of the first who went on one of those... Um, uh, illegal immigration ships going to Palestine and did a lot of stories about that. And he was kind of my model when I tried to do it. And um, we became friendly with him and his wife. And uh, uh, I, I told him about this State Department group that would meet. And uh, he uh, he said he'd be kind of interested in it, and uh, so I um, asked uh, Marvin Kalb, who was the head of it at the time, if um, if he could be admitted to these meetings. And Kalb called me in distressed in a distressed way after he checked it out. He talked to his uh, executive committee, and one of them said they thought that uh, uh, I. F. Stone was too radical and might even be a communist. And uh, acquisition number two two five seven nine real estate. Richard Dudman, Real Six. So Mal Marvin Kalb told me not to worry that we'd uh, overcome this difficulty, but the the uh, action on 
Stone's membership in this group would be delayed for a month. And so I explained this to, to uh, Izzy, and uh, he was, he'd, he'd face this kind of suspicion a lot. And he was kind of a pariah around town, actually. And uh, he said, Dick, he says, get me out of this. He says, I don't want to have anything. I feel like I've stepped in a great big pile of horse shit. He says, get me out of it. I don't want to have anything to do with it. So I told Marvin, I said, let's forget it. <laughs> but anyway, that's, uh, as I tell you, I, I, I tried to keep a foot in both camps. And um, as you were saying earlier, um, this would have been at an earlier period about McCarthyism, when you were explaining um, the sort of approach of um, somebody like yourself to news and the need, um, you know, how this need to be factual uh -huh. um, changed to the need for some sort of analysis yes. because of the dangers of what someone like McCarthy, it's, I suppose all this is linked together, isn't it? Well, it is. Actually, the, the episode with uh, Izzy Stone was somewhat after McCarthyism was dead. Once once he got on TV and they could see that he never shaved, uh, it was really the, his appearance that did him in. <laughs> it was lucky that he, he was so unattractive looking a fellow. He might have might have lasted longer. <laughs> that that period, I suppose, was when you were just starting, wasn't it, the McCarthyism? Yes. It was really before, you know, that these... When I first joined the Washington Bureau. Yes. And um, there were... Uh, I, I, at the time, subscribed to the Nation and the New Republic, two left-wing magazines. And uh, <clears throat> I quickly found out that people in Washington didn't dare have such magazines on their coffee tables because if somebody would come in and see them they'd report it to the FBI and uh, or to McCarthy and they'd tag you as being some kind of a part of a uh, fifth column and uh, it was really a, a strange time and uh, on the we had streetcars then and on the streetcar I asked somebody once uh, uh, somebody who worked for the government and made some remark uh, about McCarthy and this person said don't talk about it here uh, they, it was it was it was like living in a dictatorship and it didn't last but for a while he really had uh, and Washington and the media intimidated I imagine if that had happened ten years later, you would have been a real threat. You would have been perceived, you know, with your analysis of um, Vietnam and Laos. Yeah. Um, so perhaps it was as well you were a young reporter then, just yeah, starting. Well, I suppose so. Mm. One of the uh, early experiences I had in Vietnam, one of my many trips there, <clears throat> was um, I decided to do a story about a project they had called uh, Strategic Hamlets. And um, the... Um, <clears throat> the uh, U.S. government officials were promoting it as a, uh, a way of separating the, the uh, Viet Cong people and sympathizers from the uh, loyalist, uh, what they figured was a loyalist majority among the Vietnamese people. And uh, what they did was uh, establish new model hamlets surrounded by a, uh, a a fence and a moat and poison sticks stuck sticking up in the moat to prevent any kind of uh, attack by the, the guerrillas 
<clears throat> and uh, uh, they would screen the people who were going to live inside there, and they gave them all identity cards, and they had a, a uh, uh, inspection post at the entrance, and they'd check everybody out and in so they knew who was there and who, where everybody was at the moment. And uh, anybody who wasn't in would be living outside in uh, danger of uh, uh, sweeps by American and South Vietnamese forces, assuming that anybody who wasn't in one of these approved uh, uh, hamlets was an enemy. And uh, <clears throat> the, uh, I was skeptical of it, but I asked the... Uh, the military to uh, uh, take me out and show me what one, how one worked. And um, so they sh described it all in positive terms. And then we took a tour around the outside. <clears throat> and um, for me, the high point of the inspection was a, uh, a strange thing, the back end of the strategic hamlet, which was one of their models that was supposed to be so great. And I saw a, a, a little uh, building that was right up against the protective fence. And there was a break in the moat so that they could, anybody outside could get access to the building uh, without going in through the main entrance or breaking down the fence. And I said, what's that? He said, well, that's where we keep our, they keep their rice storage. And it's put there so that if the Viet Cong would want to come and grab some of the rice, we're trying to starve them out. If they should come and try to attack and get some of the rice, instead of wrecking the village, the, the hamlet, or breaking down the fence or storming in, they could just go and get it. And it was such a crazy idea. It defeated the whole purpose of the thing. So I did a story about that. I, and uh, that uh, uh, incident and other things I noticed uh, quickly showed me that um, the, the war policy of the United States was uh, fraudulent and doomed to failure. And it wasn't long, I went in, went there with an open mind thinking that uh, maybe Nodin Zim, who was the, the uh, prime minister that the United States kind of put in place, uh, uh, that he was, he might be able to carry it off as a a non-communist uh, uh, entity that would balance the, uh, the communist-controlled North Vietnam. And they were, as you know, they were split in 19, uh, by, by a, uh, an international agreement in 1954. And, um, but the United States reneged on the plans for a, a an election to, to determine the future of the whole country uh, because, as he explained, we, we were afraid the communists would win. And uh, <clears throat> so they thought they could prop up Noting Jim and make a success of it. And I went there uh, having read again and again about the miracle of Noting Jim and what a wonderful leader he was and all that. Well, he was a... <clears throat> He, he really persecuted the Buddhist movement and it led to all kinds of uh, uh, insurrections and uh, so it was nothing but trouble and he finally was overthrown and uh, then there was a succession of uh, more or less unsatisfactory regimes uh, all the way through until finally the Saigon was taken, the whole country was lost. And um, <clears throat> the, there was a lot of fighting going on. 
And I felt it was part of my job to s see what the fighting was like. So I went off on some uh, uh, some exhibitions, uh, not exhibitions, but s some operations. Uh, and I'd uh, uh, go by helicopter, and we would fly in with a group of American soldiers and some South Vietnamese soldiers, and they would uh, uh, land, and there'd be a firefight, and then they'd climb on the plane, get back, and uh, they, the, the, it, it was apparent that the whole country was, uh, except for a few cities and towns, the whole country was uh, essentially in the control of the Viet Cong. And uh, so in making these uh, helicopter flights, they would fly very close to the ground so that the people, anybody who wanted to shoot them down wouldn't know they were coming until they were right on them. And then when we'd come to a line of trees, we'd go up and over it. It was, it was hazardous flying. You see, you could hit something and, and crash. <clears throat> well, that was... Uh, I did some of that, and uh, all of the reporters did. And some of them were a lot braver than I was, and were way out in combat a lot more. I never, uh, I rarely, if ever, wore even a uniform or a helmet. But uh, a lot of them really, a lot of reporters dressed up like military people, and some of them carried weapons, and I never did that. I, but. Um, was, was that a sort of a calculated decision not to dress like a soldier and carry weapons? Did you feel it wasn't right to do that? Yes. I, I felt that um, that my role was uh, as a disinterested observer. And uh, I didn't want to be part of uh, one side or the other in a, in a, a war. And uh, I remember that came up once. I got an award uh, after the war was over. I got an award for uh, some of the stuff I'd done in the Far East. And at the ceremony, um, a guy from the um, Christian Science Monitor uh, got the same award at the same time. And the principal speaker was um, Dean Rusk. And um, I'd written a lot of critical stories about Dean Rusk and felt that he was uh, seriously misled about the whole war and was... Uh, and I... They told me that I could um, respond in a, just two or three minute remarks. And I told Helen, I said, well, I'll just thank him. And she said, no, Rich, you've got to make a statement. This is an opportunity. So <clears throat> I recalled an incident in... Uh, uh, in Dean Rusk's office. He used to meet on Friday afternoon with a group of us uh, reporters who covered the State Department. And uh, he'd serve scotch and soda. And we'd uh, talk about what was going on that week. And um, one reporter, I asked him what he considered a kind of a hostile question. He says, well, it depends on which side you're on. He said, I'm on America's side. And I, I, I recall, recall that incident. And I said, well, he was right. He had a, that was his role. He was on America's side. I said, but a reporter isn't on either side. A reporter's there to tell the truth as nearly as he can find it. And uh, sometimes those 
different roles uh, clash a little, but uh, that's the way it is. And I thought it was a a sensible uh, statement that would give people an idea of how a reporter sees his role in a conflict. Well, when then after the other guy had gotten his uh, award, and he made some remarks too. Uh, then Bush, I mean, then uh, Rusk got up to speak, and uh, the other reporter he he said, "Well, I I'm, I want to congratulate uh, this other reporter. He's my friend for a long time now, Dudman. I cannot say he's my friend after those remarks." It was really a very tense moment, and um, I didn't really know how to take it. And then the Charlie Bartlett, the reporter who the correspondent who uh, had arranged the whole thing, he, he came to me after the lunch and he said, "Why did you tell that story? You know, Rusk hates to hear that." <laughs> and uh, One of those things. <laughs> well, I was that was a digression. Were, were there many um, correspondents like you at the time, you know, who stood out against official policy and the official line? Yes, there were. Uh, David Halberstam and Neil Sheehan, and I forget his name, a guy from Newsweek. And the three of them were uh, uh, honored quite a lot for their independent stand. I, I wasn't particularly well known at the time. And uh, actually, the big Eastern news organizations were the ones that would get attention. And uh, uh, I wouldn't say we got a lot of uh, a lot of attention for our work. I. But once in a while, we'd make us. Oh, some of the <clears throat> series of articles that I did about Vietnam, and early on, I was telling how the, the war was going badly and that we were probably going to lose. I, I remember one series I did in about 1965. I. Uh, David Lippmann, uh, the famous columnist at the time, made a uh, used some of my stuff in a column, saying that it was time to quit and get out. And uh, the same week, Joe Alsop, in his column, he used. The same material, quoting me, as saying this means that we've got to go in harder and, and maybe even use atomic weapons and destroy North Vietnam. <laughs> so we got some attention. Uh, <clears throat> Are there any sort of notable um, battles or events in Vietnam that you recall? I mean, for instance, early on, were you there at any of the Buddhist self-immolations? In the, I, I didn't see any of those, but I, I, but, but I covered the uh, Buddhist uprisings, and I talked to, I, I talked to the leader of the, uh, of the uh, Buddhist uh, dissidents, a man named. Tat Tri Quang. Tat means uh, priest, I guess. And um, they, uh, I remember in, uh, I was in Hue when uh, they had one of their demonstrations against the government, and they, um, They moved their household altars out into the street, 
and blocked the way of the tank, American tanks that were trying to go down Main Street to get up to where the fighting was going on. And uh, the, the uh, tank commanders would uh, kind of squeeze past so they didn't tip over the alder. Cause, and I said to one of them, I said, this is a pretty tough assignment you got, isn't it? He says, we have the deepest respect for other people's religion. <laughs> and they, we, we knew it was all kind of a game. <clears throat> I remember that day I told Johnny Apple of the New York Times, I, I said, you know what's happened? He said, the whole situation is altered. <laughs> what a pun. <laughs> so uh, there, uh, there was a lot of fun in it, too. And, and, uh, but uh, no, I didn't see any of them burn themselves up. But then I, I interviewed Madame New, and she, she gave me her line about how we need more barbecues. <laughs> she was a tough one. It was a strange war. And uh, my own uh, assignments there were uh, intermittent. I'd be there for a month or two, and then I'd come home. And I, I missed the um, Tet Offensive. Um, and I was just so glad I did. I, I really don't like gunfire. I th that would have been a awfully hazardous thing. But then when uh, there came a time in um, 1970 when um, uh, it looked as if the uh, enemy troops were advancing quite a lot. And it was after the 1968 Tet Offensive when uh, the uh, Viet Cong and North Vietnamese forces attacked simultaneously all over the country. Uh, it looked as if that was going to be a, a, it opened a lot of people's eyes and changed public opinion a lot. And uh, the famous grandfatherly like, uh, uh, grandfather like uh, uh, news commentator Wa uh, uh, Walter Cronkite he went over there and he said, what's going on here? And I, he said, it, it, it looks like instead of gradually winning, we're losing. And I, I remember Lyndon Johnson at the time said that when we've lost Walter Cronkite, we pretty well lost the whole thing. He knew that was public opinion was drastically changing. And, I, but then, the war went on, and uh, uh, Nixon was in charge, and he had promised to. Uh, earlier, I said David Lippmann, I meant Walter Lippmann. I anyway, they, the uh, the guy whose column I used uh, it was Walter Lippmann, of course. Uh, <coughs> uh, the war went on, and there came a time when the when the, uh, uh, the our, my editor decided I better get over there again and make another of my periodic reports on how things were going. So I um, I happened to land at uh, Saigon Airport I, at the very time when. Nixon announced that uh, I, the U.S. and South Vietnamese troops were making what he called an incursion into Cambodia. And uh, this was, um, I heard it on a shortwave radio that's, uh, while I was waiting in line at the immigration stand to get passed into the country. And um, so I knew this was, a big thing. And I th threw my gear into a hotel room and, and uh, got on a helicopter and 
uh, went into Cambodia. And the effort of this so-called incursion was to uh, uh, breach the uh, neutrality of Cambodia and to try to find uh, a, a Vietnamese communist headquarters and uh, ammunition dump and a uh, whole structure in there. They thought there was a kind of a, a Vietnamese communist Pentagon operating in uh, Cambodia. Well, the way they went after it was to uh, send in, uh, they, they drop a big bomb that would, uh, would uh, flatten the whole area, knock all the trees down. Then they would land uh, uh, some troops and some big guns, and uh, so they could uh, fire long distances, and they'd make a, uh, I forgot what they called it, a firing post or something like that, um, a, a temporary strong point there. And I uh, landed at one of those, and they, they were, the guy, I remember there was a serviceman on the, uh, radio getting reports from people who'd fanned out looking for uh, this shadowy supposed uh, military headquarters and they never could find it. They found a, a few cases of rifles and some things like that but nothing substantial at all and <clears throat> it probably didn't exist but um, uh, and this was a uh, period when uh, young activists on the American campuses rioted, and at Kent State University, uh, they uh, apparently a group of students must have frightened some of the National Guard that were on duty there, and they fired on them and killed four of them, and it was a big incident. Um, The, uh, I went for several days I went out on these forays to try to get a story and it was pretty monotonous actually and it, it, I was dissatisfied with uh, being able to write anything that I carried the story forward so uh, one night after two or three days of this I had dinner with uh, a guy named um, Michael Morrow, who uh, worked for a little uh, news service called Dispatch News Service. And uh, he and I uh, were complaining that we had it was nothing worth writing. And we got the idea of driving to Cambodia, to Phnom Penh, the capital of Cambodia. Uh, to see what the invading South Vietnamese were doing to the Cambodian people because they were traditional enemies and we figured there was probably some looting going on and um, so he said he knew where we he spoke Vietnamese and that uh, seemed to me if we got into trouble it would be a big help and uh, he'd be able to uh, uh, be a, like an interpreter for me and he was a good guy too and uh, then uh, it turned out that uh, a woman correspondent for the uh, Christian Science Monitor named Elizabeth Pond had told him once if he ever was going out on anything interesting she'd like to tag along. Acquisition number 22579 Rule 7. Richard Dudman, Reel 7. Well, we took off early one morning in this borrowed Jeep from us, some kind of a non, non-profit organization. Of, uh, I think there was some kind of an agricultural group. And um, Mike had borrowed it. And um, <clears throat> 
we uh, we crossed the border into Cambodia, and there was no uh, border guards or officials at all. Everything was abandoned. Uh, we did find some kind of an official standing around it. Uh, we said, is it safe to go on ahead? We'd been told by the Associated Press that the road was clear all the way to, to Phnom Penh. And he said, yes, it's, um, it's a, uh, you can go, but it's, he used a French word, inutile, meaning not useful. And I, I didn't know what he meant by that, but um, anyway, we continued on. And um, actually, we were thinking more about lunch than anything else because it was we got an early start and we were getting hungry and it was long toward the middle of the day, and uh, we were looking for a place where there might be a roadside stand where we could get some food. But it was kind of deserted, and actually, Beth, the, the woman along with us, was the first one who noticed how deserted the countryside was, and doors were swinging open on the little still shacks on stilts where people lived. Uh, there were a few uh, chickens and things, but mostly it was just completely deserted, and we didn't see any people. And um, she said, I think we're, we may be getting into a dangerous area. It looks like there's been fighting right here, or it's some kind of trouble. And um, about that time, actually I think we may have taken a wrong turn and gotten off the main road, but uh, <clears throat> the route we were on came to a, uh, a place where a, br a little bridge had been blown up and a tree had been felled across the road. And uh, it looked like a typical uh, ambush site. And Mike was driving and he started turning the jeep around, and a, three little guys uh, dressed in, I don't know what, just ordinary clothes, carrying AK-47 assault rifles, stepped out from behind trees and motioned that we should stop the car and get out. And we did with our hands up. And I... Uh, they, they uh, took our typewriters and cameras away, and uh, they uh, patted us down to be sure we didn't have any weapons. And then they told told us to turn around, and Mike told them in Vietnamese, I'm afraid to, I'm afraid you're going to shoot me. And I said, no, just turn around and start walking. And then they said, D, 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 that means go faster. And so we were walking off the road with our hands over our head. Well, I was a lot older than these other uh, two reporters. Uh, I was 52 at the time. And I, I think Beth was 35 and, uh, and uh, Mike was maybe 29 or something like that. And I felt that as this senior person there, it was my duty to try to keep their spirits up because I knew we were in big trouble. So I kind of half whispered to him. I said, you know, if we get out of here alive, we're going to have one hell of a good story. <laughs> and I meant that. I, I was scared, but I also thought, what an opportunity to see the other side. We've heard so much about these guys. Now we'll see what they're like. And I had thought that they probably lived in in constant misery, uh, maybe hiding in, in rice paddies, breathing through a little tube, and uh, getting bombed all the time, and uh, uh, hungry and cold and uh, everything. Well, we lived with them for several weeks. And uh, the first day, uh, they did, really didn't know what to make of us. And uh, they took us to a, a uh, kind of a 
advance military post run by Khmer Rouge, the Cam Cambodian communists. <clears throat> and they questioned us a little in some fractured French, and uh, Beth spoke French, and so we had some kind of communication, and they asked who we were, and we told them we were independent journalists, and that we were strictly civilian, we were not, weren't part of any military organization. And um, I think they, I think they had me kick off my pants and throw them over so they could go through my pockets. But what they didn't notice was that I had a, a, a money belt on that had 200 bucks folded up inside. And I also had a little pocket knife. I think it's this one I still carry. That, um, but they didn't take that away from me, like that. And uh, so <clears throat> they uh, I put my clothes back on. They asked if we could ride a bicycle, and we said yes. So they had some bicycles, and we rode off farther into the jungle. And then uh, we came to a place where they. Uh, uh, I think it must have been Viet, Viet Cong. They were Viet, I think they were Vietnamese then at that point. And uh, it was a, some kind of a military post. And they uh, blindfolded us and put us in an open truck. And uh, in the back of the truck and started driving. And we drove quite a ways. And <clears throat> we got deeper into their territory. And... <clears throat> and um, Actually, I don't think I was blindfolded yet because I remember seeing the when we go through a little hamlet, there'd be uh, flowers and flags and stuff as, as if it was liberated territory. And uh, <clears throat> we'd stop briefly and I remember a crowd would come around and they would uh, hold up three fingers, meaning we got three Americans. And I, I remember one guy climbed up on the truck and leered in on us and made a motion as if he'd like to castrate us. And uh, yes, what were your expectations, Richard, at this t um, stage? Um, you know, having gone in, being arrested, did you had other journalists been lost in this area? There have been several that have been were missing already, and. Uh, <clears throat> I knew we were in big trouble. Uh, I, I knew that uh, uh, any resistance or attempt to escape would be to be the end for us. So <clears throat> I figured all we could do was just uh, wait and see what happened. <coughs> And they, I remember there were four or five guys with different kinds of guns at the back end of the truck guarding us all this during this ride. And one of them pointed a gun right at my head, uh, no, at my stomach. And uh, I've always been taught that you don't point a gun at anybody. So I motioned him, stop it. And he pointed at my head instead. I realized I didn't really have much bargaining power. Well, <clears throat> uh, they finally reached what evidently was their destination and they, uh, it was a, some kind of a post that they had. And um, <clears throat> turned out to be a schoolhouse actually. And that's when they blindfolded us and had us walk down a little plank uh, from the back of the truck onto the ground. And they uh, took uh, Beth away someplace. We didn't know where. And Mike and I, they tied uh, they tied one of our wrists, or each of us, to the back end of a motorbike. 
and we could hear what was going on, so we knew what was happening. And then they said to the driver of the motorbike, DDD means go fast. So he started pulling us along. We held hands and ran to keep up and keep from falling and dragging. And I don't know how long this went on. It was over rough ground. And um, <clears throat> he sh shouted at him, and Mike did in, in uh, uh, Vietnamese, that uh, this is a this is an older man. You ought to go slow. And, uh, and Mike was a long distance runner, so he he, he was all right. <clears throat> but I was in good shape, and uh, so we managed to keep our feet. And presently, it could have been a, just a very few minutes. I don't know how long. It seemed like a long time at the time. They um, stopped, and I. Uh, tied our hands behind our back and led us into a building and I could feel the by then it was late afternoon and I could f f feel us going out of the sunshine into a, over a threshold into a building and it turned out to be the schoolhouse <coughs> and um, they brought us before a guy I think he was at a, some kind of a desk or something and uh, he uh, he asked who we were. We told him we were reporters, and we didn't know where Beth was. And um, then uh, I heard a smash, and they hit uh, Mike over the head with something. And uh, I knew my turn was next, and they clubbed me. And uh, I, I think Mike was unconscious for a while. And I wasn't unconscious, but I didn't, I went down, and I didn't want him to hit me again. And I just waited. And uh, then there was nothing for quite a long time. And we weren't, neither one of us was seriously hurt, but we were tied up real tight. And we, it was excruciating to sit there for the long, and uh, and then the whole thing changed. Uh, a, uh, a different voice uh, appeared, and it uh, and he, he said, uh, "We found out later it was a, a North Vietnamese military contingent." And this young guy said, uh, are you in great discomfort in Vietnamese? And Mike said, yes, we're, uh, we're tied so tightly that, that circulation is cut off in our arms. <clears throat> so he said, well, that's not right. And he said, do you need water? And he, Mike said, yes, we're awful dry. So he this. I, each drink of water, and um, <clears throat> then uh, untied us and helped us to our feet. Now, a, a bit earlier, we had thought we heard a woman shrieking, and it worried us. We didn't know what might have happened to Beth, but um, uh, they took us into a, a room and took our blindfolds off, and there was Beth, and she was in good shape. And uh, they brought us a bucket of water, and we uh, washed up. We were pretty dusty and dirty. We washed up, and then they brought in a great big steaming uh, bowl of rice and uh, some tea. And we had our first food since early morning. And... Um, <clears throat> Then they took us before a, a, a man who seemed to be, he was in uniform but no insignia, and he obviously was the guy in charge. And he seemed to be a senior officer, uh, North Vietnamese. And, uh, or we took it to be a North Vietnamese. And 
we sat side by side on a little bench in front of him. And as he got ready to interrogate us, uh, as I often do, I put one leg up over my other knee. Uh, and uh, one of the guards, armed guards that were standing there, shoved it off and as if that was, I think in that country, in some or some places, if you show the sole of your foot to somebody, it's a kind of an insult. Well, I quickly found out that I was in no position to instruct them. Um, <clears throat> so he asked um, what we were doing there, and we told him, Mike, Mike did in, uh, in Vietnamese, and explained it to me afterwards how he described how we happened to be there. And uh, he said, well, we're, we're going to have to investigate your case. And uh, uh, if we uh, uh, find you're telling the truth, you'll be released and able to return to your families. Uh, if we find you're lying, you'll be dealt with according to the laws of the country. And in the meantime, he says, you'll be in great danger. And uh, this officer, the guy who had whispered in our ear and given us the water, was there, a young fellow in a, a well-pressed khaki uniform and a kind of a, uh, I don't know what you call him, one of those pith helmets. And um, a real... Uh, spit and polish kind of a military officer it looked like they said well he's going to be in charge of you and you better do what he says and we'll hope you'll survive and he said now get some sleep and then he said Did you, uh, he'll take you in a, in a vehicle and you'll be moving around to try to stay out of the way of American planes and tanks and um, so we had a little nap, and then they woke us up, and we um, we piled into a, a uh, Land Rover, and uh, there were uh, three of us and five of them, and they were. Uh, included this young officer who was sort of the military head and then a, an older guy who turned out to be the political uh, commissar or whatever it was and then uh, three other guys who were uh, one of them was a Cambodian and they all had guns of various kinds and um we started driving through the jungle and kind of bumpy roads, and we didn't know where they were going, and evidently they didn't know exactly where they were going either, because once in a while, it was really an eerie kind of a drive, we, we'd see a little flickering light at the side of the, this road, and we'd stop, and uh, several of them would get out, and have a consultation with them, and they'd point this way and that way. And they, <clears throat> I guess they were getting information about where the uh, American South Vietnamese offensive had gotten and what was the best way to turn to stay out of the way. Um, and um, at one of those stops, the guy sitting beside me <clears throat> in the back of this uh, Land Rover he uh, handed me his gun to hold while he was out talking to him. And I thought, you know, what is this? Guys really must think we don't know anything. <laughs> but we we weren't very skilled in handling weapons or military affairs. And, uh, and we certainly, none of us wanted to try to make a break because we'd be uh, off there in the jungle someplace. And, and uh, well, what had you told them, Richard? You know, did you decide to tell the truth of what you were doing, or did you 
invent um, a story to try and make your situation better? I told him the absolute truth. I, when we were being marched away with our hands up like this, I, uh, Mike uh, told me to th throw my passport off in the brush and pretend I wasn't an American. And I think he and Beth both told him they were Canadians. And in a sense, uh, I think Michael had a dual citizenship. His father, I think, had lived in Canada or was born in Canada or something. And, and um, <clears throat> so it wasn't exactly a lie. And I, uh, I think sh she just said she was an international journalist. Well, I didn't know what I, that meant, but they, she kept using that term. And um, I, I had my passport with me. They took it away, I guess, but uh, they had it. And uh, I told him I was an American citizen. And uh, uh, Mike uh, had the idea that they might be trying to trap us into some kind of a, a, uh, a lie and uh, use that as a basis for a big show trial the way sometimes uh, communist outfits have done. <coughs> and... Uh, uh, knowing that it was a possibility, I thought we'd better watch our step and, and be very straightforward. And uh, I, I always thought we'd get out of it all right. I thought things. I, I, I had. I, I liked the way that guy handled us, and uh, the senior officer, and. Uh, I thought we'd probably make it all right, but it turned into be a, a pretty monotonous uh, four or five weeks in which we traveled by uh, night, sometimes in this, for, for as long as we had this uh, Land Rover with us, that was all right, but then sometimes we'd be on bicycles, and other times we'd just march. And uh, <clears throat> they, the, the, the five, five escorts we had all had uh, packs uh, with uh, some food and weapons and things like that. And they carried, the, the food we had with us was mainly rice. And uh, it was in long sausage shaped uh, uh, bags. And I carried one of them about 10 pounds or so over my shoulder for, for a while. And uh, we, um, every night we, at noon and at night, we always had a, a meal, but it was mostly rice. And sometimes with some, uh, I don't know where they got it, but <coughs> chunks of uh, animal fat on top, or sometimes some garnishing of uh, vegetables of some kind that looked like spinach, or once in a great while some kind of rotted fish. Uh, it was, um, we were hungry, but there wasn't a lot we could, you can't, I found I could eat only a certain amount of rice, and then it just was hard to push down. We knew we had to keep eating. And then we also knew that aside from the marching and stuff that we ought to do some exercising. So in, during the day when we'd stop in a, <clears throat> usually in a peasant's house, we'd leave our shoes down at the bottom of the ladder and climb up into this house on stilts. And, and um, there was a mat on top of the bamboo flooring and we'd lie down, Beth in the middle, and Mike and I on either side, and sleep. But then before we go to sleep, we'd sometimes do some exercises, calisthenics and things. And uh, uh, I tried to uh, get Mike to teach me some Vietnamese. I thought I could, I knew we were going to be there for a while. And I thought it was an opportunity to learn the language, but um, there was a kind of a malaise set in, and I, I couldn't really concentrate on 
anything like that. It, it was uh, 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 being a prisoner is a hard, hard thing to deal with. <coughs> yes, sir. Was there any? Did there come a stage when you began to feel relatively safe? that perhaps you weren't going to be killed or have a show trial or anything. Do you remember something? Well, feeling? yes. I, I think what happened was that um, one time <clears throat> after a few days, instead of bringing us some rice and food and eating separately, they suggest we all eat together. So we did. And then, with this laborious difficulty with uh, Mike's limited Vietnamese, we had a kind of a conversation. And uh, <clears throat> the political commissar uh, every night would uh, listen to the uh, radio and then tell us what was going on in the war. And if there'd be a big demonstration, or something like that, he'd tell us about it. And um, <clears throat> one time there was a strong anti-war demonstration going on in the United States. They they had a report on it. And he said, and this isn't Radio Hanoi. This is the BBC. <laughs> so, they, uh, <clears throat> but it was, it was, our communication was so limited that it was really, we didn't get a very full picture of what was going on. We got something. Position number 22579, real 8. Richard Dudman, real eight. Uh, these people, I call them our escorts rather than our guards, I were expressed uh, concern about our welfare. They were afraid we weren't getting enough to eat. And uh, <clears throat> I remember at one point they uh, produced some... Uh, water buffalo steaks and it was so good to get some some good solid protein and uh, they had to be cautious about it because the Cambodians don't believe in slaughtering water buffalo so they we had to do it secretively from any villagers who were around and um, then one day they uh, produced a, uh, a fresh pineapple and it was absolutely unlike the pineapple we get that's imported, which are picked green. This was so ripe and juicy, and it was so delicious. And uh, so we we were surviving, but we were really. Um, I found out later I was losing a pound a month, a pound a week, a pound a day, and I. Uh, I was really skin and bones, as you saw in one of the pictures when I got out of there. I, so uh, it was tough. Uh, but um, we began to feel kind of safe. And yet, uh, oh, and another thing they did, they, uh, they sang us one of their songs. And then they asked us to sing a song. And we sang, Old MacDonald Had a Farm. And the refrain goes, uh, uh, and a, a, uh, a moo moo here and a moo moo there, here a moo there a moo everywhere a moo moo. On this farm there was a cow, and so on. And um, they loved it. And a couple of days later they said, "Sing us that song about the animals again." And uh, so we really were kind of convivial. And then uh, on Ho Chi Minh's birthday. Uh, they were all excited, and uh, uh, Mike asked them what was going on, what, why are you so excited? And they said, this is Ho Chi Minh's birthday, and to celebrate, we're going to have roast dog. 
we haven't had dog for a long time. And I'd seen a little, looked like a fox terrier running around. And then I heard a squealing sound. And I figured they'd put him to death. And I, they served up this dog steaks. And I, I don't like dogs, so they made it easier. Uh, it was unusual, and I, I, uh, but I knew I needed the food, and it was really kind of good. Uh, then the next day they had leftovers, and they had some dog soup, and they, among other things, they cooked the head, and they, for kind of a joke on me, when I wasn't looking, they put the head on my plate looking at me, and I turned around, and there it was. <laughs> So there was a little fun and games involved in this whole thing, too. At the same time, there was a kind of an ominous streak. Uh, a guy f with a camera came to see us one day from uh, Hanoi. And he was uh, evidently a counterintelligence agent. And he asked us a lot of questions, took pictures. And uh, then, uh, I guess it was on his instructions, they... Uh, told us, they gave us some pieces of paper out of, uh, looked like out of a school workbook, and, and asked us to write a biographical sketch answering certain specific questions, like how many times have you ever been to Moscow? How many times have you been to Beijing? Uh, what uh, stories have you covered uh, in this area, uh, have you been to Vietnam before? When? And all kinds of things like that. And that's when Mike said, we better be very accurate because if we make a mistake, they could use that against us as showing that we're f trying to deceive them. <clears throat> and uh, I remember another thing happened. Uh, Beth was scribbled hers out in a great rush, and when she didn't uh, found she'd made a mistake, she'd just cross it out and then write some more. And it, it was a really a messy-looking product she was putting out. And I th thought that neatness and uh, clarity were a, a big part of it. And that uh, so I spoke to her about this. And she says, that's not important. She says, in the news business, you, you can be careless, you can make mistakes, you can do all kinds of things. That's why they have a copy desk. They'll straighten things out. And she said, I'm not taking any responsibility for what my stuff looks like. Well, I thought that was silly. And I... Uh, but... I think she expressed a common view among younger reporters. I, and I'm, by that time, I was feeling like an, a serious old timer at the age of 52. Well, <clears throat> I, we turned in this stuff. In the course of it, we, uh, we all had ballpoint pens along. And they ran short of ink. And we asked these guys, do you have any other pens? We don't, can't write anymore. And uh, in the night, they sent some guy on a motorbike into a nearby town. And they, they bought new supplies. And while they were at it, they got us some fresh toothpaste and uh, things like that. Uh, it was a, uh, uh, an evidence of how uh, much in control they were, even of small towns in the area, uh, which were ostensibly in American and South Vietnamese control, uh, I guess, or, or at least uh, uh, non-communist control during the day. But at night, it was their, their territory. And... Um, we, um, I don't know about the other two, I guess they did the same thing. We, were, we had so little paper that we had to conserve it. And I, while I was doing this 
writing that he'd asked us to do, I was making notes myself of incidents and observations that I'd made. And I, and I folded them up in, uh, in little, little uh, folded shapes so they'd fit into my money belt. And I saved them. And they were a big help later when I was reconstructing the whole experience for a series of articles in the Post-Dispatch. <clears throat> um, so that was, a, it was kind of a mixed picture of friendliness and a, a somewhat ominous uh, uh, aspect of what was going to become of us. I one time, they they uh, said that they didn't think we were getting enough exercise. So we, they one day, they uh, carefully took us out uh, outside on a kind of a picnic, and um, I, I got the idea. Oh, I know they they spread out a a woven straw mat that we could sit on and we ate our lunch out there and then on this, this, this mat was it was made out of broad uh, I guess it was palm leaves and um, it, it made a series of squares and they showed us a kind of a, a, a form of tit-tat-toe that they played and uh, we played that for a while and then I got the idea that we might try chess. So I got out my knife and uh, got a piece of a tree and started cutting uh, some chess figures. And then they took turns doing it. They saw what I was doing. It turned out their game of chess is somewhat different from ours. They had uh, elephants and artillery pieces. And it was on a little bigger board. It was 15 by 15 instead of 8 by 8. And um, so we played by their rules, and uh, I, Mike and I would confer on how our moves would be, and then they would confer on theirs. And uh, uh, we were thinking, we, we were ahead. They were very impulsive in the way they played, and we'd think it through on what was likely to come. And uh, so we were beating them. And we thought, gee, we, we don't want to beat these guys. I don't make them sore. But we did. And so immediately we said, well, maybe you'd like to play again. And they said, no, uh, playing a game is like war with us. We play, play, fight, fight, and then sleep, sleep. So let's tell, I'll take a nap. <laughs> uh, so on balance, it was a hopeful time that we would come through it all right. Uh, but we were constantly in danger of being bombed by American planes. And there were several times when, uh, in the middle of the, in the daytime, when we were staying out of sight in the, the peasant hut, they'd say, Chombi D, that means time to go. And they'd uh, wake us up. And we, uh, I'd put on my shoes, I'd climb down the ladder, try to get on my shoes, and then we'd run off. Uh, and at one time, uh, they separated us. And one of the guys led me in one direction, and the other two were going off in different directions. And we, uh, he, he, this guy, uh, came to a kind of a brush heap and pointed to a little, almost like a tunnel that went in underneath. And uh, he motioned I should go go in there, keep out of sight of the planes. And um, so I did, and he came in after me. And uh, we could hear some heavy explosions. And he says, Bay uh, Nam Hai, that means a B-52. And they were dropping these tremendous bombs. If they come near you, they could shatter your eardrums. And of course, if they came too close, they'd kill you. And uh, so he motioned that I should 
I put my face down in the dirt, and uh, I did. And then I stole a look at him, and he was undoing his pistol. And I must have looked terrified. I thought he was going to kill me. And he uh, saw my fright and uh, put his gun back. And then holding his hand like this, he pointed at me and shook his head. And then he pointed up at the planes it's like this, meaning that this was for them, not for you. And I then, I guess to sustain us both in what was a time of great danger, he opened his pack and took out a little folded up scrap of brown paper and it had some lumps of unrefined brown sugar. And he, he gave me a piece and he ate some himself. And I, once again, I found out how I, how much an intake of sugar can do to raise your spirits and and give you some fresh energy. And uh, I, there were a lot of occasions when I figured they saved their lives. And they were saving their own lives, too. And... Um, were these sort of... Um your escorts, you know, as you as you call them, um, Richard, were, were they sort of anything approximating to the image you had had of people on that side? Were you surprised, you know, at the... Well, mainly it was their style of life that surprised me. I, <clears throat> I thought they were uh, militarily, although skillful, I thought they were probably were, uh, were having a terrible time. I, and yet, I, in talking to them, I got their stories of how they had using uh, these AK-47s and sometimes captured uh, M-16 American rifles had shot down some helicopters. And I knew, I knew fr from uh, news accounts of the war that a lot of American helicopters were being downed and a lot of American pilots were being captured. So I, I, I wasn't surprised that uh, I, to, well, I was surprised to find out that they weren't as bad off as I thought. And I thought that physically uh, their life was, must be miserable. And I, I thought that running around in the jungle as, uh, as uh, the quarry of searching airplanes, that they were uh, in constant danger and constant discomfort. Well, I found they were taking baths all the time. And uh, once when it rained heavily, they went out and speared frogs. And we had frog's legs uh, as a relief from this constant rice diet. And... Um, and they could, as I told you, they could go into town and get supplies. They were, they were survivors. And they explained to us, they showed us wounds they had from attacks. And they had, a lot of them had shrapnel wounds that were healed up on their chests and legs. And, uh, and again and again they said, we individually, we may not live very long, but our movement, will go on. And the secret is that when we're under attack, we disperse. So they can't get us all. They can get a few. And that's, that's the way they lived. I, so I've, I kept constantly marveling at what an opportunity this was to find out the other side of this war. Um, now, I, oh, another thing they, about health. I, Beth, um, managed just statistically to have two periods in a in a, a time span of a little more than five weeks, 
And I, in the, the first one, I, she asked if they had any rags and said she was bleeding. And she told Mike to tell them in Vietnamese. And they were worried and they thought there was something the matter with her. And they kept asking, what is the problem? And, blah, 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 blah. and uh, he tried to explain it. And finally they, they got it. And they said, oh, it's what happens in that with our women every month. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> so she survived it. Uh, she uh, was a dedicated Christian scientist. And um, I don't know if you know much about Christian science, but I've known others who uh, are very calm on the surface. But they're, when they're in discomfort or anxiety or pain, they suppress it. And they're under tremendous tension. There have been, Noel Coward did a play about this called... Uh, uh, I've forgotten. I want to say Black Walnut, but it was some name like that. I, it was one of his plays about a Christian scientist who suddenly flies apart. Well, I was waiting for her to fly apart because we were under some tension once in a while. And it almost happened once when we were spending the daytime in a, uh, in a house with a tile roof uh, it was a shack, a thatched roof, but it had this tile roof. And uh, there were a lot of... Um, there were a lot of beetles in the tile. And there were mice and snakes in the thatch. And uh, when they, we were eating, we had... The, the, Oh, I know, there was a storm going on, too. And when there'd be a lightning strike nearby and we'd hear a thunderclap, it would shake the house and the beetles would drop on us. And uh, when we were sleeping, it was really miserable because we'd wake up and we'd feel one crawling down our neck and we'd have to kind of half in a sleep, pick it out, throw it aside, and go back to sleep. Well, when we were eating, we had, I think we had some kind of rice soup or something. It was in a bowl. And we, some of our rare pieces of paper we used to cover it up so they wouldn't uh, fall in the soup. And she was eating away. And between the covering of the paper and her mouth, as she brought the spoon towards her, one went into her spoon and she got it in her mouth. And she said, now I've swallowed one. I'm so miserable. <laughs> And I thought, oh my God, here we go. But um, she maintained her calm. But um, Yes, I was wondering, you know, with the three of you, um, there must have been very long periods of sort of boredom, as well as all this activity when it happened, whether there were sort of tensions between you and how you coped with that. Well, uh, I discussed that with them. And I said, we're going to be cooped up together for a long time. And what we've got to do is realize that. And we're, we're different people. And take these differences into account. And uh, above all, get along. And do some exercise. So we did regular calisthenics. And I... Uh, So it never reached uh, uh, you know three people is a bad combination anyway because two tend to gang up. That never happened and uh, uh, partly it was the boredom kind of caused a sort of ennui and uh, I think it kind of dulled any animosities that might have arisen. And um, as we knew we were going to get loose eventually, when we finally did, we were all three in competition too, so that was another source of tension. But we never uh, hated each other. Um, but uh, um, I was determined to get my story in the papers first. And each one of us had a syndicate waiting to if we, well, they didn't even know if we were alive, but 
uh, we knew that uh, each one of us would have a syndicate ready to distribute whatever we wrote. I was determined to be the first. I, and the, the, the break came after about a month when, um, it was actually five weeks, the uh, commissar, I call him, um, said, we're going to uh, have a visitor and uh, you, you men better shave and put on your shirts and be able to look a little presentable. So we got cleaned up and uh, we heard somebody arrive and coming, we heard footsteps going up the ladder to the this house on stilts we were spending the day and sure enough it was that same senior officer and he sat down and he had a big smile on his face and he said to Mike to all of us he said in Vietnamese you know why I'm here and Mike told us what he said and uh, I said Mike tell him we're not sure but we hope he's going to tell us that he's completed his investigation and finds out we're telling the truth and going to set us loose. And Mike told him that. He said, that's right. He says, now all we need to do, to do is plan where we're going to release you. And um, so we caucused a little. And uh, I came up with the idea of... Uh, this is, taking us to Hanoi because it would give us a look at the Ho Chi Minh Trail which was the supply route through Laos that came down and supplied the, the, uh, uh, all of the uh, Viet Cong and, South Vietnam, and North Vietnamese forces in South Vietnam and it was a they called it a trail actually it was a network of trails through the jungle and uh, the traffic was eventually it was by truck, but in those early days, I guess still in those early days, it was uh, mostly by bicycle, and they load bicycles up with a lot of stuff, and mostly not even ride them but push them along, and um, they supplied their whole operation that way. And I thought, what a beautiful chance it would be to see this trail go up do it backwards and get all the way to Hanoi and then they could turn us loose and we could get a flight to some neutral country like uh, Burma or something and then get a flight home. And uh, so we suggested this. I said, no, there's so much fighting between here and there. It'd be too dangerous. Couldn't do that. And then uh, I said, uh, what about... Um, I guess maybe it was Mike. We knew that there were some tunnels underneath Saigon. And we said, how about sneaking us in tunnels into the heart of Saigon and let us loose there? He said, no, that wouldn't be practical. So then they said, we're going to, they planned it all along, I guess. They said, we're going to turn you loose alongside the Route 1, the route between uh, Saigon and, uh, and Phnom Penh. And uh, he said, we're probably going to do it tomorrow. So, or maybe it was, I guess it was another day. <clears throat> and we'd been counting the days. And when I found out we were going to be released on the 40th day, I thought, how lucky can you be? There's the title for a book, 40 Days with the Enemy. And uh, I... So we were pretty excited, I guess. And right away we were beginning to think, how are we going to write this? How are we going to... Uh, and we all knew that with a lot of competition, Beth would be doing it for the Christian Science Monitor, and Mike would be doing it for his little uh, radical news service, and I'd be doing it for the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. And... Um, they, they loaded us uh, onto uh, in the afternoon of the next day 
they, they put us on to uh, motorbikes. And I remember the guy driving one of them was a great big Chinese. And we wondered if Chinese were involved here. I don't yet know who he was or what he was doing. But um, they rode off, and then we stopped suddenly, and they sent some... Let me stop for a minute. Accession number 22579, real 9. Richard Dobman, real 9. Well, we stopped short of Route 1. And uh, we must have been just a few hundred yards from it, I guess. But they sent scouts ahead to be sure it was clear. And by then it was uh, it was late. It was early evening. And uh, they found out that what always happened was that the that Route One, this major highway, had changed control as it did twice a day. It was in the control of the North Vietnamese, of the South Vietnamese and the Americans in the daytime with military patrols and all that. But at night, the Viet Cong controlled it. And they found out that it had already changed hands. It was again in Vietnam, Viet Cong control for the night. So they took us forward to the edge of the road and there was a little restaurant there that served Americans and South Vietnamese in the daytime and served Viet Cong at night. And they had them fix up some tea and little cakes, and we sat around and had a farewell dinner. And uh, uh, Michael, who was more, oh, I guess you'd say spiritual or ceremonial than I, he got the idea that we should present little farewell gifts to them. So he gave them his door key. And he said, my house is your house. Anytime you can come and see me, we'd like that. And I think I gave them my nail clippers, which they had admired and really wanted. And I said, well, every time you trim your nails, think of us. And I, I've forgotten what Beth gave them. And then I... They, um, trying to think what they gave us. They gave us little pieces of paper that we understood to be their names and addresses. And I put those in my, uh, in my uh, uh, money belt and uh, for future reference. And then they s- said that they I had valued their association with us, but they could not accept any gifts that were from outside the country. So they wouldn't take the key or the nail clippers or whatever Beth had given them. But they said, we're going to keep the chess man. I really wanted to bring the chess man home with me. But they said, we're going to keep the chess men because they were made from a product of our country. And uh, so that, and then we, I don't know, I think we must have sung some songs together too. And uh, then they took us across the road <clears throat> to a, um, a nunnery. And the nuns came out <clears throat> and spread a uh, a straw mat on the ground and lent us an alarm clock. And the the Viet Cong guys, the escorts, gave us... I had a handkerchief that I always... That was in the days when 
men always carried handkerchiefs, and I had a white handkerchief in my pocket all this time. And they tied it onto a little stick to make a truce flag so we could uh, get safe passage. And then they gave us each uh, some Viet Vietnamese money so we wouldn't get stranded. I didn't, they still didn't know I had 200 bucks in my, uh, in, in my belt. <clears throat> and, um, and they said goodbye and vanished into the distance. We went to sleep and had the clock set for dawn so we could get up. And when the first uh, South Vietnamese uh, uh, convoy came through, it was a bunch of trucks who'd been taking supplies in for this offensive that the United States had organized. They were going back towards uh, Saigon. We stood out and hitched a ride and stood up there in the back of the truck as we jounced along. And uh, when we got to the outskirts of, of uh, Saigon, there was a stop signal and we jumped out and waved them goodbye, and we, uh, with this money we had, we got a cab, and um, Michael was married to a Vietnamese woman, and they, we went to their apartment and got cleaned up, and then I went to the uh, uh, USO, the United States whatever it was, the United States Service Organization, I think it was called. And it was a, uh, a kind of like a rest establishment for service people. And um, <clears throat> you could get food and showers and telephones and things like that. And I went to the phone and uh, called Helen first. I can't remember if I called her at the office first. I think I called her first. And she says, Richard, Richard. <laughs> I said, yeah, I'm okay, and I'm going to be home soon. And I said, but don't tell anybody, because I want to be sure this is the story is first in the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. We're an afternoon paper then, and I don't want the morning papers, which were still to come out, I don't want them to get it first. <clears throat> So she thought that was a little ridiculous. She, she went out and got her hair done and <laughs> got ready for the news. And uh, I called the paper and um, dictated the first story in the series. And uh, they started sending it around the world. And uh, I... And then the, the press, world press came in and interviewed us, and uh, and then this, oh, I know, another thing, I went over to CIA headquarters, because <clears throat> Helen's brother was in the CIA, and I knew he was assigned there. And uh, I stood around waiting till he came past, and I said, hi, Justin. And he was, of course, astounded. And uh, so he said, after we greeted each other and he found out what was going on, he said, you know, these people I work with are going to want to interview you. Will you talk to them? I said, yeah, I'll talk to them. So they had me in, <clears throat> and they wanted to know exactly where we were released and exactly all of that stuff. And I said, look, these people, I know they're the enemy, but they saved our life repeatedly. And they did me the favor of letting, letting me loose along with these other two reporters. And I'm not going to pinpoint their whereabouts so you can send in the troop and bomb them. And I, I said, I did, that's just the way I like to operate. And I said, I'm telling, aside from that detail, I'm telling the whole story as fully and as truthfully as I can, and it'll be in the paper, and you'll get it shortly. And that's really about all I have to say. 
and they didn't like that much, but... Uh, Your relationship with the captors, you know, um, it seemed very moving um, in a way that you, there was obviously, I would think, mutual trust between you. Is that right? Well, I think there was mutual trust, but I think <clears throat> they also could see that as far as military affairs go, we were a bunch of klutzes. <laughs> and uh, I think they quickly sized us up that we weren't going to be a, a security threat to them. <clears throat> so it was a mixture. But um, I think they came to... We made no secret of the fact that we, we didn't uh, support the U.S. war effort. And I, I didn't feel any need to hold back on that. In fact, I thought it might be a plus. But I was quite frank in saying I personally didn't think that America had any business in Vietnam. And I, that was true. And the others were the same, were they? Mike and Beth, they felt much the same about yes, it. Yes, I think we, we really agreed pretty much on it. Mm. Were you able to find out any information about the sort of, should I call these people revolutionaries? These were the revolutionaries supporting they were against the ruler of Cambodia at that time. No, um, they were... See, the ruler of Cambodia was Prince Sihanouk. But he was in exile, was he not, at that time? Would he have been in... Was it Beijing? Um, I can't remember if he was... But they were I think he was in him. Beijing, yes. And yeah. he... Uh, <clears throat> in fact, a friend of mine went to see him, or was in communication with him anyway, and he made some kind of representation to get us freed. Because I had met him on an earlier assignment when we were going around China. And uh, uh, so they, and he told me later that uh, he, he thought his intercession was uh, a determining factor. But the the people, your escorts, you know, as you, as you like to call them, these um, people who were North Vietnamese and Cambodians. Um, what sort of, um, and were they Khmer Rouge? Would they have been, what was their, their sort of status at that time? <clears throat> they were uh, in a kind of an edgy relationship with Khmer Rouge. Uh, the, uh, the Khmer Rouge had different cultural systems and different and they were religious, Buddhist, I guess, or whatever they were. And um, uh, the uh, the Vietnamese uh, pretty much avoided contact with Khmer Rouge villagers because they didn't want to have uh, trouble. And the two uh, cultures have been... Uh, in conflict with each other for centuries. In fact, as you may know, Saigon was once a Cambodian city, and uh, the Vietnamese uh, have been, through the centuries, an, an aggressive presence, and they uh, uh, absorbed a lot of uh, greater Cambodia and uh, took took over the territory. A lot of what's now South Vietnam was uh, originally Cambodian. Or, I mean, not originally, but for a long time. So it was... Uh, I know when, um, when we'd go through <coughs> a Cambodian village or hamlet, they would always have us... <coughs> They had us dressed in sarongs, and they had us hold our sarongs over our faces so they couldn't see there were Westerners there. And um, when they would pass a, uh, uh, whatever they called a mosque or whatever, they, there's another name for them, for a, a religious uh, temple, they would take off their hats. And uh, they didn't want any trouble. 
and they were, I guess they regarded themselves as kind of favored guests in the country. And uh, they knew that uh, uh, Cambodia was supposed to be uh, neutral, and uh, they didn't want to breach that uh, appearance of neutrality. Were you getting, um, you were saying how they understood your um, view of the war, that you know you were against it. Were you also able to get from them how they perceived um, the war in Vietnam? They again and again quoted Ho Chi Minh as saying, nothing is more precious than freedom and independence. And uh, they... I guess some of them had fought the French, too. I don't remember. We got their story somewhat. And uh, this had been decades of uh, anti-colonialist war. And they regarded uh, the present fighting as being just an extension of that same struggle for freedom and independence. And they regarded... Uh, North Vietnam and South Vietnam as uh, parts of a whole country that deserved and was eventually going to get freedom and independence. And uh, what I got from the whole experience was a certainty that as a movement they were going to survive some of the fiercest bombing attacks that any culture has ever experienced and that uh, the United States eventually was going to be kicked out the way the French were and the way the French said the Americans would be. We had plenty of warnings from de Gaulle How intensive was the bombing? You know, you've explained that raid, the B-52s, when you were, when you thought you were going to be shot in your, um, you know, little cave. Um, was there much bombing? You know, did you? Was that an isolated incident, or did you experience um, more attacks during your forty days? We could hear rather distant bombing a lot. Every. Every few days, we'd hear some kind of an attack. Nothing happened to come very close to us. We did hear the grinding sound of tank treads sometimes, and we'd hurry to get out of the way. And uh, so the war was, the fighting was going on around us, but we kept clear of it. So they really did keep you safe and seemed to know when the attacks were coming, did you get the feeling that they had this intelligence? There was one time when a plane uh, must have spotted some movement or they suspected that there was some kind of a, uh, some people on the ground they wanted to hit. And... Uh, <clears throat> I don't remember if they used machine gun fire or missiles or or what it was, but they they had attacked some little distance away from us, and uh, we were hidden some way under some brush or something. And uh, afterwards, the uh, I guess it was the military had this young officer explained to us, he took out a stick and on the on the dirt, he made a little drawing showing where we were and then he said that one of their people had gone over some distance away and shown himself and distracted their fire 
and it took them away from our, where we were staying. And I, I, I take it that was truthful. So they were pretty clever in deceptive strategies. Uh, my wife, Helen, is a, a professional public relations person. That's been her whole career. And she understands how to push the right buttons. And as soon as I was missing, well, she, she was devastated. But she always had faith that I would come out of it all right. Because she figured I was, I had a kind of calmness and uh, good sense, so I wouldn't uh, uh, do anything nutty to cause them to execute me. And um, <clears throat> so she right away uh, called all of our friends in the diplomatic community and the political community who might be of some help. There were uh, the uh, uh, ambassadors of Czechoslovakia and Poland and Yugoslavia. We'd had them to dinner. We knew them. And she got them to send cablegrams and representations to Hanoi that Richard Dudman was all right and ought to be released. And uh, then several senators went to bat for us, Senator Frank Church, uh, Senator Fulbright, and Senator uh, uh, well, a number of others. They did what they could. And uh, then uh, our good friend um, uh, Warren Anna, uh, a Washington Post reporter <clears throat> had interviewed uh, Sihanouk several times and knew him well. And he's the, <coughs> <coughs> he's the one that got Sihanouk to inter intercede. And then our good friend um, Chell Oberg, who later became the ambassador, Swedish ambassador to, uh, uh, to China, he um, I'm trying to think yes uh, he, he was still in Washington and uh, Helen got a hold of him and he uh, got a hold of uh, uh, Olaf Palma Prime Minister of Sweden and Palma interceded on my behalf so there, they must have figured they really had a hot potato on their hands. And I, I, I didn't know anything about this, but I kind of figured that Helen was doing some things. But she was full of ideas. And then our daughters were in Europe, and they uh, went to the North Vietnamese embassy in Paris and uh, took along some of my past writings and things like that. And uh, told them to let their let their father go. <clears throat> and um, all in all, it was quite a campaign. And I don't yet know what exactly made the difference, but I think it was a kind of a combination of all those things. <coughs> Before you were released, did they ask anything of you in terms of um, a press conference or statements from you about your treatment? Did the, um, your captors? No, they didn't. They, they said they knew we'd be writing about it and all they wanted us to do was tell the truth. And um, <clears throat> I think they did say 
that they hoped that the American people would realize that they weren't a bunch of monsters and they were human beings. And uh, I'm sure we told them we certainly agreed that was the truth. And uh, that really was, uh, I suppose, the theme of the book I wrote. Uh, and it was enlightening to us because Americans' ideas of what the Viet Cong conspiracy was like was that they were just a bunch of nutty little monsters. And uh, <laughs> they were good guys. How about um, your health? You know, you were saying earlier how much weight you lost um, and how you exercised <coughs> to keep well, you know, during your time in captivity. But did this catch up with you later? You know, were you um, ill when you returned? Well, it did. And I, 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 I had contracted a disease that didn't appear right away. But uh, Michael apparently had it too. <clears throat> While we were still captured, he got a, an ugly looking yellow boil, infected boil on his ankle. And he uh, mixed up some toothpaste and cigarette ashes and things and tried to make a poultice and uh, treated it. And uh, I guess it eventually sort of healed I didn't have any symptoms like that. I had a little diarrhea occasionally, but uh, that was all. Uh, in, in, drinking impure water had its effect. Uh, but um, I, f I flew to uh, I don't remember the exact route, but I think we went out through Hong Kong and I dictated stories along the way. And then I know we landed in San Francisco, and I had another story ready to file there. And I, I would, I, I know I'd filed copy from Hong Kong too. I kept writing furiously, to tell the whole story, and um, <clears throat> Helen met me at. Uh, I think we came in at Dulles Airport in Washington, and. Um, we already had made arrangements that for a flight from the National Airport uh, to uh, go directly to St. Louis. And the paper was waiting for me, and I would uh, complete my series of articles. And uh, they were already, I think, already starting to syndicate it. And um, On the plane, somehow we got from Dulles Airport to National Airport, and uh, we got on the plane there. Helen had brought out a change of clothes for me, and uh, <clears throat> we set out on the plane for St. Louis. On the plane, I s suddenly got a, a, a furious headache, and uh, chills, alternating chills and fever, and was shaking some too. And uh, we knew I was damn sick. And um, But I could walk off the plane. The managing editor came to meet me, Everts Graham, and uh, he put his arm around my shoulders and he said, Dick, we're so glad to have you out of here now. He says, we're going to, uh, I'm glad you can write this stuff but we want you to take six months vacation with pay. And I said, oh, I don't need anything like that. And he said, I, I just insist that you take three months off with pay. And I said, oh, that's not it. He said, you've got to take one month off with pay. And I said, I'll take it. <laughs> and so I still have my sense of humor, and uh, <clears throat> but I knew I had this complete this writing job, which was going to be tough, and I knew I was feeling really terrible. So they'd arranged for a, a motel room for us 
And we went there. And by then I, I was getting sicker and sicker. And we called uh, Doctor. Uh, we called Doctor Kingsland, who had been our family doctor when we were there. He was no longer in private practice. He was uh, uh, head of medicine at uh, at. Uh, I don't remember the name of the hospital, but a small hospital in St. Louis. And uh, he came to see me, and he says, you really have to be in the hospital. But he says, once you get in the hospital, Acquisition number 22579010. Richard Duffman, Real 10. He said, uh, you ought to be in the hospital, but once you get in the hospital, they're going to be have you so busy with taking blood and taking tests and things that you're not going to be able to do this writing job that I know is important to you. And we don't know what infection you have, but we'll t- I'll take some blood and we'll start the diagnosis and I'll give you some antibiotics. No, no antibiotics yet, because that would uh, kill the organism, and they wouldn't be able to diagnose it. But he said, "I'll, I'll they gave me some uh, painkiller or something." And uh, he said, "I'm going to come and treat you here in the motel till you're through with this writing job." And I said, "Great." Well, by then I was periodically. Uh, uh, out of my head and I uh, delirious but then I'd have long periods of lucidity and uh, it happened that my uh, deputy bureau chief of the Washington Bureau of the Post Dispatch was in town a guy named Tom Ottenad a damn good reporter and he came right over and we agreed that the way we do it would be I would dictate him stories. And I had these little crummy notes from my money belt, and I, I, they would remind me of different things I wanted to tell him about. And I, I'd dictate some stuff, and then he'd go off and write it, and then he'd come back and read it to me, choosing a time when I was in control of my mind, And uh, then he'd give the copy to uh, Helen and Janet, who were, uh, it was being syndicated by the New York Times. So they had to then dictate it to the New York Times. And they did it on pay phones, and uh, they pulled up wheelchairs up to the the pay phone booths and uh, dictated the copy. And I'd be busy writing my next one, and that's the way it got in the paper. And um, they, uh, I finally finished the writing job, and they slapped me in the hospital. And by then, they uh, had sent uh, blood, and they were making a culture in Atlanta. And uh, uh, Our good friend Marcus Childs, uh, I wonder if he was the bureau chief then. No, I think I already was, but he was a senior columnist uh, on the and worked with the Post Dispatch. He always had his office in our bureau, and we, in order to. Uh, keep my wits about me. We blocked all incoming calls. Didn't want to talk to anybody. People are always trying to call us. Well, he found, he's a good newspaper man, he found a way to get through to the right floor and got us, got Helen on the phone. And he said, well, you've got to get Rich out of that little hick hospital he's in and get him to Mayo's or Atlanta and uh, uh, we can save him. But but he said, if, if um, I remember the thing that really cut her, He said, uh, if I, did you ever hear of Marguerite Higgins? She was a a New York Herald Tribune 
writer, a famous war correspondent in the Korean War. He said if Maggie Higgins had had proper med medical care, she'd be alive today. And Helen wondered if she was doing the right thing. Well, she told an old friend of ours named Bob Goldman in New York that she was wondering if I was being at adequate treatment. And he said, would you like to have me come out there? She said, yes. And he showed up. And I said, what, is, what are you doing here, Bob? And he said, oh, I just thought I'd drop in. Well, he talked to Helen. And he sized up the hospital and talked to the doctor and assured her that she was doing the right thing. Well, about that time, I called our extremely good uh, uh, family doctor in Washington, Alfred Baer, and uh, I, I told him what the symptoms were. They were, I had some kind of boils in the backs of my knees, and I had this terrible headache, and a, a persistent cough, and alternate high fever and chills. <clears throat> and he said, uh, ask him if they tried melioidosis as a possibility. And so when Dr. Kingsland came in, I told him about this. He said, that's the one we're working on. And this good doctor in Washington, at long distance, knew so much about different diseases, he was able to figure which one it was. Well, that's what it was. It was called malioidosis. <clears throat> and I've done some reading on it since, and then people told me about it. It was a, a disease of a, a bacterium that lives in the soil. And when I pushed my face down in the dirt, that may be when I got it. And uh, it, was, uh, it has a 50% mortality rate. Uh, it afflicted a lot of the French soldiers in Indochina. And uh, it was uh, first uh, uh, described as an ailment of the beggars in Rangoon. Uh, I don't know when, years before. And uh, it was little known in America, and hardly anybody had ever seen a case of it. But uh, they put me on some strong antibiotics, but my, I guess, white blood cells count and different things like that showed that by the time they put me on the antibiotics I was already recovering. And I think I was two or three weeks in the hospital and it was it was nip and tuck for a while but uh, I got a, I recovered. And um, then I went <clears throat> I, before I left to go back to Washington I went into the post-dispatch, and I was kind of a hero, of course. And they wanted to do something for me, some kind of a recognition. And uh, we, we were in the newsroom, and Helen saw an old table that had, it was an old black oak, very dark oak, long table. And it had uh, carvings along the edge and funny-looking bulbous legs, and uh, but it was obviously not used for anything important. And uh, Helen says, that would be a good back desk for Richard in the Washington Bureau. Why don't you give that to him? So they said, fine. And we got it crated up and sent right away. And some of the people in the staff, uh, they knew about the table. And they organized a save the table committee, but by the time they got going, it was already gone. And I, uh, I uh, got an agreement with uh, Michael Pulitzer, uh, the publisher's uh, half brother, uh, that I could have it as a permanent loan. And I still got it, and it's upstairs now. Uh, when we got back to Washington, I was kind of a neighborhood hero. And they closed off the street and had a big welcoming home party on our front lawn uh, with kegs of beer 
and hot dogs and a general celebration with a lot of balloons and things. And the mayor was there and the, a couple of senators and the, um, uh, the suffragan bishop, uh, Episcopalian bishop, uh, Paul Moore from across the street <clears throat> came over in his clerical shirt and shorts and did a little sermon from the, our front porch saying that uh, uh, Jonah got off easy. The Lord delivered him from the whale right away. Why did the Lord keep Richard Dunman 40 days imprisoned? <laughs> and uh, we had a lot of fun. And then there, <clears throat> there was one other thing I want to tell you. Um, the Christian Science Monitor I, I had some of their executives come down to Washington uh, with um, uh, Elizabeth Pond to uh, do a lecture before I think it was the Women's Press Club and uh, it was an afternoon affair and they asked me if I would introduce her and I was glad to do that of course and then I told Helen <clears throat> that we really ought to have her and her bosses from Boston out to dinner afterwards. Helen said, I don't even want to meet her. Here you were sleeping with her for 40 days. I don't want to have anything to do with her. <clears throat> and I said, well, Helen, you got to understand, she's not that type of a woman. And um, so Helen relented and... Um, we had a nice dinner party, and it took no time at all for Helen to see that not only was Elizabeth no threat, she Helen quickly saw that she didn't seem to appreciate me enough. <clears throat> so at one point, uh, Helen delivered herself of a rhetorical question. She said, Beth, <clears throat> when everything looked black, and you didn't know if you'd ever survive there. And you were in such discomfort and trouble and threat to your very life. Wasn't it a great thing to have somebody like Rich along who was so cheerful <clears throat> and so resourceful and uh, always good company and uh, could keep his feet on the ground and the whole thing? And Beth said, well, yes. And that was all. Helen said afterwards she was about ready to upset the coffee pot on top of her head. <laughs> you put a nail in a little wide. <laughs> so that's enough of that part of Vietnam. Now I'll tell you about Hanoi. I, <clears throat> I'd been trying many, many times to get a uh, visa to go to Hanoi while the war was still on to see the other side of this war. And um, I went up to uh, Toronto and talked to uh, visiting North Vietnamese there. I went to their uh, mission to the UN and talked to them there. I sent numerous cablegrams. And uh, finally, a, uh, a visa came through. And uh, I spent two weeks uh, in the country. Um, they greeted me with a great big bouquet of flowers and said, we welcome you as a friend of Hanoi. And I said, well, I can't really accept that designation. I said, I'm here as an objective reporter and uh, 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 Friendships don't matter. Truth is what matters, or something like kind of stuffy like that. I told them, and I don't know how they took that, but uh, they did <clears throat> uh, give me some tours of uh, uh, bombing sites where a hospital was destroyed and things like that. And um, then they, uh, I had a number of requests. Uh, some of which they didn't do. I wanted to see the the uh, uh, caves that they had along the edge of the mountains to protect themselves against bombing for uh, 
munition dumps and uh, 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 factories of various kinds and power supplies and things like that. And uh, they never let me visit any of them. Uh, they, they did, uh, however, take me to Haiphong, the seaport. And um, <clears throat> probably the most interesting thing I had on that trip was to notice the, uh, the stacks of guns and bombs and all kinds of things and other supplies that had come in from uh, uh, by ship. Uh, and instead of being in any one place, they were so dispersed. They were along under the trees alongside the road, and then there were gaps between different uh, collections of this stuff. And a lot of it was highly explosive. But if bombs had hit any part of it, it would have uh, been limited in its destruction. And that uh, dispersal was part of their uh, the solution to their problem of how to deal with this heavy bombing. And uh, their troops were dispersed too. As, as I told you about the Viet Cong, uh, the North Vietnamese forces were dispersed so that uh, <clears throat> one bomb would have a limited effect. And um, the whole uh, conclusion I reached uh, was that uh, they would have no trouble in fighting on against all kinds of uh, action by the United States. Uh, I did interview uh, the Prime Minister, what was his name? Um, I didn't get much out of him anyway. But uh, I, I, it was a worthwhile trip, but it, it incurred some uh, criticism at home. Uh, and I, uh, the other paper in town, the St. Louis Globe Democrat, uh, ridiculed the way they'd sent a correspondent to the enemy side. And I, <clears throat> I did an article uh, about what, what it's like for an American citizen to uh, visit the other side in an ongoing war and wrote about the responsibility of the press. Interesting you saying about the um, criticism. I remember um, people like Jane Fonda went, didn't they? And oh. they suffered. Um, oh, yeah. She, yes. she was attacked. Very much so, yeah. Yes. Well, they got after me on the floor of the House of Representatives, a congressman from Iowa, I said that he understood that I had uh, contrived to be captured and to uh, associate with the enemy this way. And uh, when I got back from St. Louis and uh, went back into the Bureau, this had just happened, and I found out that they had issued some kind of a statement saying that uh, uh, this didn't sound plausible or something like kind of a weak defense. And I, t t I told them, I said, you know, sometimes you can bend over so far backwards you fall on your face. Let's issue another statement denouncing this as a goddamn lie. And we did. Were there any other um, newspaper men in Hanoi from the West? Did many people go there, do you think, in the war? I think maybe Harrison Salisbury went there. I know he did. And he, uh, he was put up for a Pulitzer Prize. And uh, then there was an attack against him for having uh, uh, quoted... Uh, some statements by the North Vietnamese government about uh, civilian casualties, and uh, that, that was felt to have been an uh, uh, inadequate source, and uh, that he they made him out to have been a, a gullible. But actually, 
that was just part of the story. And he told his own observations too. So, but they hated him, and they took away the Pulitzer Prize. We got it later for something else. <laughs> um, was there much evidence, you know, um, in your tour of the defoliation? What had happened, you know, to the countryside in the north? Uh, the defoliation activity was in the south. There was a lot of bombing just to destroy uh, transportation and power supplies and dams and things like that in the north. And um, I saw, from the air, I saw a lot of uh, uh, bomb, uh, bomb holes. And um, and they showed me some of the destruction too, but it was um, actually even in the south. I kept hearing stories about how it's been bombed so much it looks like the moon. I uh, I never saw it as that comprehensive. Uh, there was destruction, but. Uh, uh, I was a little disappointed. It wasn't it wasn't as great as I thought I'd see, and I wanted to describe it, but I couldn't uh, go into that kind of extreme descriptive material uh, that uh, some others had used because I didn't see that much. It was uh, it was an occasional bomb hole, but. It wasn't everywhere. But you definitely got this impression, did you, Richard, that the North could carry on for a long campaign? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And a big part of it was this dispersion. Okay. Um, yeah, I had no doubt of it. Did you write about that, you know, the dispersion? Oh, yeah. I, I wrote a series of articles from the north, and uh, I don't think I wrote them from there. I think I went, went off to, uh, must have been Hong Kong, and wrote from there. And because uh, I didn't want people to think I was writing through censorship. And uh, I probably would have too. So when the end of the war came um, in 1975, did it seem very quick to you? Well, the end did come fast, yes. The, uh, the North Vietnamese poured in a lot of troops, and um, they began to hit one after another these strong points in, in South Vietnam that I had visited, and uh, they... The uh, South Vietnamese army just turned turtle and ran, and it was a it was really a rout, and uh, I think it even surprised the uh, North Vietnamese forces that they uh, could advance so fast, and um, suddenly, uh, if I remember rightly. Uh, the Khmer Rouge closed in on uh, Phnom Penh about two weeks or more uh, ahead of the fall of Saigon. And uh, it was clear that Saigon was going to fall. So I got uh, our people in the Bureau, Washington Bureau together and we charted out a, a special section. And uh, uh, as soon as it fell, uh, we wanted to be able to hit the street with a special fall of, of Vietnam section. And um, I wrote the lead piece, uh, kind of an intro, and that set the tone for it. And then I, had, I wrote also a major military piece, and then I had other members of the Bureau write different aspects of it, and we had a lot of pictures. And the one thing I wanted to be sure was the thrust of that section. 
was that uh, this was for the United States a defeat and humiliation or defeat and disillusion. I can't remember which uh, one of those terms. And uh, I had that prominently in the story and they used that in the headline. And it was uh, uh, unlike the approach that almost every other newspaper's wrap-up took. Almost invariably, they called it a tragedy. Well, in the technical usage of a tragedy, uh, that's where good motives carried to their fullest extent turn out badly. And <clears throat> I didn't think this was good motives. Uh, so I didn't think it fitted the classical definition of a tragedy at all. And I, if, you, if you say tragedy, that's kind of absolving uh, the United States from any responsibility for it. And uh, we, we'd, we'd intervened there, and uh, it was a mistake. And um, so it was a very hard-hitting thing. And I, I, I think it was damn near unique in the country. And uh, the paper accepted it, and I, I was proud of him for doing that. Of course, a lot of presidents were involved, weren't they, with Vietnam, from, I suppose, Eisenhower right Well, through. even Truman didn't quite get the word from, from Roosevelt that uh, we were supposed to get France out of there and end colonialism in Southeast Asia. And uh, Truman didn't either didn't agree with that or didn't get the word or didn't pursue it. And then, or maybe Roosevelt didn't stick with it enough toward the end, I don't know. But uh, then Eisenhower uh, helped set the end, been, uh, noting Jim in place and uh, uh, made the uh, uh, well, he started financing the the French war, and then when the French folded, he uh, uh, sent uh, forgotten who it was. Uh, his Secretary of State, I guess, sent him to uh, uh, Geneva for the 1954 Geneva Conference. And um, then he um, uh, reneged on the plan for a uh, uh, for a popular vote to determine the future of the country. So he was deeply involved in it. And then Kennedy went right along in a little more cautious way, but he s uh, said we must uh, uh, bear any burden to support freedom around the world and so on. He made a lot of, uh, he made some ambiguous statements and there's always always been an argument about whether he would have ended the war had he lived. Uh, I don't think he would have. And uh, he uh, began the gradual escalation and then Lyndon Johnson carried it to its peak. And then Nixon won election with a promise that he had a secret plan to end the war, but he kept it going for five years and lost another 10,000 American war dead. So uh, there was a lot of presidents. And it took a long time for the rest of the country to realize that it was a, a lost cause. And there's still some argument about it. do you think that war affected America and um, American foreign policy and America's attitude to involvement in foreign wars? Wars have a way of teaching lessons that persist long after they make any sense. World War II taught us that you can't appease a dictator. And then they applied that to any negotiations with North Vietnam can't appease them, and they kept us in the war. That that kind of thinking, and that, but then uh, Vietnam showed that uh, 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 you, you can't 
involve American boys in the land war in Asia. Any place. Position number 22579, row one. Right, Richard. So we're off. Well, I've told you, I was born in Iowa, in the center of the United States, in a little town called Centerville, which had signs outside of it that said, Centerville, 5,000 friendly people. <clears throat> My father was a country doctor. I, I was born in 1918, and um, my mother had been a school teacher. She taught mathematics and Latin, and I, uh, my father had been a school principal also. I, when I was about two years old, my father finally was so sick of mud roads in southern Iowa he took the family west to Oregon, and I grew up in Portland, Oregon. I went to high school there, and uh, actually got more out of high school than I did out of college. Uh, <clears throat> um, I guess I was a good student in in high school. I I went to. Stanford University in California, and um, I had always assumed as a high school student that I would eventually be a doctor like my father. I thought Dr. Dudman sounded right and Mr. Dudman didn't sound right, and I, I liked the idea of being a doctor, and I used to go on calls with him, house calls. and. and um, I know he wanted me to be a doctor, too. So I began a pre-med course at Stanford, and that included biology, and I, it involved I, I cutting up a frog and studying the veins and muscles, and I, I hated biology. Uh, I couldn't remember, my, my mind isn't good at remembering a lot of data, and I, I could see memorization was going to be a big part of it, and I didn't like the smell of formaldehyde, and I, I just took a dislike to it that first week. Uh, my roommate I, one day said uh, he was going to go and try out for the school newspaper. He said, how about it? And I said, yeah, I'll go along. The Stanford Daily. I loved that from the first day, and I, I, I quit uh, pre-med, and I knew I was going to be a newspaper man. And I can remember sitting down at a, a typewriter in the Daily Shack, we called it, the, the office we had, and the uh, the managing editor was a woman who later became a famous journalist. Anna Lee Whitmore was her name. I, and <clears throat> she wrote, um, I've forgotten the name of the book, but uh, she, she was married to uh, Melville Jack Jacoby, and uh, the two of them did some coverage in World War II. Um, well, she had given me an assignment she was managing editor on this school paper. I guess she was a senior. And she had uh, sent me to cover some kind of a student council meeting or something. And I came back with a lot of notes. And I sat in front of the typewriter. And I didn't know what to do. And she said, let me tell you this. Just pretend you're telling somebody about this very briefly, but you want to get them interested, you want to give them the basic facts, and that's it. So this isn't a big story, but you got to think how you're going to organize it, and that's the way to do it. Just think you're telling somebody a story. 
So I wrote it out, and I've been doing it ever since. <laughs> so you I, found your niche. Yes, mm. and the the paper um, came out every. It was called the Daily. It came out every day, and um, you want to check that and see that we're recording. We're all, we're fine. We're all right. <clears throat> um, they needed a photographer too, and they had an old a Graflex uh, and a speed graphic, and an old carrying case. And I used to carry those around. Those were cameras that had a, a, a great big four inch by five inch thing they called a film pack, which you'd have to stick that in the back. And then you open a slide, and that would expose the film inside. And then you cl click the shutter. And uh, this was before the days of 35 millimeter, long before. Well, I got pretty good at it. In fact, I took one picture of a, a uh, football game and uh, it was a very dramatic picture of somebody getting tackled or something. And um, I, I uh, rushed it down. I ran down. I'd forgotten. I think I had an old, an old Ford. Yeah. And I got in the car and I drove down to San Jose, to the San Jose Mercury Herald. I think they were the team that was involved in it. And I went into the office of the Mercury Herald and uh, told them I had a good picture, and they developed it and looked at it and liked it. And they said, what would you like? Would you like a byline or a dollar? And I said, a byline? So I took the credit line. I've never done that since. Take the money. <laughs> but anyway, I, I, I took pictures all the time, and I learned to use it. Well, I was so enthusiastic about this, I almost flunked out of school because uh, I didn't pay any attention to my studies, except a little journalism. I kind of like that. But um, by the time I was uh, uh, pretty well along in the fall quarter, I, uh, my uncle, my mother's brother, I, I was in touch with him. I, he ran a newspaper in Northern uh, California called the Oroville Mercury Register. And uh, uh, Uncle Dan asked if I'd like to come up and spend spring vacation with him and work on the paper. And it was a little daily, and it was a, a good paper, and uh, it had a circulation of 5,000 in a town of about 5,000 people. It circulated outside, too. And <clears throat> so I did a, several stories every day for him for that week and uh, enjoyed it so much, took pictures and things like that. And by that time, he had a Leica. Uh, that was the first of the miniature cameras. They called them mini cams. And uh, <clears throat> I used his dark room and, and I... One time he he said uh, he said I don't want people to think that you're something special around here because you're my nephew. That scrap paper around. He said I want you to sweep that up, and then I go out and pick up all those cigarette butts and, and gum wrappers out on the street too. If we want to keep this place looking nice, and then when you're through with that, go and deliver the, deliver one of the roots because we got to circulate this paper, too. And uh, so I learned to do all that, and I loved every minute of it. I, so they, I, he liked that first week, uh, that, that single week uh, on the, my performance on the paper that he asked if I'd come and work for him I, the following summer. That was my first summer vacation while I was at college. And I leaped at the chance, and I did the same thing all summer. I lived with him. I got $15 a week and room and board. And my Aunt Helena 
I kept me fed, and I, I just had a great time. And by the end of that summer, I was just locked in. I knew I was going to be a newspaper person. Well, <clears throat> I, I kept on through school devoting 90% of my attention and time and energy to the paper. And um, I, uh, <clears throat> I applied to a number of papers for a, a summer job in the next summer and uh, was not successful. And I've forgotten how I spent that summer. But then the, the following summer, I was able to get a summer job on the uh, Glendale News Press, Glendale, California. And that was a little larger paper. But again, I did uh, photography as well as reporting. And I again had a great time at it. Uh, when the war, I, the war was coming along. This was in, I was in the class of 1940. And when I was graduated, of course, England was already at war. And um, I, I didn't know exactly, I, w I knew I was going to be drafted eventually. And I didn't really feel like uh, trying to s uh, sign up permanently on some newspaper I, because I was afraid I'd be interrupted right away. So I got a kind of a, maybe it was a little timid about leaving college. I don't remember why exactly, but I, for about a year I worked as a researcher and writer for an outfit called the Front Door Ballot Box, which was a, an opinion polling outfit. My journalism professor had uh, devised a stratified sample to uh, uh, assess uh, public opinion in a, in a city. And uh, I uh, learned how to do this, and I used an early IBM uh, punch card system that we had it on the campus to uh, analyze the results. And I hired interviewers, and I'd have a certain number of men, certain number of women, and I'd tell them how to uh, how many people from each economic bracket, and explain to them how they uh, how to uh, appraise somebody's uh, economic position, and then uh, oh, I had them divided according to age too. And I'd get some young and some old and some middle, and uh, <clears throat> we would get. Uh, I wasn't. I didn't do the business side of it, but the guy who owned the the company, uh, <clears throat> he um, um, he made contracts with different outfits. For example, power companies were having uh, local elections into whether there would be a public power district that would be in competition with the power company. The power company would want to know how this was going to come out. So we would uh, do a survey and predict it. We came within one or two percent always. We were very good at it. And this was right after uh, a newspaper, a magazine called the uh, Literary Digest had uh, really made a terrible mistake in predicting that. Uh, uh, I've forgotten which election it was, but in the presidential election, they missed it entirely. And uh, I think it was Dewey going to win. And, he, and uh, the, the problem was that they had done it more mainly on the telephone. And in those days, a lot of people didn't have telephones, so they missed all those who didn't have telephones, and they got a biased sample. Well, my sample was not biased because it was stratified and very carefully figured. Uh, so we were, we profited from their errors and, and uh, had a good little business. Well, I, that lasted for 
the best part of a year. And then <clears throat> I could see I wasn't getting drafted very fast. And I had a <clears throat> I had a really a wanderlust. And a friend of mine, a classmate of mine, had uh, uh, gone off on a uh, uh, on a on a Scandinavian ship, a, a freighter, as a member of the crew. And I thought that sounded like a nifty idea. So I went up to San Francisco and um, <clears throat> I found out that the jobs on Scandinavian, I thought Scandinavian sounded good, the jobs were uh, being handled by the Norwegian Siemens Union, the Norsk Schirmans Verbund. And so I became a member of the Norsk Schirmans Verbund. And I, they said, yeah, we'll put you on a boat, but you've got to wait till one comes in here. That was in Portland, Oregon. It was, uh, uh, no, it was in San Francisco. Uh, it was in San Francisco, and they waited. They said, in the meantime, uh, can you help around the office? So I wrote some of their press releases, and I don't know what all. And uh, uh, a boat came in called the Baalbek, and they hired me. And I was the uh, uh, group, the cabin boy. And um, my job was to uh, make the beds for the officers and to, uh, to uh, uh, one of the tasks was to use a blowtorch to burn the bed bugs out of the springs of their cots. And I learned to do all those things. And uh, I remember the first day out, we were on the way down the, uh, out in the Pacific Ocean, going down from uh, San Francisco towards, La uh, towards South America. And we were on that first leg out. It was the first time I'd been outside the site of land. And I didn't know anything about boats. And I was standing next to the, I think it was the chief mate uh, on the rail and, and uh, asked some simple questions about the boat. And I said, how many are there in the crew? He said, well, there are exactly 32, including you. And then he thought a minute and he said, or including me. I thought that was the most hospitable kind of a remark anybody could have made. And I, I was aboard that. We went down to, uh, we went through the Panama Canal and went down to uh, uh, Venezuela and Colombia and, um, and touched on some Central American ports. And then we came back through the canal and went all the way up to uh, Canada and uh, then came back to Portland, Oregon, my home, and I paid off there. And I, can, I had such a lump in my throat when I saw that boat going out without me, because it was such a close, nice society on the, on the ship that I've always um, loved anything to do with the ocean ever since. And um, then I, I hitchhiked across the country to New York to get a, another sh shipping job. And I was then a second cook and baker on a, uh, a boat called uh, – I can't remember the name of that one. And we went to Greenland twice. And um, that, of course, was a nice adventure. But then when they were going to go back, we came back to Newfoundland. We were in St. John. And then we learned that we were going to go back up to Greenland. Well, by that time, I'd had about enough of Greenland. And the, they were sinking uh, merchant ships all around us at the time. <clears throat> and uh, 
uh, I decided that I wasn't going to go back with him. So I went to the, um, this all sounds kind of foolish, I suppose. I was a young fellow and I did some of those silly things. I, w I hung out in the YMCA because I knew that if they would look for me, they'd look in the bars, but they wouldn't think to look in the Y. And they sail without me. And um, then about at that very time, a British guy came up to me and he says, you're a Yank, aren't you? And I said, yes. And he says, your country's in the war. And I said, what do you mean? He says, well, they, they destroyed your Navy at Pearl Harbor and you've declared war. Well, that was the first I heard of it. So <clears throat> actually, I didn't have any great desire to get in the military. So I, I thought I'd get another ship uh, in the Merchant Marine. <coughs> and eventually, they offered me a seagoing tug that went to Murmansk. And that didn't sound like a very sensible thing to be doing. So I, I they finally, the, the Furnace Whippy Company, the the shipping company that I was working for uh, shipped me back to New York and I got a job there on a another boat called the War Admiral which was going to uh, uh, Liverpool and uh, I was to be the second cook and baker and um, but before we set sail the uh, the cook, I guess it was, um, no, it was the steward, I think, broke into the uh, chief officer's liquor supply and they fired him. And um, so the cook became the steward and they said I could be the chief cook. So I went to a uh, went ashore and, and uh, went to a bookstore and read some recipes and I came back aboard and I was chief cook and uh, it wasn't too bad. I knew how to make pies and cakes, especially pies because my, my mother made pies and um, um, I learned how to make bread and I learned how to butcher a quarter of beef and a half of pork and a, and a whole lamb and uh, another adventure. Well, were you then sort of officially in the war? You know, had you been drafted at this no, stage? No, no. This was just, uh, I say merchant marine, all that meant was a job in the merchant marine industry. And uh, I, I was just hired as an individual and I, uh, but then I, my mother got word to me that the FBI was after me saying that I was supposed to uh, accept a, an order from my draft board. So as soon as I got back to New York, I went into the, uh, I went into the Navy and uh, the recruiting office and said I'd, I think I'm supposed to be drafted, but I'd rather be in the Navy. And uh, they said, all right, uh, let me take down some details. They said, how many years school do you have? And I said, four years. And they said, yeah, four years high school. And I said, no, not high school, four years of college. They said, college? Go upstairs, you can be an officer. So I went upstairs and I became an officer. <laughs> and I had two months of training in Chicago and they put me on a boat, and I was uh, I was assistant navigation navigator. I was uh, a deck officer, and uh, eventually I was always on the same boat. I eventually was the uh, executive officer, and uh, I worked. I uh, served on that boat. We w we went. We did convoy duty. It was a a. a a converted United Fruit Company banana boat, and we carried refrigerated supplies to 
uh, forces that were going to make the stuff. First, the uh, Italian invasion, and then the uh, across the channel. And um, we serve, uh, we supplied Navy ships in all these details. And uh, we went to Algeria and Algiers and Oran, and then um, uh, up to Naples, and then uh, a little, another trip. We went to Loch Long and uh, supplied the ships that were going to take part in the invasion of uh, Western France. And um, that lasted till. Well, it was along in 45, and I was still on duty, uh, but I got uh, virus pneumonia, and they put me in a naval hospital in the state of Washington, and um, I think while I was there, they just, I, the United States dropped the atom bombs, and the war began to come to an end. I, and um, when I <clears throat> when I finally got mustered out, uh, my father had died uh, in about nineteen, I think it was forty or forty one, right after I was out of college. And I knew my mother was awfully lonesome and at loose ends. So I proposed to her that she and I drive to Mexico on kind of a vacation. And I, I picked her up in Portland, and we stopped off to see Uncle Dan. And Uncle Dan knew that I was headed for a journalistic career, I'm sure. He said, while you're down there, Write me a story about every day and send it to me. He says, if any good, I'll publish it. So I wrote a, a daily story. And I, I don't remember how I got them off to him. I guess I must have telegraphed them or mailed them or something. And uh, that went on for, I suppose, a couple of months. And um, my mother liked Mexico so much, she decided she was going to live there for a while. So I got her established, and then I took her car. She said, you take the car. So I drove back and stopped off in, at Stanford to see my old professor. And he said, <clears throat> what do you want to do? And I said, I want to be a newspaper man. He said, well, the, uh, the former editor of the Portland Oregonian, a paper I'd always read as a kid, he's moved now to Denver. His name was Palmer Hoyt. And they said, he's hiring right now. Why don't you go there? So I did. And I went in to say Hoyt, and I had known him. In fact, he was one of the, uh, one of the, people who uh, bought our front door ballot box opinion surveys, and I'd known him in that connection. Also, my father, who was an obstetrician, had delivered two of his kids. So uh, he was kind of, in, in a distant way, a family acquaintance, too. And uh, I dropped in to see him, and uh, he introduced me to his uh, uh, managing editor, Larry Martin, and um, Larry asked me a few questions, and I had brought along a, a bunch of clippings of all this stuff I'd written uh, from Mexico, and they liked that, and so they put me on at uh, $40 a week. Position 
Richard Dudman, Reel 12. <coughs> we, um, uh, uh, we spent ten days traveling. We visited a whole lot of uh, projects, like dams that they were building and things like that. And I uh, visited some textile factories that were making what looked to be uniform material. And um, uh, we went to, uh, um, and they said, what else would you like to do? And we said, we want to see some of the people. Well, they, they said that would be difficult. And uh, we, we knew from other accounts we'd read that they, uh, uh, I'd been told by, I think it was a State Department or CIA guy I got for a briefing before I went, I went over there. He told me what to look for. He said, you'll see that the population is being starved to death and worked to death. They've got hardly anything to eat. The country is going into a steep decline because of stupid uh, procedures, and they are <clears throat> they work them from <clears throat> early morning till late at night. Uh, they've abolished all schooling. There's there's uh, they work little children, uh, and uh, you you won't see any able-bodied men. They've all been taken away, probably killed, uh, and um, the malnutrition is so great that you'll never see babies in arms or nursing mothers. The women are all barren, and um, it was a pretty bleak picture that they drew, and they said you'll see no useful uh, industry or agriculture. You, you'll see some forced labor in agriculture, but it's pretty dismal. Well, we saw people. We we each day we'd start driving early in the morning, and um, we. I think we heard the wake up bugles, at uh, I think it might have been five in the morning or something. And then they went to work at, I think, seven. And uh, we'd see them marching to go off to work in the fields. And then we'd see people working in the fields all without saying anything and uh, uh, planting rice. I think the rice harvest was on, so they'd be harvesting some rice too. And, um, and then we'd see work ending. Um, I think about a nightfall. It wasn't as extreme as we as I've been told, but uh, it was hard work. Um, we saw some little kids who should have been in school carrying uh, big loads of firewood marching along someplace. And uh, uh, we asked about these people, and they said, "Oh, these are volunteers doing their part for the country." And um, <clears throat> we wanted to see a, uh, a uh, communal dining hall, and they kept saying it wasn't, nothing was ready or so on. Finally, after we nagged them quite a while, they did take us to one, and it was just before noon, and there were round tables with people sitting in front of he heaping plates of food with uh, little side tables with Coca-Cola and the uh, bowls of fruit on the center of the main table and a kind of a lavish noon meal. And, um, but they weren't any of them eating and they wouldn't say anything and we tried to talk to them but they wouldn't, wouldn't talk to us. And um, uh, we were in there I suppose 15 or 20 minutes, and uh, well, as Caldwell kind of whispered to us, uh, what a charade. And it was a charade. 
And uh, I don't suppose those people ever ate that food. I think it was just a show put on for our, ourselves. Well, along with phony, phony stuff like that, we did see uh, rice production. <clears throat> we saw enormous granaries with uh, where the rice had been piled up. And, uh, I don't know what you do with rice. I guess you have to hull it and uh, meal, turn it into meal sometimes or uh, use it as rice. But um, they told us that they were actually exporting some rice. And then they... Uh, I remember we went to a dam that they were building and it it looked poorly constructed. There were big cracks in it. And that was pretty bad. But then there were a few positive things. We, we saw a... Um, well, we were told that they were exporting coal. And, uh, and we, uh, we visited a number of clothing factories and things like that. And they were... Uh, I couldn't get a sense of how hard people were having to work. We didn't... Uh, but one thing we did in these few people we'd see, say workers in a factory or people in the rice granary or things like that, they looked healthy. And once in a while we'd see a, a crowd of people at the side of the road. They didn't let us talk to them. But... Um, <clears throat> there were a lot of little babies and a lot of nursing mothers. And uh, I generally, I saw maybe a thousand people that looked pretty healthy. Now, how much of that was a show for us and how much of it was representative of the rest of the country, I have no way of knowing. Uh, <clears throat> they took us to a... Um, a little village where they were, um, they had a housing project. And um, <clears throat> the, um, the lumber they used was from local trees. And a couple of guys with a great big crosscut saw one on one end and one on the other would saw the planks by hand. And uh, then they, there was a nearby uh, tile factory using local clay that made tile for roofs. And the only th they told us the only thing they had to bring in from outside was scr screws and hinges and door latches. And they were building <clears throat> new houses of lumber. They were on stilts because there's a lot of flooding there, like the conventional ones. But they, but unlike the thatched houses, which were always loaded with snakes and mice and uh, beetles, as I told you, they were <clears throat> clean and durable and uh, very simple, but quite practical. And uh, they, they were building dozens of these houses. And uh, their story was that they were moving people out of these kind of crummy, conventional, traditional shacks into these new houses. And at a distance, we saw a few other housing projects like this. So there were some things positive that were going on. Uh, they uh, took us to uh, much of to uh, what's the name of it? The uh, ancient uh, oh, Angkor Wat. Angkor Wat. I started to say Machu Picchu, but that's another continent. They took us to Angkor Wat, and we spent about two days there. Uh, <clears throat> we'd been told that there was a lot of destruction. Uh, by uh, Vietnamese, by uh, uh, Khmer Rouge, 
and selling off the heads of statues and things like that. We did see quite a few statues that had been mutilated. Uh, it was hard to tell whether it was wear and tear or deliberate. Uh, we saw a lot of things that weren't mutilated. It was a uh, it was an enormous. You've been there, have you? Yeah. Well, it was a tremendous experience, and uh, we uh, they claimed that some of the damage to it. They pointed out a few places where they said gunfire from the Vietnamese had destroyed it. Uh, the worst of the destruction, however, was by Mother Nature. It was the plants that would grow up and, and force apart the stones and cause some destruction. Well, that was going on. Of course, the, it's in the heart of the jungle. But um, <clears throat> on balance, it didn't look destroyed at all. And uh, what's gone on since, I don't know. But um, we were impressed by it. I, their story was <coughs> that um, they were in constant danger from an attack by the Vietnamese, that if it came, they would throw them back and kill them, and uh, that they were ready for it, and that uh, uh, that they were already uh, preparing for some international tourism, and that uh, some other groups would be admitted to the country. <clears throat> I later checked, I've forgotten, I guess it was when I was writing my stuff uh, from Hong Kong, I checked with the United States Department of Agriculture <clears throat> and found out that uh, they were, in, in fact, exporting some uh, uh, it must have been low sulfur coal. It was very particularly attractive stuff to Japan. And that uh, they were exporting some rice. And uh, I forget what else. But there was a starting of some Congress, some commerce. Uh, my uh, conclusion was that... Um, well, I'll tell you the conclusion later. Uh, something else happened. We completed our tour, and we went back to this guest house, and um, <clears throat> we had uh, we were told that we would have uh, that Elizabeth and I would have a, an interview with Paul Pot, and that. Uh, Malcolm Caldwell would have a separate interview with him. We were asked to prepare and submit questions. So we asked a lot of things about who are the members of your government, because they never gave any names. And uh, we asked for uh, uh, what kind, uh, what do you do with, uh, with enemy prisoners? Uh, what kind of legal procedures are there? What, a whole lot of questions like that, and then a lot of economic questions about what uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, oh, about nutrition, public health, and about uh, productivity of the economy, and all kinds of things. We thought up all kinds of questions. Well, the interview, as Paul Pot, we shook his hand, and... Uh, I guess he's pretty tall. He was pretty tall, but he's his. He wasn't like a typical uh, Cambodian. A typical Cambodian is really stocky, and the, when you shake their hands, it's like grabbing a, a package of hot dogs. They they, they have clubby fingers and, and uh, uh, very much unlike the Vietnamese. When I shook his hand, it was like grabbing the legs of a spider. There were little tiny, delicate fingers. And um, I can't say that I got more, much more physically out of him in the way of description. It was He sat on a kind of a throne there in Prince Sihanouk's palace, 
what she'd got in her accounts. Zanuck was in house arrest. We asked to see him, and they said he was not available. Didn't want to see anybody. <clears throat> and uh, so, I, instead of, we, we, we didn't really have a chance to ask him anything. We'd submitted our questions, and he, instead of directly answering him or dealing with him at all, he launched into a diatribe against the aggressive Vietnamese and said they were plotting to come in and that they would be thrown back. And that, uh, I thought it was kind of a filibuster, and I, I was really bored by it, and I, I didn't take it very seriously, although I took notes, of course, but, but I didn't, and it was a laborious affair because he spoke in Cambodian, and then uh, his uh, Secretary of State put that into French, and then somebody put it from French into English. And by the time it got to us, I, who knew how accurate it all was? And it was one sentence at a time. It, was, it seemed endless. <clears throat> well, he went on and on for a long time, and then finally, he, in a very kind of cursory fashion, he dealt with some of these questions. He said he, he wasn't going to give us the names of his people because if they went back into the jungle, they'd want to be anonymous. And um, he, he, uh, he really didn't give us much factual information of any kind. And um, uh, so we wound up this unsatisfactory interview and, and went back to, uh, and we had, had dinner, and, and uh, by that, I don't remember if it was before or after, uh, uh, Caldwell finished his interview, and we all had dinner together, and we compared notes on what we'd seen, and we really, uh, uh, hadn't any of us gotten much out of it, as far as I could see. Um, uh, Caldwell uh, took part in the discussion, and uh, he had uh, shown himself to be somewhat critical of the regime and distrustful, skeptical about their, uh, the things they showed us. And as I told you, he once said, what a charade. And <clears throat> uh, yet I, he... Uh, I think he had a kind of an underlying sympathy for the regime. And I gave him, got no indication that he had changed this view. Uh, we finished our meal, <coughs> said goodnight. She went to, uh, Elizabeth Becker went to her uh, room on the ground floor and uh, uh, Caldwell and I went up to our respective rooms on the upper floor, the second floor. And um, I got into my pajamas and uh, made some notes, but I, then I got into my pajamas and was getting ready to go to bed when I heard what sounded like shots outside. So I uh, went out into this hallway, and uh, I uh, saw he, at the back of the hallway there was, a, I think, double doors, and a young man came th through them uh, in a military uniform with kind of a baseball hat on and uh, a lot of bullets across his chest and a, some machine gun over his shoulder and a big pistol in his hand. And uh, 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 he um, took a look at me and then uh, turned around and went back out. And I uh, wanted to know what was going on, so I went there was, at the other end, the front end of the hallway. There was a, um, uh, there was a kind of a balcony and you could look outside. 
It was dark, but in the shrubbery I could see some people running around, and I didn't hear any more shooting, but uh, I didn't really know what was going on. And so I went over and knocked on, uh, on uh, Caldwell's door, and uh, he was mystified too as to what was going on. And uh, we decided the best thing to do was stay in our rooms and, uh, and hope that things had quiet down. So I started back towards my room, and then this young fellow with a gun came forward into the hallway again and pointed this damn big pistol at me and fired one shot. And it may sound as if I'm a little slow on the uptake, because it wasn't until then I realized it was in some danger. And I ducked back into the room and slammed the door. And I had the presence of mind to stand to one side because there were two more shots right through the door, splintering it. And I, I was afraid he was going to come in, but it, maybe he thought he'd finish me off already. Uh, so I, I, I tried to get under the bed, but it was a little low bed and I couldn't. But I lay down between the bed and the wall and um, wondered what was going to happen next, and <clears throat> I was scared, but I also was curious, and I, at some point I turned out the light, so I wasn't at least a silhouette, and I peered over the window to see if I could see anything going on outside. I couldn't see anything, and then I remembered that Helen had given me a tiger milk bar. It's a kind of a health food product. <clears throat> gave me a surge of energy and self-confidence. And um, this waiting period went on for about two hours. <clears throat> and then there was a knock on the door. And I figured, what the hell, I better open it. And I did. And it was uh, Tun Prasik, who was our, uh, uh, our Cam Cambodian diplomat uh, who had arranged the tour and was in charge of the whole thing. And uh, he but normally was a very natty fellow, but he looked all disheveled. And, uh, and uh, as if he'd been through a lot, which he had. And he said, um, are you all right? And I said, yeah. And he said, well, uh, Miss Becker is all right, too. But unfortunately, I... Professor Caldwell has been killed. And he said, I wish you'd come with me to his room and view the body. So I went across the hall where I'd been a few hours before. <clears throat> and there was this young guy that had all the guns on him, was lying out at the doorway in a pool of blood. He'd been shot by somebody. And inside, uh, Caldwell was lying on the floor next to his bed with a gaping hole in his chest, obviously dead. And uh, while I was during that two-hour period, I had heard some moving around, some, some few shots fired, some broken glass, some people dragging something around, and so on. I didn't know what was going on. <clears throat> uh, then... Becker came upstairs and told her story. <clears throat> she said that the young guy, apparently the one in the baseball cap, had confronted her downstairs in front of her room, had pointed a pistol at her, and she had said in French, uh, don't shoot me, I'm your friend. And I don't know if he could understand it, but anyway, he didn't. And she ran into the house, into the room, and... Uh, got into the bathtub and crouched down there waiting as I was waiting for things to blow over. Um, the Tune Prasit, this uh, ambassador, or whatever he was, uh, a diplomat, asked us to um, <clears throat> record our observations of what, what happened that night. And uh, we did, and kept a copy for ourselves. And uh, then 
he, I guess even immediately he had moved us into another guest house, which he said would be more secure. And um, we, um, his account of what had happened was that uh, th- three uh, people, and he didn't tell who they were, but three terrorists had come into the guest house and that uh, they tried to, he didn't know their exact mission, but they were trying to do some damage, and that they had um, captured one and were questioning him, that uh, one of them was killed, the one we saw, and one of them had gotten away. And um, we had no way of contacting anybody outside. There wasn't any... Uh, communication possible, uh, but they said that we would uh, depart on the Chinese jet the next morning as planned, but that before we went, we'd have a little funeral service for uh, Caldwell, and uh, the, uh, I forget his name, the, uh, <coughs> the foreign secretary said a few, a few words about him or something. <clears throat> and um, we took charge of his briefcase and his effects and they made a casket and put his, his body in the hold of the plane and off we went. And as soon as we got to uh, Mei Ching, I had told Ambassador Woodcock, a uh, U.S. ambassador, that what was happening, and we were going to go in, and I'd talk to him when I came out. He was, of course, much interested. Well, by the time we got there, it was already evening, and a Chinese diplomat that I knew named Yahweh uh, met us at the plane, and uh, I got on the phone to uh, the British and told him we had the body of a British citizen. And uh, <coughs> I called Woodcock, and he said, come on out to the embassy residence. And he would uh, arrange to uh, uh, get my newspaper on the phone. On the plane, I had written my story, uh, the initial story. Uh, are you about ready to break off? I, I told him that um, uh, I'd be out in a few minutes, and Yahweh drove me there, and the British guy came and took uh, possession of the effects and so on, and I made a brief statement to him. By that time, I had the paper on the phone, and uh, <clears throat> I uh, I've forgotten how I did it. I must have I must have dictated the story. I either did that or I got somebody from the embassy to tell exit. Some way I got the story off right away. And I'd written the whole thing on the plane. Um, uh, Woodcock uh, and his wonderful sweet wife, who had been a nurse at the embassy, and they'd married rather recently over there, she fixed us a steak sandwich apiece and things like that. And uh, I, I remember after I got my story out of my system and was trying to relax some, I, I'd, I'd heard uh, some kind of hysterical sobbing from uh, Becker, and I figured she was under a lot of strain. She'd offered me a Valium while we were spending the rest of that night waiting until the plane left, and I, did, I said I wouldn't need it, but I guess she'd taken something to try to calm herself down. And I told uh, <laughs> I told Woodcock's wife, I said, I'm a little worried about uh, Becker. How is she doing? And she said, well, she's going to be all right. But she says, Richard, you're a little strung out yourself. And of course, I was all revved up in the middle of a big story. And, and um, so I realized she was right. And uh, I talked to Helen. And by that time, she had, the story must have moved awful fast. And um, 
she already knew about it. <clears throat> and she said, she said, Rich, I, I've been in public. Position number 22579, reel 13. Richard Dubman, reel 13. And Helen said, Rich, I've been in public relations all my life, and I never could have thought of a zinger like that to start off a series of articles about Cambodia. That must have been a terrifying experience for yeah, you there. It was. Now, there's a little coda on this story, and I, I'm afraid I made myself rather a controversial character in doing it. I got the idea, and I, we didn't know anything about the mass executions at the time. I, when they were reported, I, I thought maybe there was some fabrication in it. I, I kind of resisted accepting it as truth. And I knew that um, uh, very little was known about uh, Cambodia except what was learned from refugees. And refugee testimony must always be suspect. And a lot of the writing about Cambodia was from uh, dedicated uh, uh, anti-communist zealots who uh, made a real cause over it. And uh, so I developed a belief that, um, to put it bluntly, that Paul Pot had an undeservedly bad press. <laughs> and I wrote some stuff to that effect. And it, it's one of the hardest things to sell, you can imagine, because uh, Paul Pot had immediately, for years, he'd become the man that they loved to hate. And anything that mitigated this to the least degree was anathema to everybody. I, so I plunged ahead, and I wrote an op-ed page piece for the uh, New York Times, and they gave it a big play. <laughs> and uh, I got a note from Joe Lillyvell, the editor, and he said, uh, he said, well, we, we accepted your piece, and who knows, you might even be right. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I, different people like Ben Kiernan uh, denounced my views and uh, felt it was terrible. And um, I may have been a a sucker, but to me, I, the way I put it to myself and in, in writing was that I, for all the, the cruel uh, things that Paul Pot did, uh, he was not so much the prime mover as a, uh, a, a almost a victim of a strange kind of a peasant revolt that was reminiscent of the ancient revolts in the Middle Ages of peasants coming, tearing into a city and killing everything that had any kind of civilization about it. And uh, that he was, rather than being the, the leader, he was trying to ride a tiger. Now, I've found hardly anybody that agrees with that. And uh, I even kind of doubt it myself, but I stuck my neck out and made that, tried to make that case, which was uh, extremely unpopular. <laughs> Did you, um, you know, has there been real evidence of genocide in Cambodia, would you say? Well, there are an awful lot of skulls. <clears throat> but um, even if you see a thousand skulls piled up, that's a long way short of, as I heard on the radio the other day, he was guilty of two million, two million executions. 
Well, those figures are thrown around loosely. And I, I made some inquiries among various students of the thing. And um, I arrived at kind of a ballpark figure, maybe 300,000 that were killed. Uh, but uh, the figure of more than a million to me was uh, journalistic and uh, uh, journalistic uh, uh, excess. And when uh, journalists are like that, if somebody gives them a range of figures in some kind of a disaster or killing or something, and they say, well, someplace between uh, uh, 100,000 and a million, they'll say upward of up to a million people. And then somebody will say more than a million, and it, the figures, you can't take them too seriously. Uh, was this genocide? I don't know. I, uh, I've read some serious studies of the whole pattern, and uh, apparently there were parts of, the, of Cambodia where there was a lot of killing and other parts where there was hardly any. Uh, local, I guess you'd call them warlords, uh, sometimes ran things the way they wanted to. Uh, but um, it certainly was a class affair. It was the... the uh, the affluent and the well-educated were the ones who suffered the most. And of course, they're the most articulate. And the history we read is written by the affluent and articulate. And um, I just, I was in a discussion of this thing once rather recently with Becker. and. Uh, Everybody was talking about this monster. I think it was at the time when he was under trial, you know, and they uh, eventually, what they do? They executed him, didn't they? Um, I, I said to me, he was not so much a monster as a mystery. And I really would like some ser serious investigation into what made him tick and uh, wh what, uh, what he was trying to do. And I didn't. I thought that in our hatred of him, we disregarded any meaningful analysis. But I didn't have anybody agree with me, because <laughs> it's it's offensive to say anything uh, remotely uh, sympathetic to somebody like that. It's really about like trying to tell about the good side of of. Uh, Bin Laden or Adolf Hitler, <laughs> and I, I, I don't, I haven't tried either of those. <laughs> I, you ready? In 1993, I, our city manager in Ellsworth, Maine, told my wife that uh, he'd seen in Newsweek magazine an interview with a retired Viet Cong general that said that he had captured three American newspaper men and 19 newspaper people in 19, uh, 1970, in 1970, uh, but had to let them go within a month because they ate too much. And it was kind of a throwaway line, uh, but uh, the c city manager uh, said to Helen that it, this sounded like it might have been her husband. And she agreed. And we, he didn't know what issue of the magazine it was. We don't read those news magazines much anymore. <clears throat> so, and the library circulates them, so they've, a lot of them were out circulating. And it took me a little few days to nail it down, and then I found out the name of the writer of the article. He's their military correspondent, and I called him, and uh, he told me how to get in touch with the general, and gave me his full name. And um, 
So I, I telephoned Saigon and got the uh, foreign ministry information people on the wire and uh, told them the situation and said that I'd like to come and interview him. And they said, sure. And I could apply for a visa and they'd fix it up. So I called the office and told them what was up. I was long since retired from the paper. <clears throat> and they uh, were enthusiastic about it. And they said they'd send a photographer along and uh, we could go and interview uh, this general. And uh, we did it. And uh, we... Uh, I took along the old map that I'd had, a CIA map of our part of Cambodia. And uh, when we greeted him, uh, he was at home. In a, uh, he was retired, and he had a job as um, directing the um, uh, War Veterans Association. And I think it was kind of handling benefits and so on. And... <clears throat> He lived in an open-sided house with a dirt floor next to a river, <clears throat> and we I met him and his wife and, and uh, I think a daughter or son, maybe both. His wife had been a colonel in the Vietnamese North Vietnamese Army, and. Uh, He got out his old map at the time, and he laboriously we pieced together where it was uh, was captured, and where the car must have taken us, and then where I must have gone on a bicycle and marching and all that stuff, and where it was we were released, and uh, <clears throat> there were some laughs too. He said, "You remember that Land Rover?" I said, "Yeah." He said, "That was my command car." He said, while well, you had the use of that car, I had to ride a bicycle. <laughs> and then he, uh, he said, and the, a lot of my t time was taken up trying to find decent food for you folks. And uh, I said, uh, do you have anything to do with that pineapple? He said, yeah, I sent that to you. <laughs> and then I asked him if it was true as... Uh, uh, the head of the CIA told Max Franklin of the New York Times that uh, they s sent a message to Hanoi, that my captors sent a message to Hanoi saying it was too much of a burden to take care of these prisoners and uh, would they have authority to execute them. Uh, he said he didn't think that would have been true. But uh, I, and I don't know the truth of it yet, but um, he said it was, I said, well, was it a burden? He said, oh, yeah, it was hard to keep you alive. And, um, but we, we it was, it was kind of a, a nice reunion, and we recalled old times, and uh, then I knew he was having to report everything back to his superiors on what I was interested in, what I said, and what he said, and so on. And uh, we we met together, I think, three times over a period of a couple of days. And uh, he told me about his uh, his own career. He was a South Vietnamese. I thought he was a Northerner. But then in 1954, he went to Hanoi. And then he infiltrated later down the Ho Chi Minh Trail and took control, took command of one the area where we were. And uh, he was a nice guy. And then he, he, I said, any of those other guys still alive? They'd given me their what I thought was their names on little pieces of paper. Well, I got them translated after I got back to Washington. 
and all they said was good wishes, we all want peace, and blah, 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 stuff like that. Not, nothing about who they were. But he said that uh, uh, one of his, one of these five escorts we had was alive and was around there. And uh, he took me to see him, but the guy was senile, and we really, I guess he had Alzheimer's, and it really didn't amount to anything. But the general, uh, Baikao was his name, B-A-Y-C-A-O. Baikao was, had all his marbles and was a fascinating guy. And when we finally parted, I, I'd i taken him some presents, and uh, I don't remember what, I think maybe a necktie and a, I don't know what. But um, when we parted, I, he... Uh, he said, well, Brother Dudman, I won't try to persuade you about one-party democracy, but don't you try to persuade me about multi-party democracy. <laughs> I said, okay, it's a deal. <laughs> and then I got to introduce, years later, just about a year ago or so, I, Helen and I went to China and Vietnam, and we arranged to see Bai Cao again. And he'd been ill, he had uh, serious ulcers, but he was recovering. We saw him at the hospital, and his wife was there, and we had tea together, and again recalled some old times, and I tried to get some more out of his career, but he didn't really want to talk about it too much. He said, he said, you know, he says, that was yesterday, and the door to yesterday is closed, but the door to the future is open. And he wanted good relations with the United States. He didn't want to really talk about the troubles of the past. And I, I heard that same line from other people. I think it got to be almost a, a rote uh, response to questions. But he's a good guy, and, I, I, and he saved my life. so. Got a strong feeling for him. Because there are a lot of changes in Vietnam, aren't there? Oh yes. Well, it's it's glorious to be rich. It's the same thing that's going on in China, and uh, they they really have embraced capitalism, but they still keep a strong uh, control politically, and they're not going to stand for any kind of multi-partyism. Can you understand that, Richard? Can I understand? Can you understand why they want that? You know, to keep that firm control. Well, what do you think about that? I always think that it's the first responsibility of a government is to maintain itself in power. And uh, if we don't like the exact style, it's too bad. But uh, in fact, when we look at America's response to the recent attack we've had, it uh, it has led me, at least, to a certain sympathy for the Chinese in repressing the uh, Falun Gong and in repressing the demonstrations uh, of Tiananmen Square. And I know that's uh, uh, really the conventional wisdom is that both of those are unacceptable and bad and they're a violation of human rights. But uh, their own uh, government stability, they felt, was at stake in both those cases. So, uh, I, in a way, I, I think outsiders are in a poor position to uh, condemn them. And I, uh, I haven't heard anybody say that lately. And in fact, it'd be an interesting subject for an article. But it, uh, I think it should be subject for some contemplation. I, as you know, I now I, I have another job. I write two editorials a week for the local newspaper, the Bangor, Maine Daily News. And um, I can write on anything I want, and they almost invariably accept what I write. 
And, uh, uh, of course, one of the things I tackle now and then is uh, the, um, uh, the terrorist attacks of uh, September 11th against the United States in New York and Washington. And uh, the what we've been calling the war against terrorism, which is now in its early stages. And... <clears throat> In this kind of a, an emergency, uh, it gives me a different, kind of a modified sense of uh, the proper role of the United States government. Uh, in my reporting, I've been very critical of government policies from time to time, and uh, rightly so. Uh, but uh, uh, all of a sudden now, uh, a lot of I'd say us liberals, a lot of, a lot of us uh, see the government as our essential protect protector and not a, a, a threat. And uh, we find ourselves putting up with um, uh, restrictions on some of our traditional liberties. I even I have felt that uh, uh, a system of national identification cards might be justified. I think we've gone pretty far in that direction already without suffering from it, and that uh, it might be a good way to keep tabs of t uh, terrorists to get into the country. Um, I, I, w I wouldn't object to such a system. There are some things, however, <clears throat> that um, some abridgments of uh, uh, traditional liberties that uh, while they'd be accepted by most Americans uh, in this dreadful affront to our safety and our security uh, by international terrorism uh, they we ought to be skeptical of some of these things and be watchful. And government isn't necessarily, uh, uh, shouldn't necessarily be permitted to uh, restrict all liberties. So, uh, for example, uh, President Bush has... Uh, uh, ordered a, without consulting Congress at all, has ordered a, uh, a, uh, a system of special military courts to try uh, any foreigners, uh, and possibly uh, American citizens too, uh, tr try them abroad or on ships at sea uh, without any of the usual restrictions on admissibility of evidence, uh, without the usual presumption of innocence, uh, without the uh, uh, requirement of a unif unanimous jury, two-thirds of a military uh, committee could uh, impose a sentence, including death. And uh, these, uh, these proceedings could be conducted in absolute secrecy. Uh, now this might be a way of disposing of Osama bin Laden if he's captured. Uh, more likely he'll be killed, but uh, or even uh, there's a possibility that we never can never catch him. I don't know. But um, uh, it might be a, a convenient way to dispose of him, but how would it look to the rest of the world? it could turn him into a, a martyr in the eyes of most Muslims around the world. Uh, <clears throat> I think that a, uh, an American trial might have the same effect. Uh, an international trial by an international, international criminal court might be the best solution. It could be dragged out. It would give him a chance to make propaganda. It might be the, the best of a whole lot of bad solutions. But uh, I think these special military courts 
is about the worst thing we could do. As far as uh, other people who are merely suspected of being terrorists, uh, the purpose of our whole court system in the United States is not only to punish the guilty, it's to protect the innocent. And uh, I, this presidential order um, empowers the president to make a personal selection of anybody he suspects of being a terrorist and makes them subject to the rules of this special order. I, I think that's, uh, uh, I hope it'll be attacked in the courts and I think it's vulnerable and uh, uh, there's already some resistance in Congress to it. So I think maybe that's got to go by the, by the boards. Uh, another thing he's done <clears throat> is to empower the Attorney General to uh, uh, eavesdrop and intercept any communications between uh, accused terrorists or imprisoned terrorists and their attorneys for fear that they may be passing along uh, conspiratorial information uh, by way of these communications. Well, that is a possibility, but the, the whole our whole system of uh, legal representation uh, depends on confidentiality, just as uh, the relation of a priest and penitent uh, 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 is based on confidentiality too. Without it, you really haven't got any uh, legal representation. And uh, uh, this he has ordered without any uh, court order to, to warrant it. And uh, that's another serious abuse. Now, having said all that, I have to go on and say that we do uh, have to acknowledge that we're in a special situation of great danger and that um, some restrictions <clears throat> must be considered acceptable. <clears throat> Just where that line will be drawn, I don't know, but it can't be a, a, a blank check. <clears throat> now, um, thinking about this really makes me take another look at some of the things, human rights abuses, that we've been extremely critical of uh, by other countries. And I'm thinking particularly of China and their recent uh, suppression of the Falun Gong religious movement, uh, which is spiritual, but it also uh, involves uh, uh, some illegal demonstrations and uh, essentially a threat to the stability of their government. And the, the uh, brutal repression of uh, the demonstrators uh, 10 or so years ago or so at, uh, in, the, in uh, Tiananmen Square is um, Another example, most of the world uh, abhorred that kind of repression. And the conventional thinking and the position of the United States government has been that this was uh, absolutely unacceptable. Uh, however, both that and the Falun Gong thing did amount to threats to the stability of the Chinese government. and. Uh, I think whether we like the policies of a government or not, uh, we should accept the fact that a government's primary responsibility is to maintain its own security. And uh, so I, th I think we shouldn't be, as outsiders, we're in a poor position to try to tell other countries what they have to do uh, in the name of some kind of a banner of human rights uh, when they feel their security is at stake. Now, obviously, this, I'm just suggesting this as a field for a little uh, self-search and a little contemplation rather than uh, saying Tiananmen Square was all right, but I raise the question.
position number 22579, room 14. Dudman, Reel 14. Um, September the 11th, you know, these events has raised quite a lot of criticism about America, hasn't it? Um, about, you know, th statements such as perhaps America ought to look to its past foreign policy to see if in any way it's to blame for this. Do you have any thoughts about that? Well, I do. In fact, I wrote an editorial on the subject. I, a, a lot of my liberal friends, I have, <clears throat> I, while acknowledging that the, this attack was a terrible thing, entirely unjustified, they have said that uh, what we ought to be concentrating on is why do they hate us? And I... I think that's a legitimate question, and uh, American policies certainly haven't been all good in the past. And uh, uh, but uh, to me, uh, that's a long-range question that should be considered. But the immediate question is one of our survival. And we're under a, a, a dreadful attack by a powerful and sly enemy that we don't even know exactly who they are or where they are. And uh, we've got to stamp out that terrorism first. And I think any long-range consideration of why do they hate us uh, is something for the future, but to concentrate on that now carries a kind of an implication that it's all our own fault. And people who raise that question, they don't like to be have it interpreted that way, but that's what, what it amounts to. And I... Uh, uh, I th Many of them use that uh, line of discussion to uh, attack specific policies of the United States. And there's a long, there's a lot of feeling in the United States and in other countries, especially Arab countries, that the United States should not be so cooperative and helpful to Israel. Um, I personally think that Israel would have a hard time existing if it were not for the help of the United States. And that uh, uh, and that the difficulty of reaching a peaceful settlement of the Arab-Israeli dispute uh, lies largely in the conviction by many of the Arab states and many of the Arab and a mass of the Arab population that Israel has no right to exist and they want to destroy it. And they've had, they fought four wars of self-defense and each time they won and I, the, it's their existence that's the problem for the Arab countries. And uh, if really we could pin them down to what they really think, we'd find they're not, exist not interested in coexistence with Israel. So I, 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 uh, I'm glad to see uh, efforts of somebody like uh, former Senator George Mitchell to uh, try to reach a, a negotiated agreement. And I respect him so much, I think he may uh, be able to pull it off. But um, I think it's seriously an uphill push. And uh, I'm not sure it'll ever work.
in your very long experience, Richard, of print journalism, what are the main changes, do you think, from the time you started off in the 1950s? You know, first of all, the technology. Has this changed a lot? Well, well it's changed totally. I, <coughs> I used to get stories and hand them to people in the jungle and hope that they'd take them to a telegraph office or I'd type them out and give them to an unfriendly or kind of ignorant uh, telex typist in a government uh, 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 telegraph office and hope that um, <clears throat> now a reporter uh, can have a uh, an expensive but very practical uh, telephone connection via satellite wherever he is and he or she and um, <clears throat> be in constant touch with his office I that's one of many changes the the coming of um, uh, cable TV and, and uh, uh, radio and the internet have meant that instead of having a 24-hour news cycle with some kind of regularity to it. Uh, it's a constant news cycle. Uh, stories are breaking all the time. And um, <clears throat> in fact, in a breaking story, it's very hard to feel that you're current. And the daily newspaper has a hard time because I, they can be overtaken by events and uh, by the time they go to press, say, late one night, by the next morning, uh, other, uh, say, the morning uh, TV broadcasts and the, well, may have some entirely new development that makes the previous night's story nonsensical. Uh, I find that kind of frustrating and kind of hard on the the consumer of information. It's uh, I think uh, you can overdose on CNN or on uh, any kind of uh, television news. Uh, it's so kind of hysterical, and uh, it's snippets of things that may sound important but may be not be at all. And it's, um, well, even in this these times, I, I prefer to get my news each morning out of the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times and then uh, a few other things that I'll pick up, maybe on the Internet or something to fill in some gaps. Now, <clears throat> I, I mentioned the New York Times quite a bit. And the New York Times does a superb job of covering world, national, international news. But the problem is that most uh, uh, local and regional newspapers have given up trying to uh, compete with their own coverage of the same stories. And it's it's uh, uneconomical, <clears throat> and it's um, it's simpler and it's cheaper to let these very few news services like the Associated Press, the New York Times, the Washington Post do the job. Uh, however, they're not perfect, and when they make a mistake and misemphasize a, a story, or, uh, I think particularly of uh, something called um, Whitewater, which was a, a political attack on President Clinton. It seems like so long ago now that uh, it's, it seems trivial, but it was the biggest thing going for a long time with the news, and the engine behind it was the New York Times, and their uh, investigative reporters <clears throat> who thought they had a great scandal on their hands. Well, the Times eventually did some soul searching and uh, 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 ran a, 
he couldn't quite call it an apology, but an explanation and clarification sh showing that they had uh, really misjudged the story. And um, uh, it was a black mark in their history, but it went all over the United States because so many papers didn't bother to cover the thing themselves or took the lead from the New York Times. Well, <clears throat> that's ancient history now. Uh, I don't think there's any way to reverse it. But the, the, the role of the local newspaper is it's diminished. And uh, uh, I, now if I were covering <clears throat> the, the current campaign in Afghanistan or the war in in uh, uh, in the, the uh, war against international terrorism, I, I would have a hard time knowing how to tackle it. And I, I think it, it, uh, it's a tough story to cover. And part of it is technologically and technological, and part of the problem is what I've said about the, the centralization of, of news and, or the homogenization of news. And um, um, in a sense, I'm kind of glad I'm out of it. Although, I, in another sense, I hate to see a big story going on that I'm not out there covering. Have you noticed much difference in the number of women now um, in the sort of media? That's a big change. Uh, when I joined the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, the... Uh, the city editor said that no matter how good a reporter you are, Dudman, we wouldn't have to hire you because we've already got a very good staff. We have such a good staff. This was in 1949. We have such a good staff that all through the war, we never had to have one woman in the city room. <laughs> so th things have changed a lot. And uh, it, it took some uh, uh, some strong action by some courageous women to bring it about. A group of them sued the New York Times to get equal pay. And uh, 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 but now I I sometimes think there are more women than men out covering foreign stories. I hear women's voices almost as much or even more than the men's voices in the, uh, and in the bylines and in the uh, radio and t TV reports. And uh, I'd say there's real equality of the sexes now at last. Uh, and I think that's all to the good. Did you know any of the... Um women of um, people like Martha um, Gellhorn or Claire Hollingworth. Did you ever meet these in the field? Uh, who was the second one? Um, Claire Hollingworth. Well, I knew Claire Hollingworth, and I th <clears throat> I've been trying to think whether it was in Central America or in the Middle East. I rather think it was in Jordan where I met her. But, uh, yes, I, I worked alongside her on several big stories. And uh, then there were, there were a number of um, uh, British men I got to know, too. I remember uh, Edwin Tetlow was one, and uh, another man named Green, Greeno. Uh, and I forget, I think he worked for the Express. And um, they were in the... Uh, 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 the Guatemalan Revolution in 1954, and I came across them. Tetlow, in fact, told me a, a good rule for how to cover an unfamiliar story. We were walking around town together, and we saw a tank here, and some soldiers walking around here, and somebody <clears throat> with a gun here, and a demonstration there. And he said, a little bit here, a little bit there, and first thing you know, you've got your story. <laughs> So on a dull day, sometimes walk around town and pick up what you can. <laughs> what was your guiding principle, you know, throughout your years as a war correspondent? You know, what was your major aim, would you say? Uh, 
I always wanted to get stories nobody else had. I think exclusivity was what I really liked the best. <clears throat> and it was hard to get. But for that reason, I never stayed in the what became a kind of a semi-official press hotel. In, Saint, in uh, Saigon, when I was in town, I was out of town a lot, but when I was in town, I stayed at the old Continental Hotel where Graham Greene wrote his, his uh, novel. I, uh, most of them stayed in the uh, Caravel, and uh, I didn't want to be with a pack. And I thought that uh, being with a pack led to uh, uh, pack thinking, conventional thinking. And I was afraid I'd get swept up in the conventional view of what was going on instead of my own view based on my own observations. And I, I know I ran into, um, I'm trying to think of his name, um, anyway, he was a, a very good reporter, and uh, I, I'd been staying away from the pack. And uh, it was in a, on a Central American story. And he says, where have you been anyway, Dudman? I said, oh, I've been working on an aspect of this. I said, where, where have you been? I didn't want to be on the defensive. And he said, well, I've been on the story. <laughs> and I thought, Jesus, am I way off in left field someplace? <laughs> but uh, uh, I always... I, relished the motto of the St. Louis Post-Dispatch to always be drastically independent. And uh, oftentimes that paid off. Sometimes it was a little restricting. <laughs> well, Richard, thank you very much indeed for sharing so many of your most interesting experiences with me today. Thank you. current danger to journalists. The whole thing changed since I st first started being a uh, uh, foreign uh, current danger to journalists. The whole thing changed since I st first started being a uh, uh, foreign, foreign affairs reporter. Uh, <clears throat> When I first went to Guatemala, I assumed that uh, anybody would accept a reporter as being a disinterested observer who was no threat to anybody but was just there doing his job. In fact, I, the night before I went off to join uh, the uh, insurgency of Castillo Armas, I, uh, I found some little scraps of cloth and made myself a little armband that said Prensa on it. And I thought that would be my guarantee of being safe. Well, it wasn't very many years before the press became a target. And I watched uh, soldiers in uh, uh, San Salvador I shoot down a reporter. And when it appeared he was still alive, they went up and did the coup de grace and shot and killed him dead. American reporter. And I, I came to realize that uh, news and propaganda were implements of war and that uh, any reporter could be seen as a, a military threat and uh, that uh, uh, kidnapping and capture and assassination were uh, part of the danger that I a reporter now incurred, and this supposed immunity no longer existed, if it ever did. So I, I regard it as a hazardous job. Now, when when I was um, when I almost lost my life a second time in Cambodia. I dictated the story, and I, 
then the managing editor got on the phone. I was dictating it to his male secretary. And the managing editor was reading it one page, one paragraph at a time, pulling it out of the typewriter. And the um, <clears throat> managing editor got on the phone and he says, Dick, this is a fine story. He says, you've, you've touched all the bases and all that, but it, it needs something high in the story, a, a, something personal, telling how you felt about all this and how it... I, I really thought that was... I was, couldn't be less interested in how I felt. But anyway, I, I said, okay, you asked for it. I said, Lester, take an insert high in the story. As I lay there in my bedroom wondering if they were going to come in and finish me off. I hated myself for uh, plunging my family into anxiety again, risking my life. And I determined that I was never going to take a hazardous assignment again from the post-dispatch. <laughs> and they put that all in the paper. <laughs> they got more than they bargained for. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, thank you very much indeed for that, Richard. Thank you.